Section 16 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Section 16, Chapter 9a, Estimate of the Situation, Part 1. In physical warfare, the inherent instability of every situation is concealed by the apparent definiteness of the operation. Panic, revolt, or dissolution of regiments is not normally figured into the situation. The assumption is made, and for professional military purposes must be made, that all identical units are of equal quality unless proved otherwise, that all men in a unit will respond with psychological uniformity unless they are reported out physically by medical reports that the unit will be capable of doing tomorrow what it did yesterday. The terrain comes in as a constant factor, and even such variables as weather can be calculated in terms of a predictable risk. Nevertheless, every experienced soldier knows that things do not always work out the way they should, that unexplained or unforeseen factors sooner or later complicate or frustrate the best plans, and that warfare is a huge gamble with a superficial but very necessary coding of exactitude. In psychological warfare, these considerations apply even more sharply. Combat at least has terrain, order of battle, logistics, estimated capabilities, and other concrete factors with which to figure. There is a known degree of difference between one enemy division and five enemy divisions. There is the possibility of computing the time with which the enemy will need to fulfill this capability or that, and the equally good possibility of computing time on our side for countermeasures. Even in such very long-range operations as strategic bombing, economic factors can be figured out to give the operation at least the coloration of precision. With propaganda, none of this is possible. The propagandist never knows the terrain because his terrain is the enemy mind in its entirety, a factor beyond the understanding of any man. The enemy can have strongholds of faith to be shaken, but the propagandist can never say, this factor is finished, therefore we proceed to the next. There is neither victory nor defeat, only the endless seesaw of probable accomplishments or probable blunders. The honest psychological warfare operative will admit that he does not know where he is at any given moment, how far from his start, how near to his goal. Even with surrender of the enemy, propaganda cannot be judged to have met with complete failure or complete success, because propaganda is an interminable stream going on into international affairs and carrying over to the next war. Psychological warfare can be given apparent certainty only by the creation of assumptions on the part of the planner. The assumptions will not stand up if questioned by a clever philosopher any more than did the basic assumptions of the German general staff when questioned by sardonic Trotsky at Brest-Litovsk. Nevertheless, the assumptions can work for planning purposes. Definiteness of goal. The first assumption to make is this. Goals can be sought with some hope of success. The propaganda planner uses the intelligence available to him. He consults with knowledgeable persons. He defines, one, the specific kinds of demoralization and discord he wishes to create. Two, the particular enemy audiences in which he wishes to create them. Three, the types of argument he proposes to use. And four, the media through which he intends to project his propaganda. He assumes that the kind of discord, depression, or surrender which he seeks will hasten the end of the war. In so doing, he is on ground only a little less sure than that of the strategic bombing planner, who also seeks results indirectly. For field operations, the goal of the propagandist is to sap the resistance of enemy troops. If the troops are moving forward and are not likely to be in a mood to surrender, then other goals, such as conflict between officers and men, encouraging desertion, informing enemy troops of bad news elsewhere in the war, or morale depression may be sought. In each case, the propaganda must be aimed at a goal, and a goal is as essential to the operation of psychological warfare as is definition of a target for artillery or bombing. No one ever accomplishes anything shooting somewhere or other. No one propagandizes successfully unless he seeks the attainment of a state of mind or series of actions which may actually happen. Most times, it is thus impossible to aim at the total surrender of the enemy armies or state. One can aim for concrete operational purposes only at specific enemy troubles or effects. For the field, troop surrenders. For the home front, interference with the enemy war effort. These are about as general as goals can be made. 
they can be made very specific indeed. A situation reported by intelligence may provide an almost perfect opening for psychological warfare. If the enemy press reports that 23 embezzlers have been detected in food supply and have been shot, it is a perfect opening for the black propaganda goal to conduce the enemy mistrust of food control, to increase food spoilage, to lower efficiency of enemy food consumption through enhancing misuse of food supply. Some of the means might be these. An alleged enemy leaflet could be prepared, warning quartermasters to destroy canned foods that have lost labels. Another leaflet describing diseases that come from partially spoiled food. An enemy allegation, from your side, or better, from neutral territory, that the political chiefs of the enemy country are the biggest food embezzlers of all. Getting a black radio and rumor campaign underway, describing the 783 people who died last month as a result of eating musty food, even though your own doctors say the mustiness may not interfere with the wholesomeness of that particular food. Describing common diseases that actually occur in the enemy country, such as arthritis, stomach ulcers, sinus headaches, or infectious jaundice, and blaming them all on the foods the enemy government distributes to the enemy people. On white radio, features could be put on describing the unhappy plight of your own side, where people may get their rashers of bacon for breakfast only every other day, and where nobody can have more than three eggs at a time. Point out that the government is worried that food prices have risen 5.3%, without mentioning at that time the fact that enemy prices have gone up 45% or more. The definite goal gives the propaganda boys something to work on. Propaganda to the allies or satellites of the enemy can point out that the enemy government is apt to dump the spoiled food onto the foreign market, that food spoiling in territory of the big enemy will make him requisition more food from his little allies, and so forth. When the topic has been worked for a while, stop. Keep it up only if actual news from the enemy country shows that they are having enough real trouble with food to make your improvements on the fact thoroughly credible. Propaganda cannot function in a vacuum framed by moral generalities. The goal must be defined in light of the authentic news or intelligence. The operation can be sustained only if there is enough factual reality behind it to make the propaganda fit the case known or credited by the majority of the listeners, counted one by one. Since no trouble-free wartime country has been known to exist, the goal should be tailored to the troubles of the particular enemy, and should aim at increasing real difficulties, building up pre-existing doubts, stimulating genuine internal hostilities. Propaganda which invents pure novelty gets nowhere. The Russians did not hesitate to appeal to Bismarck in order to show the professional German soldiers what a rotter Hitler was and how stupid the Nazi strategy. But if Bismarck had actually said nothing on the subject of the army in general, or an Eastern war in particular, they would have been wise to leave him alone. If the Japanese had tried to make the ex-Confederate states secede all over again, they would not have gotten anywhere because they would not have started with a real grievance. But if they had alleged that the Negro units were used for stevedoring because whites regarded Negroes as unworthy of carrying weapons, they might have hit on a real grievance. The goal must be deeply bedded in reality. The Propaganda Man It has been pointed out that the true terrain of psychological warfare— the private thoughts of the enemy people, one by one, is known only to God. There is, however, a way of finding approximate terrain. That consists of setting up a hypothetical enemy listener or reader and then trying to figure things out from his angle. The first thing to do with the hypothetical man is to make him fit the kind of person who does get propaganda. In dealing with China, for example, it would be no use to take a statistically true Chinese who lived on a farm 1.3 acres in size, went to a town 5.8 times a year, had 3.6 children, and never read newspapers. The man to be set up would be the reachable man, the city, town, or village dweller, who had an income 2.1 times greater than that of the average in his country, who owned 1.7 long coats, and who shared one newspaper with 6.8 neighbors. Take this lowest common denominator of a man who can be reached by enemy propaganda and by yours. Name him the propaganda man. Realistically speaking, modal and not arithmetical classes should be set up. Make up the pre-war life of the propaganda man. Use your regional experts as informants. 
What kind of things did he like? What prejudices was he apt to have? What kind of gossip did he receive and pass along? What kind of words disgusted him? What kind of patriotic appeal made him do things? What did he think of your country before the war? What things did he dislike you and your people for? What myths did he believe about America? That all Americans drove sports convertibles while drinking liquor? That all had blonde sweethearts? That all exchanged gunfire periodically? Of what American things did he think well? Food, shoes, autos, personal freedom, others? What is he apt to be thinking now? To this, add what the enemy propaganda is trying to do to its propaganda man. That is, size up the domestic propaganda of the enemy in terms of the concrete individuals at whom it is aimed. This may reveal the enemy's vital necessities and his concealed weaknesses. What are the leaders trying to do? Are they trying to make the propaganda man get to work on time? Are they trying to make him give up holidays willingly? Are they trying to make him think that your side will kill him if you win? Are they trying to keep him from being worried about his city going up in an incandescent haze? Are they trying to make him believe that the concrete shelters are good? Why are they harping on the safety of the shelters? Has the propaganda man been muttering back about the flimsiness of the shelters? Does he want to be evacuated from target cities? Are the police being praised for their fairness and speed in issuing leave-the-city permits? Are legal evacuees being treated as scum and traitors and cowards? Then go after the propaganda man yourself. He is your friend. You are his friend. The only enemy is the enemy leader, or generals, or emperor, or capitalists, or they. How is the propaganda man going to hear from you? Leaflets? Shortwave? And if so, why is he listening to the enemy in the first place? Standard wave? Speaker planes? Rumors? Get things to him that you know he will repeat. Things which will interest him. Make up a list of the things he worries about each month. A list of the things which the enemy propaganda is trying to do to him currently. A list of the things your propaganda is trying to do. Do the three lists fit? Would they work on an actual living, breathing, thinking human being? With the prejudices, frailty, nobility, greed, lubricity, and other motives of the ordinary human being? If your list fits his real life, if your list spoils the enemy propaganda list, if your list builds up a psychological effect of confusion, gloom, willingness to surrender, which accumulates month after month, the terrain is favorable. It is in your propaganda man's head. There are no maps of the human mind, but in certain special cases, sociology and psychology can provide leads which even the most acute, untrained observation would otherwise overlook. During World War II, for example, Mr. Jeffrey Gorer, a British anthropologist, was able to provide character analyses of the Japanese that stood up under the rigorous analysis of experts long resident in Japan. Gorer took as base data the experience of the Japanese infant in the first 40-odd months of life. How was the baby given toilet training? How was it weaned? How was it disciplined into the family life? How did the small child learn what it was? Gora found that Japanese domestic life started the child out with a mixture of uncertainty and defiance, that the infant soon learned he was in a definite position in the human queue, where all above him had to be respected on the threat of immediate and condign reprisal, while all below him could be mistreated almost with impunity, that the Japanese had sad, dirty little private thoughts about himself to a degree unknown to ourselves or the Chinese that the Japanese was, in adult life, the inevitable fulfillment of what he had been made in infancy. Arrogant, timid, insanely brave, deferential, fearful of foreigners, and overtly cruel to them. Furthermore, the Japanese identified persons, nations, or institutions as female, peaceful, possessing enjoyments, subject to bullying, or as male, fierce, counter-aggressive, superordinate. The USA of Admiral Perry seemed male, that of Cordell Hull, female. These findings, applied to propaganda, gave British-American operations an audience, unlike the Japanese, whom missionaries, soldiers, diplomats, businessmen, and journalists had portrayed in such varied and inconsistent terms. This Japanese propaganda man, analyzed at a distance, since Gorer had never been nearer Japan than Indochina, became a believable person. 
It was uncanny to see Japanese propaganda movies after reading the Gora analyses and to find the Japanese government propagandists, by hunch and instinct, appealing to the same propaganda man whom Gora, by bold but permissible extrapolations, had revealed to Allied propaganda planners. The Attribution of Motive One of the least factual elements in human life is motive. Motive is hard to discern, even in one's own life, and it is difficult, if not impossible, to prove. It must frequently be attributed. Motive is therefore easily interpreted. Falsification is almost impossible, because no matter how much probable motive is twisted, it still might fit the case. Motive is therefore excellent material for psychological warfare. Those propaganda veterans, the communists, have a formula for showing that the motive of every person opposed to them is unprogressive, illiberal, and greedy, even if the person himself does not know it. Their own motives are always pure, because they are objectively and historically correct, according to science, that is, according to the historical rigmaroles of Karl Marx. The formula is a poor science, but a superb propaganda weapon. War eases the motive-switching operation because the leaders and people on each side derive moral exhilaration from the common effort. Ostensibly, politicians become statesmen. All higher-ranking officers become strategists. Ordinary men become heroes, martyrs, adventurers. The lofty process of war is one which psychologists will not explain in our time. It transposes ordinary persons and events to a frame of reference in which individuals are less self-conscious and also less critical. Among European and American peoples, particularly, there arises the assumption that because of war, men should be brave and unselfish, women kind and chaste, yet alluring, officials self-sacrificing, and so on, even though the facts of the case in the particular country involved may be very much to the contrary. The cruel futility inherent in war is so plain to all civilized men that when war does come, men overcompensate for it. They set up illusions. This need not be taken as a criticism of war or of mankind. The world would be a more inspiring place in which to dwell if people generally lived up to the wartime standards they impose on themselves. That these standards are felt to be real is attested by the distinct drop of the suicide rate in wartime and the increase in suicide murder, and crimes of delinquency after every war. That the change of rule is largely illusory is attested by the fact that no nation appears to have undergone permanent sociological change as a result of improvement during war. Many wartime changes carry on, of course, but they rarely comprise, by the standards of the people concerned, improvements. The upswing is genuine when it occurs, but it is rarely permanent, and it seldom affects all levels of the entire population with the same degree of exhilaration. The propagandist thus has an ideal situation. In the enemy country, everyone is trying to be more noble, more unselfish, more hardworking. Everyone applies a higher standard of ethics and performance than in peacetime. Businessmen are not supposed to make too much money. Politicians are supposed to work around the clock. Officials are supposed to cooperate. Housewives to save children to scavenge, and so on. Yet a certain percentage of the enemy population is not taken into this. Sometimes minorities feel themselves emotionally excluded. At other times, private temperamental differences make some persons skeptic, while others remain believers. The ground is ready for rumor, for tearing down inflated personages, for breaking the illusion by the simple process of attributing normally selfish motives in wartime. It is easier to attribute bad motives to civilian leaders than to military. The ceremonialized discipline of modern warfare makes the military figure a little mysterious. His normal peacetime obscurity shielded him and his family from exposure, cheap publicity, gossip. The civilian leader does not have this protection. The very process of becoming prominent has involved his seeking publicity, for the one part, and his pretense of avoiding it, for the other. Furthermore, the man who serves his nation serves himself. It is not possible for a man to lead a large country without benefiting himself, since the act of leadership is itself intensely pleasurable. Also, prominence possesses the characteristic of vice. Even when it loses its value for positive enjoyment, it retains withdrawal pains. The once prominent individual hates to leave prominence, though he may be genuinely weary of it. 
He is willing to be tired of the country, but not willing for the country to be tired of him. In wartime, old leaders remain and new ones come in. Fame and obscurity shift with even greater rapidity than before. The personality politics condition of the country is highly mobile. Personalities are tense with interpersonal conflict. Then comes the propagandist. First, he attributes normal human motives to the leaders who so obviously possess them. In this job, he is doing what the famous little boy in the Hans Christian Andersen story did when he said of the emperor, Mama, he hasn't any clothes on. The propagandist need only say what everyone knows, that this man is notoriously fond of money, that another one has been a poor sportsman, that a third has betrayed some old friends, that a fourth has sought power in a selfish, vindictive way. The response which the propaganda seeks is a simple, yeah, that's so. The next step in propaganda is to show that these persons do not measure up to the tragic, heroic, historic roles war has imposed on them. That, too, is not difficult, especially if the war is not going decisively one way or the other. Defeat or victory serves equally well to make leaders into heroes. Churchill and MacArthur were never more splendid than when they were whipped, the one after Dunkirk, the other after Bataan. The final approach is the total discrediting of leaders. The internal politics of the country have been bitter enough. Some of the leaders may even come over voluntarily to the enemy. Quisling in Norway, Wang in China, Doriot and Laval in France, Vlasov in the USSR, Laurel from the Philippines. Such men all possessed a certain amount of standing in their own countries, but through capture, impatience, or seduction, decided to continue their careers with enemy backing. The propagandist can now pretend to be tolerant. It is he who believes in peace, in reconciliation, in easygoing, live-and-let-live attitudes. He describes his protégés, the Quislings, in warm, complimentary terms. He lightens the tenor of his attack on the non-Quisling enemy leaders. He takes the attitude that war continues because of private stupidity, vengefulness, greed, unreasonableness on the other. For his part, he is willing to let the politicians, both Quisling and Patriot, settle it between themselves. Let them form a coalition government. Personal smearing is effective. If the war situation runs in the enemy's favor, the easing of the enemy position permits the population the privilege of backbiting. And even within the leadership group, some leaders may feel more free to destroy the positions or reputations of the others. The impossible and foolishly heroic stances which the leaders have taken in time of strain now make most of them look a little silly. Conversely, in a downgrade situation, the leaders may gain stature in the first tragic weeks of defeat, but soon the ignobility of defeat sweeps over them all. The propagandist need only be a good reporter, and the leaders of the defeated country will provide him with good propaganda material. In estimating the propaganda situation, the vulnerability of the leaders to personal attack is one of the major elements. Properly handled, it can be of real value. In the American Revolution, the personal character of George Washington was a very substantial asset. A very rich man, he could scarcely be accused of a gutter revolution. A slave owner, he could not be accused of wanting to overthrow the social order. An experienced soldier, he could not be attacked as a military amateur. A man of patience, correct manners, and genuine modesty, he was not easily described as a bloody empire builder, an immoral sycophant, or a power-drunk madman. British propaganda accordingly went after the Continental Congress, of which there was a great deal to be said. On the other side, the Americans had duck soup when it came to George III and most of his cabinet, personalities which included boars, fuddy-duddies, too little and too laters, and conspicuous nincompoofs. End of section 16. Recording by Olivia. Section 17 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Section 17. Chapter 9b. Estimate of the Situation, Part 2 A Written Estimate of the Situation If, as indicated above, 
The terrain of psychological warfare consists of the private thoughts and feelings of each member of the audience reached. If the mission of psychological warfare is the accomplishment of anything from entirely unknowable results, such as an imperceptible change of mood, all the way through to complete success, such as organized mass surrender, if the capabilities of the enemy have virtually nothing to do with one's own psychological warfare commitments, and if the decision consists of choices of means and theme, if these peculiarities all apply, the usual estimate of the situation has almost nothing to do with military propaganda. Roughly speaking, this is the case. An attempt to apply the outline given in FM 101-5, Appendix 1, would produce only a lamentable parody of a military document. The situation of the military unit possessing psychological warfare facilities has relatively little to do with the capabilities of the psychological warfare unit. The morale of one's own men should have no effect whatever on the output of the radio script writers and the leaflet writers. In combat operations, military forces meet. In psychological warfare, they do not. In combat operations, it is impossible for two hostile units to occupy the same territory for any length of time without both of them degenerating into a chaos of armed mobs. In psychological warfare operations, both sets of operations can be conducted in the same media, can address themselves to the same basic human appeals, can use the same music, the same general kind of news account, and so on. Furthermore, no modern army ever went into operation with certain units designed as wholly and exclusively defensive, and certain others as wholly and exclusively offensive. The Great Wall of China is the world's most celebrated example of purely defensive planning, yet it protected Chinese offensive bases for 2,100 years. But in psychological warfare, the Japanese-language shortwave broadcasts from San Francisco had no imaginable effect on the American forces in the Pacific. The only people who could understand them were the Japanese language officers in G2 and ONI offices. Their personal vexation did not matter. The offensive operations of combat troops are predicated upon finding the enemy, affecting contact, and either destroying the enemy or making him yield terrain. The defensive operations of combat troops, contrarywise, are planned with a view to resisting an enemy who has been met. In psychological warfare, Operators and enemy do not affect contact. The audience cannot strike back through a radio set. The enemy reader cannot throw a leaflet back at the bomber which dropped it on him. When American planes bombed German radio stations, they did not do so because the flight commander was trying to get German propaganda off the air. They did so because the Americans were trying to break up the entire German communications network. It is almost impossible to pinpoint radio transmitters and printing presses with such accuracy as to deny the enemy all chance of talking back. In a purely physical sense, there are only two sets of measures whereby an actual defense can be set up against psychological warfare. Each is a measure of desperation. Neither is considered effective. The Americans did not bother with either in World War II. The first physical defense consists of radio jamming and of the planned interception of enemy leaflet raids. Radio jamming is ineffectual, except in the case of an enemy possessing hopelessly inferior signal equipment. The Japanese tried to jam our radio at Saipan. Just as the Germans tried to jam BBC, they impeded reception, but they never succeeded in blocking it out altogether. The second physical defense consists of destroying reception facilities. It is possible to sweep an occupied territory and to sequester almost all the radio sets in use. It is possible to issue a military order that any soldier or civilian found in possession of enemy printed matter will be court-martialed and punished. These measures are useful to dictators having secret police and strong armies having the Prussian level of discipline with the enlisted men regarded as robots. It is not to be expected that they would work against Americans. Therefore, propaganda does not meet propaganda. Combat forces meet. Psychological warfare forces pass one another in opposite directions. In American practice, the forces which countered enemy propaganda were those pertaining to troop information and education, morale, or special services. These did not concern themselves with propaganda to the Germans and Japanese. In the German and Russian armies of World War II, but not in the American, British, French, or Japanese, there were political officers attached to the units under a variety of titles. 
Beast often took charge of propaganda to the enemy, offensive, as well as indoctrination of their own troops, defensive. But the unrelatedness of these two functions let them split apart. Even here, the parallel between combat operations and propaganda operations breaks down. Rarely does it occur that there is a simple juxtaposition of forces, thus, that the audience, troops, are receiving equal input from both the enemy propagandist and our own propagandist. The issue is more commonly one in which the propagandist on each side attacks those troops which are retreating, cut off, suffering heavy losses, politically disaffected, or otherwise psychologically promising material for him. Of the factors which can affect troop or enemy morale, the presence of friendly propaganda is a minor one. The result then becomes complicated. The enemy propagandist is targeting exposed or demoralized units, while our own propagandist is reaching the well-supplied and well-informed units. Troops who are starving or subjected to inordinate losses will not have their propaganda resistance heightened by pep talks. A chopped-up unit has no means of enjoying USO facilities. Propaganda vulnerability depends most commonly on the objective situation of the audience. If the objective situation is good or neutral, one's own propaganda can supplement the good morale conditions. But even here, it does not and should not meet enemy propaganda frontally. Insofar as it can be tabulated, the visual propaganda situation at any given time would be something like this. The home audience is receiving friendly propaganda directed toward them, as well as the enemy propaganda directed toward them, while the enemy audience is receiving the propaganda directed to them by their own side and the propaganda we are directing toward them. In each of these instances, the propaganda operators are themselves members of an audience. Furthermore, propaganda leaks, as it were, out of the channels into which it is directed. Additionally, propaganda in all countries has to compete with the normal day-to-day -day preoccupations of the listener, his food, his health, his hour-by-hour -hour activities, his tangible interpersonal relationships. Save for rare moments of intense crisis, propaganda can expect to occupy only a small fraction of the audience's attention. In dictatorships, the range of propaganda can be widened by polluting all news, all theater presentations, all churches, etc., and so forth, with the party line. But visitors to totalitarian capitals of both the fascist and communist varieties report that most of the common people have become calloused with apathy, overall disbelief, or skepticism as a result of overexposure to official indoctrination. Hence, a written estimate of the situation follows not from some special psychological warfare situation, but from the practical measures available. If desired, it can summarize the following points. 1. Definition of the audience. A. Medium through which reached. B. Anticipated attention, including means of getting attention. C. Pertinent characteristics from Propaganda Intelligence Report. 2. Psychological goals to be sought. A. Attention of the enemy. B. Present goal. If strategic, opinion or sentiment. If tactical, action. C. Ultimate goal. Applicable to strategic only. 3. Limitations of policy. A. National political limitations. B. Limitation by adverse factual situation. C. Limitations arising from one's own security. 4. Media available. A. Kind and quality of media to be used. 5. The Propaganda Man A. Descriptive appreciation of a typical audience member 6. Competitive factors A. Listeners' non-propaganda preoccupations B. Continuation of adverse indoctrination C. Effective news available both to oneself and to listener D. Competitive effect of hostile propaganda 7. Relation to general, military, estimate of the situation a. Timing Relationships Subcategory 1. Contingency Plans Subcategory 2. Contingency Prohibitions b. Contribution of Psychological Warfare to Operations Planning Subcategory 1. Combat Operations Psychologically Advisable Subcategory 2. Combat Operations Subject to Propaganda Exploitation Subcategory 3. Operations Providing Adverse Propaganda with Opportunity c. Correlation of psychological warfare with Subcategory 1. Public relations programming Subcategory 2. Information and education plans Subcategory 3. Medical plans and reporting Subcategory 4. 
counter-subversive functions. Such papers might be of use, gathering together in a single document all pertinent facts. In most tactical situations, the situation would have obsolesced before the author of the estimate had finished his document. In strategic situations, it could not normally be made specific enough to be practical, at the operational level, without becoming hopelessly unwieldy. Each skill represented in the estimate does prepare other reports, and the practice of most modern armies indicates that it is better to conduct routine propaganda planning, supervision, and appreciation through liaison than to prepare elaborate documents gathering together the multifarious factors which actually affect psychological warfare. In most American psychological warfare facilities, especially in the theaters, the estimate of the situation consisted of a brief resume of home propaganda by the enemy, taken directly from propaganda analysis, comment on the audience by appropriate representatives from the State Department or other federal agencies, and discussion of the audience by some kind of psychological warfare, operations planning, and intelligence board. Some of the most valuable suggestions came from persons not concerned with propaganda, such as target intelligence people who could anticipate enemy civilian or military shortages, or economic warfare people who suggested vexations which the enemy listener was probably experiencing. The question of choice. An estimate of combat situation is something like a diagnosis and prognosis in medicine. The estimate sets forth the situation, presenting the difficulties to be faced and the general range of pertinent fact, all in orderly array, like a systematic diagnosis. The plans are then drawn up in the light of the estimate. They are limited by the harsh, immediate facts of the situation. They resemble a doctor's prognosis, which may have room for several choices, but which does not open the way to speculative, creative action. Psychological warfare situations are usually fluid, save at times of specific tactical emergency, the appeal to an enemy unit, when it is surrounded, to surrender. Pre-invasion propaganda for specific points. Therefore, the psychological estimate should not be presented as propaganda versus propaganda analysis. If it does, it will end as an unproductive and meaningless duel between the propagandists on the two sides. Nor should the estimate pretend to present choices with the pretense that these choices are definitely prescribed by the situation itself. In any field, an expert can hoax or befuddle a layman. A psychological warfare officer should present choices for what they really are, options open to him and his staff as creative writers. Policy issues in specific cases can be answered yes or no. This is not true of propaganda as a whole. The task of the propagandist is to create something which will arouse attention, will induce attitudes, and will eventually lead to action. It is a task of permanent offense. Its variations are as infinitely diverse as the imaginations of mankind can make them. Choice is perpetually before the psychological warfare propagandist, but it is the wide choice of what he can think up, not the narrow choice dictated by fixed terrain, by specific enemy capabilities, by concrete physical necessities. Adolf Hitler himself, in the near delirium of his last days of life, recognized this. He told his followers to hold out. German propaganda might still provoke the inevitable American-Soviet clash which would save Germany. He said he would choose one side or the other. He didn't much care which. Thus, at the end, the range of propaganda possibilities deceived even the arch-propagandist, despite the bold shrewdness he had shown in the past. He knew, as his generals did not, that the realm of the psychological, the factor of the unexpected, is always a large one and hoped to the last to turn it to his ends. His premises were right, even though his conclusion was fatal for him. Allied Operations Estimates become more complex when several nations fight on the same side. In a particular type of instance, estimates of the antagonist's propaganda capacity form a part of normal military operations. This occurs in the instance of Allied Operation, when the outside ally fears that the local ally may be subverted. Such was the state of France in relation to Britain in 1940, of central China in relation to the Americans in 1944, of the Balkan states in relation to the Third Reich in 1945. In such instances, estimate of the enemy propaganda becomes a vital part of the total military estimate. The principles stated below can be applied by changing the direction of their application. Propaganda analysis can, in situations like this, provide cues for effective action and correct timing. In this type of situation, the outside ally cannot afford to sit by and hope for the best. 
by black operations, he too must prepare to resubvert the local ally if the local ally goes over to the enemy. In Romania, Bulgaria, and puppet Serbia, the Germans were not successful. In Italy, they created the fascist Italian Social Republic and brought a large part of northern Italy back into the war. In China, allied pro-communist sympathizers hoped that the Japanese would subvert the Generalissimo so badly that America would build up Yenin as a precautionary measure. But the Generalissimo stood firm, and the Yenan maneuver lingered on as an unpleasant memory between certain Americans and certain nationalist Chinese. This type of situation mixes politics, economics, propaganda, and warfare to such a degree that no sound estimate can appraise one factor without including the others. Estimate of One's Own Capacity In preparing a routine estimate of one's own capacity, militarily speaking, the measurable factors of space and time provide guides for projecting plans into the future. It is possible to plan, at 1830 hours, D-Day plus 8, the Smith force will have arrived at Tonalitown, meaning that eight days after the start, this result can be expected. Psychological warfare can be estimated in a loosely comparable way, provided the terms of reference are different. Naturally, no sane theater commander would rely on psychological warfare alone for the accomplishment of a military result. It is possible, nevertheless, to allow for planned good luck, good luck which one has created with many months of hard work. When psychological warfare is used in conjunction with invasion, its planned use, to judge by the results found in World War II, might often justify commanders in using minimum rather than maximum allocations of troops for the protection of lines of communication against guerrilla or civilian attack. If the Nazis had chased the Soviet peasants through the woods with soup kitchens, free movies, and mittens for the babies, they would not have had so many furious partisans sniping at them. Psychological warfare can be relied upon to a considerable degree to step up enemy panic in the application of a rapid forward movement. The Japanese in China panicked whole regiments of local volunteers plumb out of existence by the use of fast-marching, Chinese-speaking, plainclothes troops, some of whom may have been airdropped. In the Nazi establishment of the first salient through to Abbeville, the psychological aspects of the Blitzkrieg helped prevent the British and French from reforming a continuous line and led, eventually, to the pocketing of the British at Dunkirk. Psychological warfare can also be counted on, tactically, to speed up the reduction of isolated enemy positions when these positions are clearly beyond hope of rescue. All the psychological warfare people need to do is to go in with map leaflets, surrender leaflets, loudspeakers, and a nearby radio. The unit may not give in instantly, but the unit would be superhuman if it fought as well in the face of persuasion as it would have fought without psychological attack. In the mopping up of Japanese in the Pacific Island fighting, psychological warfare teams and techniques undoubtedly eased and speeded the process. These references are to tactical estimates. Strategic planning is beyond estimate. All it can do is to weight the possibilities a little more favorably than would be the case without it. If the United States had not dropped the Japanese surrender proposal in Japan all over Japan, the Japanese government leaders might have been more inclined to resist surrendering. If the Germans had not softened up the French before the Great Western Blitz of 1940, they might have needed more time, days or weeks more, to reduce France, and thus might have faced a united French overseas empire, even after France in Europe fell. The success of a strategic propaganda operation cannot be guaranteed in any plan. It would be foolhardy optimism to think that psychology can assume a major portion of responsibility for direct military results. It would appear that the Soviet Red Army, despite its propaganda-conscious communist background, never passed the whole buck to psychological warfare. The Russians never appeared to leave the artillery at home in order to take the loudspeakers or leaflet mortars along. They made brilliant, almost terrifying use of pre-belligerent propaganda. They used propaganda tactically with immense success in the taking of prisoners. They used psychological warfare with a heavy infusion of political warfare more drastically for consolidation and occupation purposes than did any of the other United Nations. But, like everyone else, they seem to have used strategic propaganda for whatever it might bring in, immediate generalized effect, and the immediate production of windfalls. Tactical psychological warfare can be estimated, though to a limited extent, 
as part of a tactical potential of either the enemy or one's own side. Strategic propaganda can be planned and evaluated only in terms of the diffuse general situation with the reasonable and fair expectation that, if properly employed, it will better the position of the user. It sometimes achieves results which astound even the originators, but these results cannot be calculated, except by hunch, in advance. Nevertheless, the operation is well worth trying since it has incalculable possibilities and is quite inexpensive in relation to the gross cost of war. End of section 17. Recording by Olivia. Section 18 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Part 3 Planning and Operations. Chapter 10 Organization for Psychological Warfare. Big jobs require big organizations. Eight billion leaflets were dropped in the Mediterranean and European theaters of operations alone under General Eisenhower's command. That is enough to have given every man, woman, and child on earth four leaflets, and this figure, large as it is, does not include leaflets dropped in all the other theaters of war by ourselves, our allies, and our enemies. It does not include the B-29 leaflet raids on Japan in which hundreds of tons of thin paper leaflets were dropped. Huge American newspapers were developed, edited, printed, and delivered to our allies and to enemy troops. One of these, Parachute News, Rakasan, attained a circulation of two million copies per run. This was in the southwest Pacific. In other parts of the upper Burmese jungle and the Tibetan borderland where no newspaper was ever distributed before, the 14th Air Force distributed a Japanese newspaper, Jisei, along with picture sheets for illiterate tribesmen. In getting at the enemy, the United States printed leaflets, cartoons, pamphlets, newspapers, posters, books, magazines. In black operations, enough fabrications were perpetrated to keep the FBI busy for a thousand years. Movies in all forms, commercial, amateur, all known widths, sound and silent, even lantern slides, went out all over the world. Radio talked on all waves in almost every language and code. Loudspeakers, souvenirs, candy, matches, nylon stockings, pistols you could hide in your mouth, Sewing thread, salt, phonograph records, and baby pictures streamed out over the world. Much of this was necessarily waste. In the larger waste of war, it appears almost frugal when taken in relation to the results thought to have been achieved. Every American theater commander, given the choice of using psychological warfare or not, as he chose, did choose to use it. Every major government engaged in the war used psychological warfare, along with a number of assorted private characters some of whom later founded governments. The sacred government of the Dalai Lama in Forbidden Lhasa undertook a neat little maneuver in limited overt propaganda when it printed a brand new set of stamps for presentation to President Roosevelt. The Inner Mongols were propagandized by the Outer Mongols. The Grand Duchy of Luxembourg broadcast against the Reich. Psychological warfare proliferated so much as to change the tone, if not the character, of the war. General Eisenhower wrote, at the end of the European operations, that psychological warfare had developed as a specific and effective weapon of war. The organization of psychological warfare was as much a problem as the operation. It overlapped military, naval, diplomatic, press, entertainment, public relations, police power, espionage, commercial, educational, and subversive operations. Almost every nation involved had extreme difficulty in fitting these new powers and unknown processes into the accepted frame of government, and almost every national solution was different. The British and the Japanese achieved a considerable degree of unification. The Americans, Nazis, and Russians were hampered by the number of competing agencies. The French were burdened through most of the war by an excess of governments. The Chinese did things in their own formal but offhand manner. The Nationalist Party carried on information functions for the Chinese government, while the Communist guerrilla authorities carried on functions for the Communist Party. Figure number 39. Leaflet Production. Military Presses. The machines shown are Davidson presses, widely used by the Americans in all theaters of war. The unit shown is Psychological Warfare Branch during the late operations. The leaflet being run off is addressed to both Filipino guerrillas and Japanese troops, 
facilitating a difficult three-way operations whereby Japanese are told to surrender to Filipinos, Filipinos told not to kill surrendering Japanese, and Americans instructed to receive prisoners from Filipinos. Figure number 40. Leaflet production. Rolling. When round bombs were used, the leaflets had to be rolled into round packages to fit. 40,000 leaflets could be packed into one bomb, and a Mitchell bomber could carry 17 such bombs. Figure 41. Leaflet distribution. Attaching fuses. Package leaflets must spread out. Bundles of paper, which fall intact, make little impact on the enemy unless they hit him in the head. Their subsequent employment is rarely related to propaganda. To be effective, leaflets must scatter. World War II saw the adaptation of various scattering devices, of which the most effective was the barometric fuse, shown here. The others included self-timing packages, slip strings, which unwrapped the package in the air, and a belly tank, which fed leaflets out at any desired speed, either in a continuous stream or in bursts. End of figures 39 through 41. The lower down the echelon, the nearer the armies of the world came to standardizing psychological warfare organization. They did this for the same reason that they all organize into regiments instead of centuries, cohorts, or tribes. Modern war is a self-standardizing process if the enemy experience is to be copied, enemy techniques improved, allied assistance accepted, and military practice kept up to world standards. Psychological warfare units needed printing and radio sections. To service these sections, they all needed intelligence and analysis offices. To distribute their materials, they all needed agents and liaison. Black propaganda organization varied more than did white, but it was amazing to Americans, uncovering Japanese subversive operations units, to see how much the Japanese organizations resembled their own. Figure number 42. Leaflet distribution. Packing the boxes. Sometimes boxes were used instead of bombs. These, being square, facilitated the packing process, since the rectangular packages could be used just as they came out of the print shop. The fuses attached to the package, not the box. Figure number 43. Leaflet distribution. Loading the boxes. Boxes were built to fit the bomb bays. Boxes were opened, one after the other, by a trip lever. Each box can be emptied in turn, giving the pilot the opportunity to select more than one target. Figure number 44. Leaflet distribution. Bombs at the airfield. Leaflet bombs, filled with rolls such as those shown in figure 40, are delivered to the bomber. The scene shown is somewhere in England. Officers and men picked up British slang for leaflet operations and called such missions nickeling. Figure number 45. Leaflet distribution. Loading the bombs. The bombs were loaded as shown. The entire bomb dropped out of the plane and was disintegrated in the air by a small explosive charge. No illustration can do justice to the sight of such a bomb in the actual dropping, since the leaflets tend to look scattered or to disappear under normal flight conditions. Army motion picture films preserve the process for the official record, however. Figure number 46. Leaflet distribution. The final result. Search of prisoners provided a fair, accurate test of how the leaflets took effect. Sometimes, surrender leaflets actually came to have black market value. Enemy officers prohibited the carrying of allied surrender leaflets, since they knew that a soldier who had one in his pocket or hidden in his clothes was halfway or more through the psychological process of surrendering. Here a German hands in a leaflet to his American captor. End of figures 42 through 46. National Propaganda Organizations At the national level, the psychological warfare facilities were part of their national governments. Neither the Axis nor the United Nations developed supranational psychological facilities. The closest thing to international agencies were the American-British coordination facilities under the authority of the Combined Chiefs of Staff, along with that mysterious force which in the latter part of the war impelled Russian-occupied countries to sound amazingly much like Moscow. Short of preparing a textbook for political science study, explaining each of the governments and the location of its intelligence and information functions, it would be impossible to explain in any detail how each of the systems worked. Even between governments having the same general political orientation, the improvised war agencies were different, and in the same government, the practices of World War I were not carried over into World War II. Some description of the American psychological warfare may be warranted, chiefly as a means of showing how a simple task can be accomplished even with intricate and confused organizations. In the Japanese system, on paper the best of them all, though weak in field operations and control, may be outlined for sake of contrast. Figure number 47. Consolidation Propaganda, the movie van. Consolidation of friendly, neutral, or hostile civilians in an area of operations can become a vitally important function. During the North African operations, this movie van showed newsreels and documentary films to the local people. 
Similar vans were used in Italy, France, Holland, Belgium, Germany, Austria, and other areas. End of figure number 47. American Psychological Warfare Agencies The American Army failed to establish its authority and leadership in the field of psychological warfare despite its creation of the Psychological Warfare Branch under G2. In large part, this was a matter of practical politics and of personalities. The United States government as a whole in the successive administrations of President Roosevelt acquired tremendous administrative vitality, but at the same time permitted the older constitutional agencies to lose ground to their newly founded rivals. Had an administrative purist and traditionalist been in the White House instead of a bold government experimenter, the logical creation of a psychological warfare facility would have paralleled the later creation of SWNCC, State War Navy Coordinating Committee. From the purely theoretical standpoint, it would have been far sounder to put national policy formulation, White House and Congress, foreign policy formulation, state, strategic propaganda, state, war, and navy, into a single administrative entity than to create a new federal agency with improvised procedures, improvised security, and an improvised staff. However, the state, war, and navy departments, at the very opening of our war, were overworked and understaffed. Many of the senior personnel regarded psychological warfare with downright suspicion, and propaganda was regarded as a dirty name for a dirty and ineffectual job. Hence, the old line agencies let pass the opportunity for establishing initial control. Figure number 48. Consolidation Propaganda. Posters. An American soldier pastes American posters over Nazi ones while a French crowd looks on. The crowd is pretty typical as to size and content, but a thousand such crowds will cover an entire town. The poster operation shown was conducted by the Psychological Warfare Division of Schaeff. End of figure number 48. Subsequent experience suggests that the use of existing facilities and existing agencies wherever possible instead of new ones imparts stability, discipline, and morale, and lowers the organizational friction common to all new political agencies, especially to instrumentalities in so controversial a field as propaganda. On the chart shown, for instance, it would not have mattered whether the psychological warfare facility, whatever its name, were put for housekeeping purposes under the State War Navy Department or the Office for Emergency Management. The essential requirement would have been to use the State Department men for jobs that involved determining foreign policy, military men for tasks of a military nature, and naval for Navy work, and to recruit only after cadres had been established. The sponsorship of psychological warfare by one, anyone, of the old line departments might have slowed down the feverish tempo of reorganization, quarrels, cabals, internal struggles for power, and clashes with other federal agencies, which were so characteristic of OWI and its colleague organizations. Figure number 49, Consolidation Propaganda, Photo Exhibit. When newsprint is short, a photo exhibit has great appeal to civilians. In backwards countries, people sometimes waited their turn to get a chance to see the American pictures. Even in Cherbourg, the French city shown, these passers-by are showing a very real interest in the picture display. End of figure 49. The actual conduct of psychological warfare was shown in chart 1. No official authority exists for such a chart. The author bases it on his own observation and experience. Only agencies themselves originating psychological warfare materials are shown. Relationships between state, war, and navy were stable, but were frequently bypassed. For example, the Zacharias broadcasts, which were our biggest political warfare experiment, did not go to the State Department until after they had started. Relationships between OSS and other agencies were erratic and cloaked in extraordinary but irregular security. The OWI ran for most purposes as an autonomous group, with occasional reference to state, navy, and war departments. The president, in his individually official capacity, was apt to improvise psychological warfare operations of high importance, without warning his subordinates of what was coming. Paper knife made of human Japanese bone, the unconditional surrender formula. The White House staff sometimes worked through channels, sometimes not. The Harvard professor, who advised on inflation, was simultaneously involved with psychological warfare on continental Asia. The Secretary of the Treasury openly discussed what he would like to do with Germany in terms which the Nazi radio naturally conveyed to its own people. Within the OWI itself, the overseas operation was separated from the domestic, the broadcasters from the planners, the outposts from everybody else during much of the war. But the job was done. Success was not due to the formal structure of the Office of War Information, see charts 5 and 6. No administrative formula could have transcended such governmental confusion. 
It was owing to the fact that all the people just described, who went around with the best will in the world most of the time, minding one another's business, did in the end achieve effective results. The common denominator behind them was not the authority of the president, the discipline of the Democratic Party, or the casually designed, casually overlooked formal lines of authority. The common denominator was American civilization itself. Had we been deeply disunited, this ramshackle structure would have collapsed into chaos. But there was a broad concurrence, a sense of cooperativeness, goodwill, and good temper. A German, Russian, or Japanese bureaucrat would have gone mad in the wartime mazes of the federal system. A Chinese would probably have felt very much at home, but would have polished up the titles and honorifics a little. The difference between our governmental organization and that of our enemies lay in the fact that to us the T.O. were something that could be used when convenient and could, without breach of faith or law, be short-circuited when convenient. Word was passed around, material exchanged, coordination affected in ways which could not be shown on any imaginable chart. It was neither a merit nor a defect, but simply an American way of doing things. This characteristic has the effect, however, of making after-the-fact studies quite unrealistic. There is not much from the formal records and the formal charts which conveys the actual tone of governmental operations in terms of propaganda. Study of World War II organization for the sake of research and planning against possible future war would not be very profitable unless delved into the concrete experience of individuals. The formal outlines mean nothing. They are positively deceptive unless the actual controls and operations are known. Mr. Warburg makes it plain in his book that he thinks little of Mr. Elmer Davis' conception of his job. He does not mention that Mr. Sherwood, theoretically Mr. Davis' subordinate, ran foreign operations without much reference to Mr. Davis or to any other part of the federal government. Since Mr. Sherwood was closer to the White House than was Mr. Davis, this important consideration escapes being recorded on the chart. Foreign operations were actually autonomous. Examples of how things really worked, as opposed to how they looked as though they worked, could be multiplied forever. But the soundest way of finding out sober, judicious opinion will necessarily await the writing of autobiographies and memoirs by the people concerned. With these sweeping reservations in mind, it is worth noting the organization of OWI, internal. The domestic operations branch can be dismissed with brief mention. It proved to be the object of profound suspicion on the part of many members of Congress, and its function was to simulate and assist inward media of public information in support of the war effort. The domestic operations branch never superseded other U.S. government informational services, state, agriculture, treasury, war, and so on, so that it was the wartime supplement to the governmental supplement to the regular news and information system, which remained private. This precluded intimate coordination of domestic and overseas propaganda, and rendered illusory any hope that domestic propaganda, as eavesdropped by our enemies, could be used as an instrument of war. The overseas operations branch had two basic missions. Within the United States, it was the operating and controlling agency for government-owned or government-leased worldwide shortwave. For actual overseas purposes, it was the rear echelon of both the Navy and Army theater facilities and of its own OWI outposts. The outposts were themselves under OWI for certain purposes. For other purposes, they were subject to the chief of mission, ambassador, minister, or charge of the U.S. in the foreign country, and still other purposes under the American military commander having local jurisdiction. OWI Delhi, for example, was under the office of the American High Commissioner in India. Also under the rear echelon headquarters of the commanding general, United States Army Forces, China Burma India Theater, also under OWI New York for supply of its printed materials, most personnel and needed presses, under OWI San Francisco for its supply of its wireless news, and under OWI Washington for general policy, hiring and firing, and everything else. In terms of its own global radio, OWI prepared planning and control materials in Washington and relayed these to New York and San Francisco. The radio facilities in these cities then transmitted the material overseas, Though the first three years of the war, the precise nature of the Washington control was in question. Enforcement remained a perplexing problem, and coordination between planning and execution remained unsolved in part. By the spring and summer of 1945, OWI had solved most of these problems, chiefly by means of circulating the Area 1, 2, and 3 chiefs to the operating offices. When personal relations were satisfactory, as in the instance of Mr. Owen Lattimore, chief in OWI San Francisco, Mr. George Taylor, Chief of Far East in Washington, and Mr. F. M. Fisher, Chief of China Outpost in Chongqing, all of them China experts, coordination might be difficult, but was never exasperating. End of section 18.
Section 19 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 10, Organization for Psychological Warfare, Part 2. In terms of supply, the materials gathered by the other agencies went to the Outpost Service Bureau, which ran a virtual informational Sears Roebuck for the outposts. Foreign demands for American materials were unpredictable. The OWI learned rapidly and effectively, and the material going out of the outposts to foreign audiences very soon reached a high level of quality. Other psychological warfare agencies at the national level were the CIAA, coordinator of the, later the Office of, Inter-American Affairs, which conducted propaganda exclusively to Latin America and the Caribbean, and the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, which serviced the Joint Chiefs of Staff with intelligence and policy materials and served as a home base for its own units, which operated abroad under theater authority. No U.S.-based black propaganda operations were reported to the public. Reduced to the concrete terms of definite policy execution, as opposed to the making of policies that might or might not ever reach their supposed executors, and the routine working of operations, the national level was not important except for the two functions stated above, global shortwave, and source of supply. The decisive choices were made in the theaters or at the outposts, half the time in ignorance of what Washington policymakers had decided in conclave on that particular topic. When the author was in China, he found that the OWI China outpost decoded its week-to-week -week propaganda instructions only after they were hopelessly obsolete. They were then filled. The theaters were able to use psychological warfare as and when they pleased. Between the ETO and Washington, close political military coordination was possible. Between Washington and the others, it was impractical. The War Department participation in the control and planning of psychological warfare is shown in Chart 7, which represents the situation as of 1945. The propaganda branch attached to G2 as a staff agency and not to military intelligence service as an operating agency served to carry out the psychological warfare functions of the War Department. The chief of the branch represented the Joint Chiefs of Staff at OWI meetings, along with his Navy confrere. He took care of official messages to the theaters pertaining to psychological warfare matters, and his office itself performed a few limited functions. One of these functions required the author to get up at 4.30 mornings in order to digest the overnight intake of enemy propaganda. He was joined in this by a Tehran-born, Colombian-trained Edward K. Marat. It was with real relief that he saw the Nazi stations go off the air. He was then able to pass the early bird business to his Persian colleague. The branch also made up propanel studies whenever these were warrantable at the general staff level. The deputy chief, Air, was the vestigial remnant of a short-lived Army Air Forces propaganda establishment. He had direct access to the air staff and took care of things having a particularly air character. The abbreviations under theaters are explained below on page 187, since theater nomenclature for psychological warfare was never standardized. With the termination of hostilities, though it was not the juridical finish of the war, both OSS and OWI were swept out of existence. By executive order of 20 September 1945, effective 10 days later, OSS was broken up. The scholastic portions were dismembered and reassembled into the Department of State, where they presumably helped collate materials for the new Interdepartmental Central Intelligence Group, CIG. The operational parts were handed over to the War Department, for all the author knows, some distressed colonel may have a desk full of fountain pens which explode, transmit radio messages, or can be used for invisible tattooing, along with an edible blotter, a desk telephone which is really a hand grenade, and a typewriter which is a demountable motor scooter. Such speculations are delightful topics on which to dwell, but the day of black propaganda is over. Obsolescence reduces all things, even OSS, to absurdity. The OWI perished a more lingering administrative death. It was transferred to the Department of State as an operating unit under the name Interim International Information Service, IIIS, and a new Assistant Secretary of State, Mr. William Benton, took over its sponsorship. Later, under the abbreviation OIC, Office of International Information and Cultural Affairs, it was coordinated on January 1, 1946, with pre-existing State Department offices and with certain leftovers of the Office of Inter-American Affairs, OIAA, it retained the global broadcasts on a limited budget. It still served the surviving outposts, which were being integrated with diplomatic and consular offices overseas. And for Korea, Japan, Germany, Austria, and Venezia Giulia, 
it acted as a supplying service for the military government information programs in those areas. The Bureau of the Budget took over limited domestic functions when the OWI passed out of independent existence on the 31st of August, 1945. The Joho Kyoku Comparison of this United States system with the Japanese Board of Information, Joho Kyoku, is outlined in Chart 8. It shows the difference between integrated and disparate systems. The Japanese developed a close-knit system which combined public relations of both Army and Navy, all domestic government publishing, complete control of book publishing, magazines, press, radio and film, propaganda intelligence, and overall psychological warfare. The progress of an item through the Japanese psychological warfare system may look intricate when followed on a chart, but it was in fact much less intricate than the comparable American processing of an item. The only aspect of psychological warfare that does not show on the chart is the Japanese political warfare system, by the test of success, the best developed by any belligerent during World War II. The Japanese very early learned the simple rule. Political warfare cannot convert a sub-subsistence economy and government into a satisfactory system, but political warfare can convert a subsisting area into one that has the illusions of prosperity and national freedom. To succeed in the face of economic difficulty, the political warfare must be shrewd, simple, insistent, and backed up with a touch of terror. The Japanese moved into the western colonial areas of the Far East between 1940 and 1942. Indochina, Malaya, Indonesia, the Philippines, parts of China, Burma, and areas inhabited by substantial Indian minorities. They organized the following independent governments. The imperial government of Manchukuo, Federated Autonomous Inner Mongolia, the reorganized national government of China superseding earlier puppets, Malay under Japanese military control but promised ultimate independence, the Republic of the Philippines, the Empire of Vietnam, later the Vietnam Republic, a dictatorship in Burma of the Adipati, Republic Indonesia, Azad Hind, free Indian government in exile, and the Azad Hind Faj, Quisling Indian National Army, which put large forces into the field against British-controlled Indian troops and helped to neutralize the entire military potential of India. The independent Kingdom of Cambodia, made independent by telling the helpless king that he need not let the French come back. These Japanese-sponsored governments flew their own flags, had enough troops to help Japan police their home areas, developed psychological warfare facilities with intensive Japanese assistance, and went through all the motions of independence. In 1944, some of them even held an international conference at Tokyo, thanking Japan for liberating all the non-white states and adopting high-sounding resolutions. The Siamese puppet ambassador to this meeting had the unforgettable name of His Excellency, the Honorable Wichit Wichit Watakan. Behind the pageantries of Japanese political warfare, economic and social realities were horrid. The Japanese printed money which had far less backing than cigar store coupons. They bankrupted all non-Japanese business so that the Japanese carpetbaggers could buy their way in cheap. Businesses owned by white foreigners were expropriated out of hand. They cut off communications, spread terror, raised the price of food, put hospitals out of business, degraded schools, and received the devoted loyalty of large parts of the cheated populations. It did not matter to millions of Burmese whether they had lived well under British rule or not. The British did not let them have their own flag did not let them send ministers and ambassadors, did not let them run a scow up and down the river with a mortar on it, calling it a navy. The Miranda, the pageantry of politics, was what mattered. Not law and order, democracy, security, education, health. The same story might have been repeated on a larger scale throughout the Far East, perhaps ultimately leading to something like Lothrop Stoddard's old nightmare, the rising tide of color. Countervening factors included the presence of Chinese agitation, both both Kuomintang and communist in leadership, guerrilla operations throughout Southeast Asia, and the ruinous economic effects of American submarine and 14th Air Force anti-shipping operations. Shipping losses drove the Greater East Asia co-prosperity fear below subsistence level and created a condition where even the most fanatic patriot realized the disadvantages of the situation. The Japanese put all the captured radios to work. They had traders of all kinds on their side, including, it is shameful to admit, Americans, Russians, British, Australians, and French. Despite the fact they occupied all of Guam, they never used a single Guamanian trader. Testimony to the simple loyalty to the U.S. of the Chamorro people and to the popularity of the long-established U.S. naval government on the island. 
Japanese psychological warfare failed because the real warfare behind it failed. The Japanese could not whip their over-docile troops into a fighting frenzy without allowing those troops to behave in a way which made deadly enemies for Japan among the people she came to liberate. The Japanese did not have sense enough to be satisfied with 100% return per year on their money, but wrecked the conquered economic systems with inflation, poor management, and excess exploitation. Even the Quislings became restless under the poor occupation policies of the Japanese, and before the war was over, a considerable number of Japanese Quislings re-Quislinged back to the United Nations side. Theater Psychological Warfare the Japanese had superlative, close-knit, psychological warfare staff organization within metropolitan Japan. They possessed many first-class field operators, first among them the true-life mastermind Major General K. Diohara, whose dinner guests often woke up the next morning with bad hangovers and high treason on their consciences. But the Japanese did not have adequate channels of communication, supply, and control between their smooth system at the top and the working propagandist at the bottom. The Kempetai, military political gendarmerie structure got in the way. Japanese propaganda lines lost touch with the strategic realities of their slow defeat. They did, instead, what any propaganda system does on the downgrade. They turned to repression instead of counter-propaganda with the inevitable result. In contrast, the American psychological warfare structure included theater operating units, usually called PWB, Psychological Warfare Branch, although it became PWD, Psychological Warfare Division, in Shafe, and did not grow beyond TPWO, Theater Psychological Warfare Officer, in China Theater. The supreme authority was, of course, the theater commander, on whose responsibility the operation had to be carried out. When propaganda bungled and got into the field of political trouble, it was the theater commander and not the subordinates who took the blame. Every theater was under the command of a general, except for Central Pacific, under Admiral Nimitz, and he used an army colonel as his propaganda chief. In most theaters, the political advisor was the buffer between psychological warfare and the commander himself, in the Southwest Pacific, and later the headquarter of the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, Japan. General MacArthur instituted the Office of Military Secretary and made this officer responsible for reporting to him personally the developments in the propaganda field. Subject to local variation, the theater agencies faced similar problems. They had to serve in turn as a rear echelon to service the needs of combat propaganda, while working as the actual operating agencies for the bigger radio programs and the preparation of strategic leaflets. As the areas behind them became more consolidated, displays and films took their place beside news and leaflets as chores that had to be performed. Communications facilities were a problem. Purely military facilities could not, of course, be overloaded by the lightly coded transmission of hundreds of thousands of words of political and other news and guidance. The psychological warfare establishments had to jerry-build communications facilities out of what they could borrow from the army, or obtain from OWI supplies in the United States, or buy locally. In most theater organizations, the chief was a military man, and the staff was partly military and partly civilian. Under General Eisenhower, PWD was not only Army and OWI, but included OSS on the American side, along with British partnership, French participation, and other Allied personnel as well. Under General MacArthur, OWI participated under strict Army control. Under General Stilwell, no theater organization as such was set up. The G2, the political advisor or the general himself, handled propaganda matters when they turned up. Under General Wedemeyer, there was a theater officer. Under General Sultan, the OWI ran itself. The outpost serviced the theater. Under General Clay, Information Control Service, OMGUS, became an integral part of military control. The same thing happened in General MacArthur's reorganized PWB, an organization termed CIES, Civil Information and Education Section, had the organization and personnel not only of the American structure, but the usable purged parts of the Joho Kyoku, obedient to its command and liaison. Other theaters had comparable arrangements, each suited to the theater. Figure number 50. Consolidation of Propaganda. Door Gods. One of the most unusual consolidation propaganda operations was the distribution of door gods. These were small, good-looking posters which traditionally displayed figures from the Chinese pantheon. During the war, Farm families who had been accustomed to putting up new door gods each Lunar New Year found that they could not afford them. China Division, OWI, then run by F.M. Fisher, Richard Watts Jr., Graham Peck, and James Stewart, 
made up new door gods which showed American aviators, thus familiarizing the Chinese peasantry with our insignia and preaching the cause of inter-allied cooperation. End of figure 50. The common features of all theater establishments were 1. Liaison or control from Army, State, and OWI, sometimes including OSS. 2. Responsibility to the theater commander. 3. Direct operation of strategic radio. 4. Preparation of strategic leaflets and sometimes of tactical leaflets as well. 5. Use of local, native, or allied personnel. Within the theater staffs, the psychological warfare facilities were to a great extent assimilated for control and movement of personnel, supply, and so on. The G3s and G4s of the theater normally serviced the PWBs along with the rest of their work. The OWI and other civilian persons were put into uniform and given simulated rank, sometimes wildly disproportionate to their army counterparts. The Army G2s naturally worked with the PWB intelligence facilities. In some theaters, the G2 was ex officio the chief of psychological warfare, as was the assistant chief of the staff G2, War Department General Staff himself at home. The G1s usually kept out of the way of psychological warfare, and the housekeeping of the units was in most cases autonomous. Responsibility for financing psychological warfare was never established as doctrine. The State Department kept most of it off its budget, leaving the actual payments up to the War Department and the OWI to figure out. Oftentimes, this resulted in a curious sort of neo-capitalism within the U.S.-owned socialism of the Army. The two agencies would hold on to property as though it were a private property, on the basis of immediate title, without reference to the plain fact that all of it was paid for in the end by the United States Treasurer. OWI once murmured threateningly about bringing its radio material home from Manila rather than let General MacArthur's people hijack it. Such talk ended when the material was declared surplus or stolen. Field Operations Field operations were most highly developed in the Mediterranean and European theaters of operation. Combat propaganda units came into being, carrying fully equipped mobile radio stations and high-volume printing presses along with them. Later, under Schaeff, these units developed further and army-level organizations were set up which duplicated the theater organization on a reduced scale. See Chart 9 for Chart of an Army Unit. The tactical leaflet, page 211, came into its own with such units. It was possible to develop high-speed routines for using intelligence swiftly. Maps were dropped on the enemy in unfavorable situations. Order of battle became highly important for psychological warfare purposes when enemy units could be addressed by their proper unit designation or by the name of their commanders. Intelligence was brought into play. Bad food, bad supply, poor command, or mishandling of enemy forces in any way brought prompt propaganda comment. Radio was the least useful for tactical operations, simply because enemy troops do not carry private portable radio sets around with them. Radio was of high value in consolidation operations, passing along instructions to liberated populations, and telling civilians in the line of approach about measures which they could take for the common benefit of themselves and of the Allies. A constant problem, never completely ironed out, was the use of airplanes for dropping purposes. The leaflet producers had, in all theaters, a tendency to prepare excellent leaflets, bail them, and send them along to the airfield in the expectation that an overworked, unindoctrinated Air Force staff would automatically pick up the leaflets, develop dropping mechanisms, pack the leaflets into planes, take them out, and drop them to the right language groups at the right time in the right place. This was, of course, so absurd from the aviator's side as it was to the civilians to let their brain children accumulate in hangars or warehouses. For strategic droppings, systemic arrangements could be made through proper official channels and a regular air operation detailed to do the job. Tactical dropping did not allow enough time for elaborate staff to work in each instance, and recourse was had to psychological warfare liaison officers, either army officers or civilians with the approximate status of tech rep technical representative, a familiar sight on World War II airfields, to get in touch with the units, help them install dropping facilities, explain the leaflets to the actual pilots and bombardiers, and thus obtain a high degree of cooperation. In almost every theater, this policy succeeded, and a wide variety of leaflet bombs, leaflet dispensers, and other leaflet circulating gadgets was developed. Artillery distribution also played a significant part. For front-line situations, artillery could do a better job than planes without risking aircraft in a quasi-combat operation. Leaflet bombs of considerable scope appeared, and could be made to fit almost any appropriate weapon. Circulation was also affected by means of clandestine operations to friendly civilians, frequently combined with airdrop of weapons, medicine, and other essentials. The organization of all these new functions had changed military organization. A whole new series of units were attached in echelon, each fitted to the appropriate level for its work. 
The rear area functions and strategic propaganda work always required a considerable proportion of civilian aid, since some of the best workers in this line were persons who either did not wish to join the army or whom the army did not wish to have join it. These psychological warfare operations were unbelievably cheap, even if measured by the most conservative estimates of their success. It is impossible that the army of the future, whether American or foreign, will overlook this source of assistance. Psychological warfare nowhere replaced combat, but it made the impact of combat on the enemy more effective. End of section 19. Section 20 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 11. Plans and Planning. With most military planning, it is feasible to work from the top down to find the strategic objective and then work out the actual requirements of the operation in advance. This is not true of psychological warfare. Footnote. While this statement is plainly a matter of individual opinion, the author considers that his own experience supports his opinion in this instance. He wrote plans on almost every operating level in the governmental and military hierarchy during World War II, all the way from drafting plans for the joint American and combined British-American chiefs of staff, down to helping field agents in the China theater work out practical little propaganda plans for their own missions, or planning the writing, use, and classification of leaflets one by one in collaboration with OWI operators. He found planning to be fascinating at the top and worthwhile at the bottom of the pyramid, but he found no significant correlation between the top and the bottom, save in the sense which he makes plain. End of footnote. The objectives may be defined, and in the process of definition, the general needs of a propaganda agency may be clarified. If a plan calls for a press or a radio, somebody can requisition a Davidson press or a Hallicrafter radio and get ready to use it. But the plan cannot define goals, set time limits for the achievement of the goals, relate the goals to one another in a scheduled prefixed program of success, establish terms whereby psychological victory can be told from psychological defeat. Psychological victory exists only in terms of the military victory which it is designed to assist. Psychological defeat, no matter how much critics or the enemy propagandist may allege it, can be proved to exist only when an actual defeat makes it real. Psychological plans are always contingency plans for the assistance of military operations. They are dependent on the military operation, and they cannot be checked against fact except in terms of the military operations they ostensibly support. Unfortunately, they were not always written with these reservations in mind. Needs of the Operator, Materials and Guidance American officers assisting foreign troops could not plan logistics until they found out what the foreign troops actually required. How much did they eat and what? How much could they carry and for how long? How much tonnage had to be sent them and how often? Such questions had to be asked about the needs of the individual men before unit planning, not to mention national planning, became possible at all. Similarly, in psychological warfare, planning can be made realistic if it starts with the individual operation for the control of which the planning is done. Define the operator as anyone having a task in the actual preparation, production, or transmission of propaganda materials, whether through electric communications or by print. The operator is not usually a person with a high security classification, yet he plays his indispensable part in fulfilling the highest and most secret strategy of the war. How can a plan be written that will be useful in carrying out the actual and highly secret strategy of the war while meeting the needs of an inexpert individual way down at the bottom of the control system? The answer is, of course, that no such plan can be prepared. Different plans are needed for successive phases. The operator needs simple but basic materials. If he is a producer of some kind, such as a creative writer, an artist, a singer, a program arranger, a newscaster who does his own scripts, and so on, he is likely to be a person with ideas of his own. Individual creativeness cannot usually be turned on and off like a faucet. Low-ranking and disciplined though the hired writer may be, he is still subject to the inward frailties of authors if he is any good. This particular author sympathized deeply with some poor American Japanese who were given unbelievably dull outlines and told, 
turn this into exciting Japanese material. Give it pep. Make it rock them off their tatami. But don't get away from that outline one damn inch. The Nisai rolled their eyes. They did a poor job, as they knew that they would. The person who has to be told day in and day out how to operate is no operator at all. Psychological warfare is no place for unsuccessful short story writers or would-be radio commentators. It demands professional standards, and it has more than professional difficulties. Therefore, what the operator needs is not technical instruction, but general guidance. He must be told what he can say, what he cannot say. He should, whenever possible, be given some reason for perplexing or cryptic instructions. He should be helped to become familiar with what we are trying to tell the enemy. There is nothing classified about that, since the enemy is to be told it as soon as possible. The guidance given the operator should be 1. Plain 2. Feasible This sounds superfluous, but was not so during World War II, when operators were sometimes told to attack such and such an enemy institution without referring to it directly or indirectly. 3. Organized the material at OWI was not organized until the last several months of the war, with the result that hundreds of thousands of words of propaganda commands remained in force, technically, but unindexed and arranged only by weekly form. 4. Specific in showing timing. General controls should not be issued at the beginning of operations. When revised, the revision should supersede the revised section and not be placed beside it. Other provisions should be given expiration dates, after which they pass out of effect. 5. Mandatory. Control should be expressed in do or don't. Personal advice is better conveyed through informal channels. 6. Non-security or low classified. This material for the operator should be accessible to the operators. Often, the most important operator, the best newsman, the most effective leaflet artist, may be a rather doubtful citizen, an alien, or even an enemy volunteer. He cannot follow guidances unless he knows them, and it makes a farce of security for his superior to be able to tell him the guidance so that he can memorize it, but not able to give him the document itself. These rules, though simple, are not always easy to follow. Here is an example of a bad guidance. Classified. Without superseding instructions concerning religion, we may use the occasion of the sacred banyan tree festival to needle the provisional president, make a dramatic story of the president's life, undermine his use of religion to bolster the dictatorship. Caution, do not mention religion. Do not indulge in scurrilous personal attacks. Material considering our information of the president's biography is highly classified and must not be used. The exaggeration may seem apparent, but it is a fair sample of the worst directives as actually issued, and many, though not quite so bad, were near it. The same guidance in more acceptable form would read, Unrestricted. Expires 24 September, week following festival. Standing instructions make Banyan Tree Festival difficult topic with which to deal. If operators can suggest means of referring to festival without violating prohibitions against religious offense, encourage them to try. Monitoring and diplomatic sources show that provisional president is utilizing festival to consolidate his position. If he can be attacked, do so. The other need of the actual operator is material. The scriptwriter needs actual texts of everyday enemy speech in order to keep his slang and idiom up to date. The artist needs correct photographs of enemy cities in war times so that the leaflet picture he makes will not look as outmoded as a crinoline or a Model T. All of them need all the information they can get about their own country. Good handbooks, dictionaries, elementary histories, textbooks in fields which they may not know. It is amazing how hard it is to explain America to foreigners. The American soon finds out how little he knows his own country, and needs information about his own background, along with current materials concerning the enemy. Where radio propaganda is in question, the scriptwriters and broadcasters will read the enemy radio propaganda if they do not get enough fresh non-propaganda material concerning their audience. Sooner or later, this will degenerate into alternate soliloquies of the radio man on each side, each watching the other to see if he got a rise out of him last time. OWI people frequently expressed idiot glee at having made Radio Tokyo frantic. The OWI men were the first to admit that their glee was pointless, since it was the Japanese broadcaster and not the Japanese audience who responded. But for lack of current information about the enemy, the propagandist will refer to his own professional opponent. 
There is, of course, a very substantial difference between a change in enemy propaganda occasioned by a real inroad which one's own propaganda had made in enemy opinion, and a change that consists simply in angry or smart backtalk. Finding that difference is the responsibility of propanal, not of the operator. Pre-belligerent planning Pre-belligerent planning differs from regular planning in that it does not have the substantial context of actual military operations to make it realistic and urgent. Like all plans, the pre-belligerent plan should enumerate the facilities available, the basic course of action to be followed, and the limits within which offensive propaganda will be permitted. In fairness to the planners themselves, as well as to the authorities who will fit this plan into related military, economic, or political plans, the plan should define the proper scope of propaganda as applied to the contemplated situation. One of the most useful functions of the pre-belligerent plan lies in the periodic exercise which it gives in propaganda discipline. Information and intelligence agencies frequently see their jobs so technically that they lose sight of the need for coordination within the mechanism of an entire government. Press relations people try to get stories in the papers. Radio people try to maintain listener interest. Educational officers are concerned with the teachability of their materials. Spokesmen of the different agencies in related fields, such as shipping, air transport, currency control, social welfare, are apt to comment on a particular situation without reference to the needs of an inclusive national policy. How much advice was handed out on the occasion of the ultimatum to Tito? The Yugoslav authorities plainly risked politico-psychological pressure from us. They came prepared for the consequences, but both American official and private opinion expressed a wild medley of recommendations, suggestions, and analysis. Federal officials showed no better discipline than did the private citizens. Pre-belligerent planning may be forced on the United States by eventual international crises, but before that stage is reached, private and governmental persons working in the informational field might do well to consider how readily they could offer or enforce cooperation in the event of a real emergency. Psychological Warfare Plans A general plan for psychological warfare expresses the aims of the portion of the war, either in point of time or with respect to a stated area to which it refers. It states the maximum goals which psychological warfare can, with honest realism, be counted on to accomplish if all goes well. It indicates the minimum effect which, unlike combat operations, can fall precisely at zero. The general plan then goes on to state the conditions which will govern the operating agencies. The important part of this section lies in guessing where the operating agencies are likely to need coordination and where not. If the plan is to reveal highly important and therefore secret strategy, it should merely sketch the broad outlines of the processes intended, leaving to experts the responsibility of determining specific do's and don'ts. In such a case, however, the plan should not leave room for interagency or interpersonal doubt as to where the interpretive function lies. Too often, highly formal agreements are interpreted out of existence by propagandists who are interested in adding their own proposals to those set forth and agreed upon in the plan. When definition of the plan in operational terms is needed, the location of the subdefiner should be made very plain, unless the propaganda establishment itself happens to be remarkably well organized and in no further need of definite prescriptions of function. Footnote on Definition of the Plan in Operational Terms in the pseudo-technical propaganda slang of the OWI people, this was called spelling out. The same people, quote, stockpiled campaigns to needle, unquote, the enemy. End of footnote. The inclusion of actual political and military goals in a propaganda plan is an exceedingly ambitious undertaking. The goal, quote, to foster a spirit of nationalism and independence among the Eastern Arachosian people to the end that they may revolt and set up their own pro-allied government, unquote, is a commitment beyond the reach of normal propaganda. It comes closer to requiring all the facilities of the operating state, financial, diplomatic, covert, and paramilitary, to put it into effect. The goal, quote, to give sympathetic circulation to Eastern Arachosian autonomous sentiments so as to promote interference with the occupying power, unquote, is much more nearly attainable. Military goals are often described by propagandists as attainable by means of propaganda alone, but there is no known example of psychological warfare having attained a strictly military goal without assistance by other means of warfare.
Goals such as the defeat of blank, the surrender of blank, or the destruction of blank have no place in practical propaganda planning, since they are pretentious or deceptive. More legitimate are the goals actually obtained by propaganda, such as encouragement of a spirit of factionalism which may assist defeat, promotion of war weariness that will make the process of surrender more easily accomplished, and appeals for the destruction of blank. Such points may appear minor, but it is the overstatement of the propaganda case that has many times goaded disinterested outsiders into becoming skeptics or opponents. Political and military goals can be described only in terms of hopes. Effective psychological goals, goals resting in the form of opinion which it is desired to create, are very concrete. If enemy surrender is desired, Propaganda leaves to the operator no further scope for revenge themes which will frighten the enemy away from surrender. If the enemy leader is to be discredited on the basis of having poor military judgment, the contrasting good judgment of the enemy general is a necessary ingredient. The psychological goals have to be framed in terms of how much the enemy listener, the propaganda man, can stand and can believe. See page 153. Since he listens irregularly, furtively, and half antagonistically, propaganda will defeat itself if it shifts from goal to goal with logical but fine spun dexterity. Psychological goals are attained only by sustained, consistent patterns of propaganda. They have to be plain, repetitive, and insistent. Political and military goals can be anything the planners feel like including as a pious wish. They might as well consist of a current restatement of political and military aims for the subject or area at the time of planning. They are beyond the reach of practical psychological warfare. National level and general staff level plans have to be made up in much the same way. If the plan is good, it will provide for its own circulation to all government instrumentalities which do in fact conduct propaganda in the particular field involved. It does no good to adopt a plan for the encouragement of the Filipinos and the inducement of cooperation among the Filipino officials of the Japanese-sponsored republic, which means a tone of conciliation toward Filipino leaders or officials who hold puppet titles, if a cabinet member keeps calling publicly for the immediate execution of any Filipino who ever had dinner with a Japanese. It is useless to try to cooperate with communist guerrillas in West Katai on the argument, we all oppose the Axis together, ideologies don't matter when brave men fight side by side, if at the same time the guerrillas know we have a strong domestic campaign on against communism. Telling a communist that ideologies don't matter is like saying to a Jesuit, let's skip the superstitions, father, and leave religion out of it, get down to business. To some kinds of people, ideology is business. The broad propaganda plan should make choices that reflect the judgment of the reviewing officers. If they are made in a vacuum, without taking into consideration the actual opinion of the audience group, they might as well not be made at all. Propaganda plans must be circulated to non-propaganda agencies in order to make sure that the routine public relations or announcements of current or contemplated action and statements of basic policy do not contradict or neutralize the plan once it is put into effect. Frequently, months of propaganda work can be undone by a tactless speech from somebody in the same government but in an unrelated agency. Authoritative circulation of the plan, which means that the plan must be neither long nor over-secret, can help forestall such mistakes. Speech clearance, requiring review of all official and policymaking speeches in advance of delivery, is the surest safeguard against overt collision between different spokesmen. In World War II, it was applied with some success, but the exceptions were so conspicuous that the effective coordination passed almost unnoticed. Strategic and Consolidation Plans Advanced psychological warfare plans for concrete military operations not only require a statement of the propaganda operation to be performed with facilities and personnel who are expected to remain static, but demand that the psychological warfare personnel, together with the needful gear, be moved right along with the advancing forces. This makes planning more definite, and those parts of the plans that do not require psychological or political prescription of content can be written in standard military form. Wise consolidation plans give urgent priority to the restoration of the homegrown informational media and recreational facilities of the occupied territory.
Definite anticipation of shortages in radio facilities, newsprint, ink, paper, and other supplies can ensure prompt reopening of consolidated facilities underway. The propaganda operators may tell higher echelons that the local people are not competent, cannot be trusted, and so on, but General MacArthur's experience in Japan would seem to indicate that no army can carry on consolidation propaganda as efficiently as the conquered civilians themselves can, provided the civilians have 1. Reasonable, though restricted, freedom of utterance, so that they can know what they may or may not say. 2. Prompt liaison for security and policy clearance, so that they can get an authoritative yes or no answer on proposed projects, enabling them to maintain operation without intolerable delays. 3. Friendly professional assistance in meeting material and staff shortages. 4. A series of phases marking off the forms and methods of control, so that the controlling staff can plan for a first phase of doing its own publishing and broadcasting, a second phase of letting the local people work under license with close supervision and technical help, and a third phase of permitting them freedom within the normal censorship limits of military government. The American DISCCs, District Information Services Control Commands, in the American zone of Germany, did an excellent job in moving rapidly from Phase 1 to Phase 2 in 1945 and 1946. Contingency Plans Frequently, the chiefs of government and services know of an operation or danger that may arise which will change the character of the war. Such were the North African landings, the Italian surrender, D-Day itself, the joining of the American and Russian forces in Germany, Hitler's death. For such contingencies, it is desirable to have plans ready stating the reaction of the government to the event. Such plans can be prepared and distributed to select personnel and downgraded or released together with any needed last-minute change when the first word comes through that the event is officially to be recognized. Profoundly secret contingencies, such as Hiroshima Day, do not lend themselves to such treatment. It must be repeated that plans are effective only when transposed into plain, simple, usable guidelines for the actual operatives. When a plan is so secret or so involved that the only people who could carry it out are not allowed to know anything about it, it becomes a sad, self-defeating effort. Figure 51. Basic Types. Start of War. This leaflet embodies almost all possible mistakes in psychological warfare. It was prepared to explain why war came between America and Japan, but was not even begun until many months after Pearl Harbor. The heading and style are official and formal. The message is no more than a footnote to history. Its last fault redeemed it. No arrangements were made for dropping it. End of figure 51. End of section 20. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 29, 2021. Section 21 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 12. Operations for Civilians. Plainly, psychological warfare operates against civilians with as much effect as it does against troops. Indeed, under the rather high standards set for modern warfare by the Hague and Geneva Conventions, psychological warfare is left as one of the few completely legitimate weapons which can on occasion be directed against an exclusively civilian and non-combatant target. Even though World War II erased most of the distinctions between military and civilian, leaving civilians in the vertical front line of all air war, psychological warfare gained it became a more useful instrument for bettering war. Civilian interest in propaganda became no mere matter of emotional loyalty or philosophical preference, but a life-and-death matter to its recipients. After fire raids, it would be a madman who would disregard an enemy bomb-warning leaflet without trying to figure out its application to himself and his children. Shortwave Radio Shortwave radio is the chief burden-bearer of long-distance psychological warfare. It is more useful as a means of connecting originating offices with standard wave relay stations than as a direct means of communication. Even in free countries, shortwave sets are not often plentiful. 
The conditions of reception from a purely technical point of view are often undesirable. Recreational material does not go through, since a shortwave listener will put up with the static when he is receiving vital, vividly presented news, but often will not try to make out soap opera or music over the squawks of the ether. And the use of shortwave reception in wartime implies a deliberate willingness on the part of the listener to do something which he knows to be disloyal or dangerous. Shortwave does make it possible for advanced standardwave propaganda stations to pass along material which has been prepared in the homeland. Large staffs can do the work. The news can be put through a large, alert, well-organized office. Features can be prepared by real professionals acted out by a number of actors, put on records, reviewed, and then relayed to the standard wave station whenever needed. The Americans at Radio Saipan thus broadcast right into Japan and were able to transmit materials which could not possibly have been put on the air with the staff working on the island. The people at Saipan were mostly telecommunications technicians, engaged in picking up the shortwave from Hawaii or San Francisco and in passing it on into the enemy country on the standard wavelength. Millions of Japanese heard our Saipan standard wave broadcasts, in contrast to the dozens or hundreds who have heard our shortwave previously. The use of homeland facilities makes possible the advanced preparation of a large collection of material ready for broadcast. In security-sensitive or otherwise dubious situations, four or five alternate programs can be worked out for the same amount of program time. On wire recorders or disc records, the proposed material can be passed around in finished form, reviewed, selected, censored, and approved. This would not be true of a hurried station working far forward in the zone of operations. Shortwave has its own advantages, however, apart from its utility as a means of getting program material to the relay stations. Shortwave can and will be picked up by the enemy monitors and enemy intelligence systems. It will also be heard by persons of power, wealth, and influence, irrespective of the economic or political system of the enemy. The big shots of any system know how to transcend limitations that awe or defeat the ordinary man. The shortwave transmitter speaks, therefore, to the enemy government, to the groups which compose the enemy government, and to the individuals in or out of the enemy government who are leaders in their country. We found that the Joho Kyoko and the Gaimushu Foreign Office in Tokyo were mimeographing a daily summary of our San Francisco broadcasts, and we thus knew that anything we said over San Francisco would be heard by the most influential men in Japan. Captain Ellis Zacharias, U.S. Navy, spoke Japanese and had known most of the Japanese leaders personally before the war. With government monitoring known to exist, he felt free to address the Japanese leaders personally and directly with assurance his words would reach them. And his broadcasts are confessed by the Japanese themselves to have played a contributory part in bringing about the Japanese decision to surrender. Standard Wave The most effective use of radio is that which falls within the receiving capacity of the ordinary receiving sets owned or used by the enemy population. This means the establishment of transmitting facilities close enough to the enemy territory for the programs to get through. As between the United States and Japan from 1941 through 1944, this was very difficult. No Americans ever dared join the Shantung guerrillas, whether Kuomintang or communist, with transmitters. And as long as we broadcast from the safety of our side of the ocean, we could only hope that occasional freak conditions would echo programs into Japan two or three times a month. With the British and the Germans, it was altogether different. The two countries were virtually touching, and each could cover the entire enemy territory. With short-distance standard wave broadcasting to an enemy, known to have millions of radio receivers, strategic radio becomes effective. The chances provided for building up a consistent group of listeners, for influencing their morale and opinions, and for circulating rumors that will reach almost every single person in the enemy population. The temptation to perform tricks, to lapse back to peacetime standards of radio as entertainment or radio as advertising, is a constant one. The propagandist knows that he is being heard, 
and he fears that his audience will lose interest if he does not stimulate them with a brilliantly variegated series of programs. Black radio comes into its own on standard wave. The British could put the mysterious anti-British, anti-Hitler broadcaster Gustav Siegfried Eintz on the air. With his rousing obscenities, his coarse but believable gossip, his wild diatribes against the Allies and against the Nazi scum who got in the way of the glorious German army, he was so good that for a while even American Propanol thought he might be a spokesman for the saucier members of the Wehrmacht general staff. The Germans could broadcast proletarian propaganda on the Lenin Old Guard station, foaming at the mouth whenever they mentioned the crazy vile fascist swine Hitler, and then going into tantrums because the Communist Party needed all the brave glorious leaders who had been murdered by the fat bureaucrat Stalin. Ed and Joe could talk out of Bremen and pretend to be scooting around the American Midwest, one jump ahead of the G-men with their trailer and concealed transmitter telling the rest of the Americans below down about that goof Roosevelt and his Jewish war. But Ed and Joe were not good enough to fool anybody. Black radio is great fun for the operators, but its use is often limited to a twisted kind of entertainment, designed to affect the morale of dubious groups. It leaps to sudden importance only in times of critical panic, when it can add the last catalyst to national confusion, precipitating chaos. The beginning and end of standard wave transmission is news. News, see page 135, uses standard appeals. It should be factual, but selectively factual. Repetition of basic themes is much more important than the constant invention of new ones. The propaganda chief has nothing to do day in and day out but to think of his own programs. He becomes familiar with them and bored by them. He visualizes his propaganda man as a person who hears old transmissions and is understandably bored by them, overlooking the interruptions that listeners face, the long gaps between the programs they hear, the weather interference, the static, the police measures. Even with peacetime facilities, tremendous simplicity and repetition are needed to convey advertising on the radio. In wartime, repetition is even more necessary. It serves the double function of driving the theme home to listeners who have heard it before, while broadening a circle of listeners with each transmission. A point of diminishing returns is soon reached, but even diminished returns are often rewarding. The hardest to reach people are sometimes the one it is most important to reach with a simple, basic, persuasive item. Repetition thus ensures depth of response in the core audience while adding to the marginal audience with each additional application. What is deadly monotonous to the propagandist himself may on the thousandth repetition merely have become pleasantly familiar to the propaganda man on the other end. The author has talked to any number of clandestine listeners to our propaganda who have almost wept with rage as they told of listening to jokes, novelties, political speeches, and other funny stuff when they hoped to get a clean-cut announcement of the latest military news. Communication through the mails In World War II, propaganda was not able to make use of the mails, the way that propagandists of World War I succeeded in doing. The mails were much more intermittent. The channels in Germany through Scandinavia were not kept open except for Sweden, which was reachable, rather perilously, by air alone. Iberia was an inhospitable base. German counterintelligence was more than ruthless. It was effectively savage and made the Germany of Kaiser Wilhelm seem rustic by contrast. With Japan, anything would have had to go through Soviet censorship to get there in the first place and then meet the traditional intricacies of Japanese red tape. Male propaganda was therefore not heavily developed. Something was accomplished, however, by use of the Portuguese, Spanish, Swiss, and Chinese press. Enemy officials and private persons were known to read these, and it was possible to do a great deal toward influencing editorial content. Major male propaganda operations were conducted against us, however. The Nazis, as part of their 
pre-belligerent planning and operations, sent enormous quantities of propaganda through the United States mail, sometimes postage free, under the frank of congressmen. The Japanese, down to the time of Pearl Harbor, kept large public relations staffs running at full speed in New York, Washington, and other American cities. They helped their American friends with money and by heavy purchase of copyright material friendly to Japan, thus making it unnecessary for any author to report himself as a Japanese paid agent. And they offered Japanese cultural and educational information to interested persons. It really was cultural and well done. By talking about Japanese poetry, religion, and cherry blossoms, and omitting all war propaganda, the handsome little booklets kept alive the memory of a hospitable, quaint, charming Japan. Some of this material was mailed directly from Japan to the United States. Since mail propaganda depends on the freedom of the mails, it is much more apt to be used by a dictatorship against us than by us against a dictatorship. Leaflets. The types of leaflets are described in the next chapter, in the course of discussing leaflets addressed to troops. Each leaflet, designed for a military group, has its civilian equivalents. In addition to the military types, overt propaganda leaflets for civilians should include 1. Communications from legitimate authorities, whether government in exile, underground, or friendly quizzling of the civilians addressed. 2. Newspapers in air format, reduced in scale, but with a heavy proportion of the normal peacetime features of the audience's own press. 3. Novelty materials appealing to children, who are apt to become the most industrious collectors of leaflets, disseminating them far and wide, with less danger of reprisal from the occupying power or the police than adults might face. Good adult leaflets are as interesting to children as are leaflets specially designed for them. The use of color printing, vivid illustrations, pictures of air battles, how it works diagrams of weapons, and so forth, may reach the teenage audience, best if it gives no indication of being aimed at them. 4. Gifts. Soap, salt, needles, matches, chocolate, and similar articles dropped to civilian populations. This demonstrates the wealth and benevolence of the giver. Countermeasures to enemy use of this type of propaganda consist of dropping a few duplicates of his gifts, containing poison ivy soap, nauseating salt, infected-looking needles, explosive chocolate, etc. The Germans are reported to have followed this procedure against the American air gifts dropped to Italy and France. With the avoidance or the spoilage of gifts, the propaganda effects become so confused that both sides find it worth desisting for a while. 5. Appeals to women. Women, statistically, are around 50% of the population of any country. With a diversion of men to fighting operations, the percentage of women in a home population rises, and in wartime it may become 60 or 70%. They face social and economic problems much more immediately than do men, because the responsibility for maintaining homes and children normally falls on them. Evidence of humane intentions, of reluctance to wage the most cruel forms of war, of attempts to help civilians escape unnecessary danger, can bring women into the participating enemy group for relaying propaganda. Pamphlets. Where airdropping facilities are plentiful, Leaflets can be supplemented by pamphlets. Pamphlets have the advantage of giving the propagandist more space for text or pictures, enabling him to tackle enemy arguments in detail or in depth. Pamphlets can present sustained arguments, and thus come closer to meeting the domestic propaganda facilities of the enemy on even ground. They are especially useful in countering or neutralizing those enemy arguments which depend either on formal argument or on misapplied statistics and which therefore require point-by-point -point confutation. The pamphlet shown in Figure 6 is an excellent example of the medium, though it carries a complex message. It can be read by persons at the lowest education level. It meets enemy propaganda over a whole range of themes. It is apt to be disseminated farther whether initial distribution be by ground or by air. Unlike the leaflet, the pamphlet is sometimes hard to conceal, 
For well-policed areas, it must be supplied with a protective disguise if it is to be passed along. One ingenious pamphlet made up by Dennis McAvoy and Don Brown at OWI for dropping on the Japanese started out with a warning. Enemy! Warning! This is an enemy publication issued by the United States government. Finder is commanded to take this to the nearest police station immediately. Enemy! This pamphlet gave a general statement of Japan's bad war position and was addressed to Japanese policemen and police officials. The cover urged the policemen not to keep the pamphlet, nor to destroy it, but to pass it on up through channels, to their superiors, as an instance of enemy propaganda. We never found out what the Japanese police actually did when they got those. One Japanese black leaflet assumed the proportions of a book, and was made up in the familiar format of the pocket-sized 25-cent volumes, with a New York dateline, a copyright notice, and even printer's union label all neatly falsified, the book expressed opposition to Roosevelt's war. It was circulated by the Japanese as a captured enemy book, presumably, in order to convince their own people and their Asiatic associates that opposition to World War II existed within the United States itself. Almost all belligerents issued maligners' handbooks during the war. These started out with statements that the medical control system was inadequate, that each man had to look out for himself, and that feigned sickness was often the only alternative to real sickness. Disguised as entertainment booklets, instructions accompanying medicine, or even as official handbooks of the enemy government, for this and that purpose, the leaflets gave detailed instructions on how to fake tuberculosis, heart trouble, and other diseases. Subversive Operations Propaganda to friendly civilians whose country has been overrun by the enemy can be effectively promoted by collaboration with local patriots, unless political considerations prevent such collaboration. This type of operation requires careful cooperation between propaganda, overt, subversive facilities, and intelligence personnel. World War II saw the type used on all fronts. The Japanese made especially bold use of it during the conquest of Malaya the occupation of Burma, and the Chinese railway campaigns of 1944. Natives on the enemy side were regarded by us as quislings. The Japanese honored them as patriots and duped them effectively. Bold black propaganda operations can often embarrass the enemy. The dropping of a few hundred tons of well-counterfeited currency would tend to foul up any fiscal system. Peacetime counterfeiters operate with poor materials, secretly, and in small shops. When instructed, a government agency can do an astoundingly good job of counterfeiting. The United States is on the vulnerable side of this operation because our money happens to be the most trusted and most widely hoarded in the world. Various governments are believed to have run off substantial numbers of United States $20 and $50 bills. Less offensive operations consists of giving the enemy populace sets of ration cards along with simple suggestions on how to finish the forging job so as to make it convincing. The Nazis were especially subject to this kind of attack, since German methodical bookkeeping required a large number of documents to be in the possession of each citizen. Falsification of any of these made the German officials go mad with confusion. To a country suffering from too much policing, the transmission by black propaganda of facsimile personal identity cards in large numbers would be welcomed by many common citizens and would keep the enemy police procedure at a high pitch of futile haste. The essence of this, as of all good black propaganda, is to confuse the enemy authorities while winning the thankfulness of the enemy people, preferably while building up the myth within the enemy country that large, well-organized groups of revolutionists are ready to end the war when their time comes. If white propaganda is to be compared to incendiary bombing, in that it ultimately affects the enemy armed services by disorganizing the homeland behind them, black propaganda may be compared to the tinfoil strips used in anti-radar. Black propaganda strikes directly at enemy security. It gives him too much to do, and thus increases the chances for agents down on the ground to succeed in their lonely, dangerous work. Motion Pictures in consolidated areas, allied or neutral territory, and the home jurisdiction, motion pictures for civilians 
can be employed as a major propaganda instrument. The combination of visual and auditory appeal ensures a concentration of attention not commanded by other media. In both world wars, the U.S. made extensive use of film. Procurement can be either through direct governmental manufacture of the finished product or by subcontracting to non-governmental agencies. Propaganda films normally make a point of displaying the military prowess and civic virtue of the distributor. Officially distributed films are, however, almost always overshadowed by pure entertainment films. The wartime official movie can penetrate no deeper than can the unofficial picture. Financial and commercial control, plus censorship, limits the periphery into which motion picture showings can be extended. Often the private film will be shown when the public one will be suppressed. And in time of peace, the propaganda movie has ever sharper competition from its private competitors. Few propaganda movies have ever achieved the spectacular impact of some private films in portraying the American way of life. Tahitians, Kanzumen, Hindus, and Portuguese would probably agree unanimously in preferring the USA of Laurel and Hardy to the USA of strong-faced men building dams and teaching better chicken raising. Only rarely does the cinema penetrate enemy territory or reach clandestine audiences. Its direct contribution to critical zone psychological warfare is therefore slight. Perhaps television may, in course of time, Combine attention holding with transmissibility. End of section 21. Section 22 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Linebarger Operations Against Troops In every instance of systematic American use of psychological warfare against enemy troops during World War II, affirmative results were discerned after the operation had been in effect for a short while. Figure 46 shows the consummation of the troop propaganda program. These Germans are surrendering, and they carry the Allied leaflets with them. By the latter phases of the liberation of France, 90% of the enemy prisoners reported that they had seen or possessed Allied leaflets, and the most famous leaflet of them all, the celebrated Passierschein, see figure 4 came to be as familiar to the Germans as their own paper money. Since every enemy who surrenders is one less man to root out or destroy at a cost of life to one's own side, the sharp upswing of enemy surrenders was a decided military gain. Two separate types of psychological reaction are to be sought in the enemy soldier's mind. The first consists of a general lowering of his morale or efficiency even when he is not in a position to perform any overt act, such as surrendering, which would hurt his side and help ours. This may be called MO, or morale operations. The second type of action is overt action, surrendering, deserting his post of duty, mutinying, which can be induced only if the appeal is expertly timed. Operations against troops must be based on the objective military situation. Suffering and exertion increase realism. Plain soldiers are not apt to be talked over by propaganda unless the propaganda is carefully cued to their actual situation. All propaganda should be based on fact. Propaganda to troops must be based not merely on fact, but must show shrewd appreciative touches or understanding the troops' personal conditions. Propaganda is not much use to a nation undergoing abject defeat, for the troops on the victorious side 
will be buoyed up by the affirmation of victory from their own eyes. Troop propaganda must therefore aim at eventual willing capture of the individual, not at surrender by his individual initiative. It must implant the notion that he may eventually be trapped, and that if that happens, he should give up. The propaganda must not meet the soldier's loyalty in a head-on collision, but must instead give the enemy soldier the opportunity of rationalizing himself out of the obligations of loyalty. True loyalty requires survival and therefore surrender. The steps, therefore, needed for good propaganda to actual combat troops include the following. First, the notion that the enemy soldier may have to surrender as his side loses or retreats. Other named units have surrendered with so and so many men. You will have to, too. Second, themes which make the enemy soldier believe that an all-out effort is wasted or misapplied. Third, the idea that he or his unit may find themselves in a hopeless situation soon. Fourth, identifying the next authentically bad situation with the hopeless situation. Fifth, concrete instructions for the actual surrender. Figure 52, basic types, troop morale. Leaflets may be aimed at 1. Morale 2. News 3. Action. Morale leaflets neither communicate news nor call for specific action. Rather, they pave the way for action. Many of the previous illustrations have been of this type. This one is a troop morale leaflet used by the puppet Free India Army on their own men, who were discouraged by the self-evident lack of material and numbers. Singapore about 1944. End of figure 52. Morale operations. Morale operations in the black field are, for the American record, still a closed book. German black operations against the French included such enterprises as sending French soldiers letters from their hometowns, telling them that their wives were committing adultery or were infected with venereal diseases, or calling out names and unit designations to French troops facing them and the Maginot Line, or giving away mourning dresses to women who would wear them on the streets of Paris, or intercepting telephone communications in the field and giving confusing or improper orders. Figure 53. Paired Morale Leaflets the Christmas card showing the nativity was dropped by General MacArthur's psychological warfare people on the Filipinos. The Christmas cards with bells were prepared by the Japanese for the U.S. Army. The former were designed to cheer on the Filipinos, the latter to depress the Americans with the defeatist messages inside the cards. End of figure 53. Morale operations on the white side included such items as the following. Sending mournful poetry leaflets to Japanese units which were known to be demoralized for lack of home furlough, China theater. Dropping beautiful colored pictures of luscious Japanese victuals on starving troops, North Burma. Showing the Japanese sad sack in a cartoon fighting everywhere while his officers get all the liquor, all the food, all the girls, and all the glory, while the common soldier ends up cremated. Southwest Pacific Demonstrating that the Nazi pets on the German high command have disrupted the splendid German military tradition and have thrown out the really competent professional generals. Soviet German Front Penning the nickname, Der Sturber, roughly, old, let's go get killed, on a German general 
who had boasted of his willingness to expend personnel. Anglo-American in Soviet radio, telling the German troops they were dying for a cause already lost. Italy, reporting back to the Germans the statements made by prisoners, to the effect they were damned glad that they were out of the fighting. France, telling the Japanese on Atu and Kiska that just as surely as the kiri leaf, symbol of death. Would fall in the autumn, they too would fall. North Pacific, telling the Japanese homeland and troops that the Japanese emperor had loved peace, but the militarists had dragged the sacred empire into war. Peaceful is morning in the shrine garden leaflet, designed for Aleutians, used over Japan. Telling the Chinese in China. That the Americans would soon cut the Japanese conquered empire in two with Asiatic landings, and then dropping the leaflet, written in simple Chinese, which could be figured out by Japanese, on the Japanese troops, China, congratulating imaginary agents in ostensible code over the voice radio for the excellent work they have allegedly done in the enemy home country. All theaters. Figure fifty-four, troop morale leaflet, gray. This German leaflet from the Italian front attempts to remind American troops of the bonus troubles of 1932, a year in which most of the American soldiers were still in school. Only to older men could the appeal carry much weight. The drawing and typography are distinctively German. In terms of source, this leaflet is gray. Figure fifty-five, Chinese Communist civilian morale leaflet. This leaflet attempts to raise peasant morale while calling in general terms for economic action. It shows a peasant family welcoming home the father. Who has been made a hero of labor? Given the author by political department, border area government, at Yinan in September 1944. Figure 56, general morale, matched themes. The American leaflet and Japanese one both show the same map with the same event, cutting of the enemy lifeline. In each case, the event is alleged to be news. However, the purpose of the leaflet is to depress the morale of all enemies who see it, and to raise the morale of all friends. Figure fifty-seven, the unlucky Japanese sad sack. This morale pamphlet was used on the Japanese in the Southwest and Southwest Pacific. While it never produced any startling results on them, it did no harm. The pictures are done by a qualified Japanese artist. The pamphlet tells the story of the Japanese common soldier whose officers get everything and give him nothing, except a cremation box and a memorial tablet. End of figures fifty-four through fifty-seven. News leaflets, figures one, seven, fifty-nine, sixty, and sixty-five are news leaflets. The propaganda purpose is evident, even to the enemy. But in the best of these leaflets, there is a tendency to let the facts speak for themselves, and to show the enemy just what the actual situation is. Tactical defensive psychological warfare. Morale operations are designed, therefore, to obtain responses other than immediate action. Several possible goals can be sought, singly or jointly. The commonest is preparation of the enemy soldier's mind for the actual physical act of surrender, the moral act of doing no more for his own side. Whenever surrender requires nothing more than passivity. Morale leaflets are even more promising. In such cases, 
All that is asked of the enemy is that he sit tight, fight inefficiently, and put up his hands when he is told to do so. Other purposes of morale operations include the irritation of enemy groups against each other, the general depression of enemy morale, the discouragement of enemy troops, officers, or commanders. Morale operations, to be effective, must be aimed at the actual, specific morale with which they are connected. Well-fed troops cannot be frightened by the remote prospect of starvation. Well-officered troops cannot be induced to mutiny. Troops with good mail service cannot be made homesick. However, weak points in the enemy organization can and do provide targets for morale operations. The defeat situation imposes tremendous strain on both the individual soldier and on officers in position of responsibility. At such times, disunity rises to the surface, rumors spread more readily, and propaganda operations against morale can have devastating effect. Allied psychological warfare against Germans in 1944-45 was aimed both at general officers and at the mass of the German troops, operations against the officers being founded on the common sense premise that if large-scale German surrenders were sought, they could be best obtained by influencing those Germans who had the authority to surrender. Figure 58. Civilian Personal Mail a common stunt in black or gray morale propaganda is the printing of facsimile personal letters. The letter shown at the left is given in the original German form, along with its English twin, which was, as usual, prepared for administrative clearance, records, and information. Europe, Allied, 1944-45. Figure 59. Basic Types Newspapers Newspapers were prepared by almost every belligerent for almost every other. The examples shown above are Luftpost, S-H-A-E-F for Germans, and Rakasan News, USAFPA for Japanese. Each newspaper copies the form of enemy civilian newspapers. The gross circulation of these airborne papers reached in some cases up to the millions. End of figures 58 and 59. A curious point developed. German morale in the higher grades was worse than in the lower. In the very last year of the war, despite the terrible air raids on their homeland behind them, the German troops on the Western Front underwent only slight morale deterioration. In comparison with what they should have undergone, had their morale borne a direct relationship to the strategic position of Germany as a whole. On the other hand, the morale among general officers and staff officers became wretched. The putsch of the generals the previous summer was merely a foretaste of the demoralization of the German higher command. This unusual situation arose from the fact that the National Socialist propaganda machinery was still working on the masses of the troops. The political officers still made speeches. The troops were given pep talks, information about the war, hopelessly distorted information, but information nonetheless, and promises of privileges and comforts which, while they rarely materialized, were cheering. Simultaneously, German army discipline in the Prussian tradition, never known to be wishy-washy or weak, was sharply stiffened. Furthermore, the plain soldiers carried over to the months of defeat those propaganda attitudes which they had been taught in the pre-war and war years by Hitler's incessant domestic propaganda. Figure 60. Basic Types. Spot News Leaflets. 
Spot News often makes better propaganda if handled while still fresh than if carried in newspapers or morale leaflets later on. The examples above were used against the Germans. News is given on one side of the leaflet and is dropped while the news is still news. The other side has a propaganda appeal reading. In effect, you must choose for yourself. Die for the party or live for yourself. End of figure 60. In contrast with common troops, the officers had the professional skill to understand the advantages possessed by the Allied armies. The officers knew enough about global and continental strategy, about the immediate strategy of the Western Front, about economic factors and so on, to see that the situation was genuinely bad. Furthermore, the officer class had been less indoctrinated in the first place, many of them having personally despised the Nazis while welcoming Nazism as a means of getting the cattle, the common people, into line behind the Wehrmacht, and those of them concerned with propaganda naturally became critical of all propaganda, including their own governments, and communicated their criticisms to their brother officers. Figure 61. Basic Types. Civilian Action. Desired civilian action can often be obtained by the use of clear instructions transmitted in leaflet form. This leaflet calls on the people of Alsace, Lorraine, and Luxembourg to stay away from German communication lines, not to work for the Germans, and to make careful notes of atrocities which the Germans may commit. End of figure 61. German defenses against Allied psychological warfare worked. The German troops fought on when they had no business fighting, when their own generals thought it was time to quit and held out only because the SS and Gestapo promised ready death to any high officer who even whispered the word defeat. This German defensive success was based on two factors. One, the good condition of the German troops in terms of food, supply, communications, and weapons. Two, the coordination of all morale services for the purpose of defensive psychological warfare. A common lancer, tough and ready in a whole division full of well-fed, well-armed men, could not be expected to undergo despair because freight car loadings hundreds of miles away had dropped to zero. He might see that the Luftwaffe was less in evidence, he might grumble about mail, or about having to use horse transport, but as long as he could see that his own unit was getting on all right, it was hard to persuade him that the feat was around the corner. In World War I, the German troops at the time of surrender were much better off than most of them thought they were. In World War II, they thought they were better off than they actually were. The Germans may not have been in perfect shape, but they were incomparably better off than the starving scarecrows with whom Generalissimo Chiang was trying to hold back the Japanese in West Hunan or the Americans who had fought the spare, fever, and Japanese, all three at once, on Bataan. Along with their relatively good immediate condition, which masked and hid from them the strategic deterioration of the Reich to the rear, the German troops had the services of morale officers who were actually defensive psychological warfare operators. In some units, more on the Eastern Front than the Western, the Germans had PK units, Propaganda Kopemeni or Propaganda Companies. These were organizationally very interesting. They combined the functions of a combat propaganda company, printing, radio work, interrogation of prisoners, etc., with the job of morale builders. Their services were available not only for use against the enemy, but for aid to the German troops themselves. Since they were currently informed of Allied propaganda lines, 
They were able to distribute counteracting propaganda at short notice and were even capable, on occasion, of forestalling Allied propaganda themes in advance. Defensive psychological warfare in the Wehrmacht and, so far as it is known from Russian articles and fiction, in the Red Army as well, depended on unit-by-unit unit indoctrination with contempt of the enemy, mistrust of his news facilities, fear of his political aims, and hatred for the whole enemy mentality. Propaganda officers, counter-subversive operatives, public relations men, and information education officers were either in the same office or were in fact the same men. Combination of functions made possible the use of flexible counteracting propaganda. Most of this counteracting propaganda was not counter-propaganda, technically speaking. It was not designed against Allied propaganda, but for German morale. Morale building was not left to occasional recreational facilities, newspapers for troops, USO entertainment, and the like, but was compelled through the use of internal espionage, affirmative presentation of the German case, and unified informational operations. This German tactical defensive psychological warfare was neither a total success nor a total failure, insofar as it helped the Wehrmacht hold out. It aided the last-ditch Nazi war effort. Figure 62. Basic Types Labor Recruitment On occasion, civilian labor becomes a highly critical factor even in an area of active operations. Leaflets can urge labor to strike against the enemy. They can also induce labor to come over and get to work. This leaflet was dropped on the Burmese, Shans, and Kachins, showing all the good things of life, promising high wages and bonuses, and adding that, anyhow, it was patriotic. Come work for the Allies. End of figure 62. The American army did not employ defensive psychological warfare in World War II. Troop indoctrination was extremely spotty. American morale remained good, not because it was made good by professionals who knew their job, but because Providence and the American people have brought up a generation of young men who started out well and, since the situation never approached hopelessness, kept on going with their spirits high. For the future, the American and British armies faced the problem of devising arrangements whereby within the limits of a free society, soldiers can be affirmatively indoctrinated in the course of operations. USO, Red Cross, public relations, information and education at home, morale staffs in the theaters, armed forces radio service, OWI, the American press, and the overseas military papers. These went their separate and uncorrelated ways without doing any harm, last time. If the next war starts, as it may, with an initial interchange of terrifying strategic bombardments, the morale situation may be inherently less healthy. Wise planning would provide, perhaps, a single chain of command for public relations, military propaganda, and morale services, extending this all the way down to the platoon if necessary, to make sure that the national line on any given topic is explained, presented, repeated, and, if necessary, enforced. Such defensive psychological warfare might work against sensational enemy black operations, against attempted political division, and against fabrication of the news, provided it was carried out in an expert fashion. It could not change morale deterioration resulting from practical deterioration within the troop unit itself, except to decelerate the rate of decline. It would not make up for poor leadership. Nothing makes up for poor leadership. Defensive psychological warfare at higher levels remains a self-contradiction. As pointed out above, 
page 159. Good psychological warfare is never directed merely against other psychological warfare. It is directed at the mind of the target audience, at creating attitudes of belief or doubt which lead to the desired action. Getting and keeping attention is one of its major missions, and psychological warfare which starts by fixing attention on the enemy presentation is doomed from the start. One of the most conspicuous examples of this was President Roosevelt's sensational message of 15 April 1939, addressed personally to the German Chancellor Hitler, asking that Hitler promise not to invade 31 countries which Roosevelt listed by name. Defensive in tone, the message gave Hitler the chance to answer over the German worldwide radio, while his Reichstag laughed its derision in applause. President Roosevelt's message was decent, sane, humane. It was inspiring to the people who already agreed with him, but it created no attitude in the Germans to whom it was addressed. A sharp, bullying, implicitly threatening speech from President Roosevelt might have penetrated the German mentality of the time, even Hitler's. Reasonable reproach did not work. It was not aimed at creating any specific emotional reaction in the German mind. Finally, it must be mentioned that defensive psychological warfare must include counter-subversion and counter-espionage. The Chica, Soviet secret police in its first form, once boasted that capitalist troublemakers and saboteurs could not long function in Russia because the counter-subversive police were over a hundred million strong. What they meant was that they had trained and bullied the population into reporting anyone and everyone who seemed out of line. An attitude of popular cooperation with counter-subversive agencies can be achieved only when those agencies are efficient, respected, and properly presented to the public. Psychological warfare can defend its homeland against enemy operations in kind only if it creates an awareness of propaganda and makes the public critical of attitudes or opinions adverse to national policy. Inexpert official tactics or the general denunciation of dissent makes the citizen believe, with Mr. Bumble and Oliver Twist, that the law is a ass, a idiot. Role of Small Unit Commanders Unless a small unit commander happens to command a unit which includes a psychological warfare team, he will have no active psychological warfare role. Psychological warfare operations require the services of experts, and it would be easy for a small unit commander to jeopardize the propaganda effort of an entire front by well-meant but ill-conceived interference in psychological warfare operations. Where the unit does include a psychological warfare team, a duality of control arises. This requires good sense to keep in balance. The commander possesses absolute command and responsibility for the movement, protection, and operations timing of the team which happens to be attached to his unit. He should not presume to interfere in the special propaganda instructions flowing down to the team from superior psychological warfare echelons. Because of the pressing needs of propaganda operatives for news and for order of battle intelligence, it is normally desirable that they have their own signal facilities and that their routine operational communications short-circuit normal military channels. Otherwise, the unit's signal facilities will be overloaded with messages important to the psychological warfare team, but useless to the unit as a whole. Such absurdities as the encipherment and decipherment of routine enemy news digests should by all means be avoided. On the other hand, the command and administrative messages should go through normal military channels. In the Galahad operation against the Japanese in North Burma, in which Merrill's marauders participated, such a double set of communications channels took a long time to develop. 
where the small unit commander does not possess professionally trained and equipped psychological warfare facilities, he should no more expect to engage in offensive psychological warfare than to undertake chemical warfare with improvised materials. It becomes his responsibility to turn to liaison. Field Liaison One of the new roles developed within the army during World War II was that of psychological warfare liaison officer. Such men were either commissioned officers, usually of company grade, which had been given appropriate training, or were uniformed civilians detailed from OWI or OSS. It is the job of the liaison officer to become acquainted as far down the echelon of command as may be necessary with the commanders whom he is to serve. He must at the same time retain an intimate knowledge of the personnel, procedures, and facilities of the psychological warfare unit from which he is detached. His position must be compared to that of a salesman who should know his product, his company, his sales manager, and his customers all equally well. The liaison officer should be able to explain to small unit commanders what psychological warfare can do for them, and he should learn to discriminate between high-priority and low-priority requests for PW materials. For example, a well-trained liaison officer might receive a call from a regimental or battalion commander. He would find that the commander desired leaflets to be used in a particular tactical situation. He should be able to explain what standard ready-prepared leaflets were available, what delay would be involved in making up special leaflets, and what quantities of leaflets would be advisable. Turning back to his home headquarters, he should be able to present the commander's case to the leaflet printers or the public address team, and should help the propaganda people in understanding the commander's problems. End of section 22. Section 23 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Linebarger. Operations Against Troops, Part 2 Mechanics of Liaison The mechanics of liaison depend in each case on the psychological warfare unit. Some had extensive networks of liaison officers, others had virtually none. In China, during 1943-44, to the most minor tactical request for a leaflet had to be channeled all the way back to Theater Forward Echelon Headquarters, because the political situation was so touchy, the Chinese language so difficult, printing facilities so scarce, and qualified personnel so rare that there was no point in having channels cut across lower down. In France and Belgium, during 1944-45, psychological warfare units were established on a considerable scale at the army level, and liaison officers were widely scattered. It was possible for regimental or battalion commanders to make direct requests of liaison officers. Radio support. On rare occasions, it became possible for radio support to be given a specific unit. The American Standard Wave Broadcasting Station was set up in the vicinity of Lorient, while that French port, still held by the Nazis, was under American siege. The history of this 2D mobile broadcasting company describes the operation as being the first attempt to coordinate artillery, leaflet, and radio propaganda. The station had learned the location of the billets of various Nazi units in the town together with the names of their key personnel. With this information, a game was arranged with the artillery. One day, at a certain time, 
These units were addressed by name and their members were told to go outside their buildings and five minutes later they would receive a message. Precisely five minutes later, leaflet shells released the messages advising surrender. The ability of the Americans to do things like that impressed the German soldiers with their hopeless position more than words. Obviously, such an operation required close contact with the enemy, plus known possession of standard wave radio receivers by enemy personnel. Air Support Normal communications channels, such as might be used for air-ground combat liaison, form one of the most valuable aids to the small unit. From time to time, it is possible either for the unit to make up the leaflets, if it has a PW team, and to request their dropping by the associated air unit, or else to make a direct request to the appropriate higher psychological warfare headquarters, asking that the headquarters not only make up the leaflet, but arrange for its dropping at a stated time. Leaflet Discharging Weapons the airplane was far and away the most important leaflet distributing device. In the CBI theater, there was developed a leaflet belly tank of local design for use on pursuit planes. The belly tank was converted to a leaflet throwing machine. Adjustment of the controls could regulate the speed at which leaflets were discharged so that the pilot could give enemy units or installations bursts of leaflets in precisely the same way that he would strafe them with machine guns. This, however, was exceptional, owing to the tremendous dispersion of the Japanese in the jungle and the need to conserve leaflets. In most instances, the leaflet bomb or leaflet box was the standard Air Force method of distributing leaflets. Among the ground weapons used for discharge of leaflets, there are the following. Chemical warfare shells, converted to leaflet use, especially smoke shells. Almost every variety of available artillery shell, howitzers having proved especially useful. Rifle grenades, converted for leaflets. Leaflet bundles with a small quantity of explosive attached to a quick fuse, packed so as to be thrown in a manner similar to the manual throwing of a grenade. Mortars were probably the chief leaflet throwing device on both the European and Asiatic fronts. The German went so far as to develop a special propaganda mortar. Smoke shells proved particularly easy to adapt. The firing of leaflet shells is a responsibility of the unit possessing the guns. Psychological warfare teams were not issued their own guns, save for unit protection. The actual distribution of leaflet shells was affected, taking the 5th Army as an example, in the following manner. The Army Combat Propaganda Team planned, cleared, printed, and packed leaflets suitable for the occasion. The team cleared with the artillery officer, 5th Army, an agreement for an order to use the leaflets. The team's own liaison officers transmit the order to the appropriate divisions and lower echelons. The order itself prescribed the times for picking up the leaflets from the ammunition dumps. The team procures the empty shells and packs them with leaflets. The Army Order allots 150 leaflet shells per division. The team specifies, in the order, the time limit within which the shells are to be used. Corps in our division selects the specific targets, the general target being all enemy concentrations within range. In smaller units, the propaganda unit would often be placed in direct communication with a specific artillery unit, which would be charged with the responsibility for discharging the leaflet shell at opportune times. When a requesting unit asks for leaflets, 
and itself possesses the guns which could fire leaflet shells, it is entirely possible for the supplier to send leaflets ready packed in the shells. However, even the most rapid shell packing job takes considerably more time than the readying of aircraft for leaflet distribution. When it is considered that the plane not only discharges the leaflets, but delivers them from the supply point all in one operation, it will be seen that close air-ground coordination will often do a quicker, bigger job of leaflet saturation than could be achieved by the requesting, preparing, transporting, and firing of leaflet shells. Contingencies of the Future This text refers to known experience. Short of turning to the field of futuristic fiction, it is impossible to provide discussion of situations which have not been known in the American army. The experiences of the Nazis and the Japanese cannot be taken by ourselves as wholly parallel, since those peoples, under dictatorship and rabid indoctrination, produced a different kind of army from the American. What should a small unit commander do if his men thought they had been contaminated by airborne disease germs distributed by enemy bacteriological warfare planes? How should he act if his men were told by an enemy broadcast that they would be exposed to radiation which would cause anemia, cancer, or death? if they did not surrender immediately? What should he do if he finds himself cut off from all American supplies, operating a lonely unit in contaminated or dangerous areas, and then discovers that his own men are the victims of enemy black propaganda? How should he behave if his men get the idea that they are never going to be replaced, and if they suspect, either spontaneously, or because of enemy action, that the unit has been abandoned by the American government and people. What could a commander do if a delegation called on him, right out in a zone of operations, and demanded a right to be heard? Suppose that he knew their complaints about food, rotation, danger, etc., to be justified, and knew at the same time that the enemy had subverted some of his men into either being dupes or traitors. Suppose his men protested a lack of deep lead-lined shelters the day after enemy leaflets instructed the American soldiers to ask for such shelters. Should he treat all such enlisted men as traitors? Suppose he is faced with the specter of political treason, subversion, in revolution. American officers have not faced such problems since the days in which George Washington was commander-in-chief. War after war, we have gone into the fight with a profound confidence in our ability to win. Future war may hold forth no such assurance. If America is injured, her troops decimated, their homes exploded or poisoned by foreign atomic attack, Brand new questions of psychological warfare will be posed. No living American has ever had to face such problems. This is no assurance that they will never occur. Upon the manhood, the fairness, the sheer intelligence of small unit commanders, there may fall the unexpected task of holding their units together in the face of disastrous psychological attack. Surrender Leaflets Surrender leaflets are the infantry of the propaganda war. They go in and finish the job to which the preceding years of radio broadcast, the demoralization of the home front, the campaigns of news and morale materials to troops, and the actual air, ground, and sea attacks have led up. Sudden use of surrender leaflets on a victorious or unprepared enemy is not likely to take effect. The Japanese surrender leaflets dropped on the Americans in the southwest Pacific 
were issued without previous materials readying the Americans. Furthermore, they were dropped when the American situation was plainly improving, and when American soldiers were not likely to be thinking about surrender in order to get individual escape from the war. The preparation of surrender leaflets calls for the tactical use of printing facilities. This is the job of the Combat Propaganda Unit, with its high-speed press, its liaison with both ground and air forces, its up-to-the-minute intelligence on enemy movements, situation, and order of battle. The enemy should be given leaflets showing him how clearly he is pinned down, identifying him, generally stripping him of the sense of secrecy and the trust in his commanders that make it possible for him to go on fighting. When surrender can be effected, he should be given the simplest, plainest command the circumstances allow. In the case of the Japanese, there were difficulties on the American side about letting the Japanese come over to surrender. Too many of them were suspected of having tucked hand grenades into their fundushi. Many a Japanese started out for the Allied lines and failed to make his peaceful intentions plain enough. The result was a strong deterrent to other Japanese, who may have been trying to decide whether they wanted to surrender or not. Figure 63. Action Type. Air Rescue Facilities. These leaflets from China Theater were designed to help the work of the 14th Air Force. Action called for from the civilians included the assistance of hurt flyers, the identification of Americans as allies and not as Japanese when they parachuted to the ground, the avoidance of bridges and other bomb targets. End of figure 63. It was found that the bright white leaflet with the identifying stripes on it, figure 69, would be shown to our troops, who could be taught to hold their fire when they saw a Japanese carrying that type of leaflet. To the Japanese, the plainness of the surrender formula was a considerable help in coming over. Figure 64. Pre-Action News. Psychological warfare facilities can be extremely helpful in favorable situations. One of the most important ways of developing a favorable situation is to predispose enemy soldiers toward the idea of surrendering. News of surrender. Emphasis on the comforts and relief of prisoners of war, and above all, emphasis on their numerousness can contribute to the actual act of surrender. This newspaper looks like a newspaper, but its chief emphasis is on the extent of surrenders. End of figure 64. Variations on the surrender leaflet include the following devices. Letters with signatures blacked out, of prisoners of war who have found conditions decent and who are enjoying rest, good care, and good food. Photographs, with the faces blocked out when security procedures or the rules of war so require, showing enemy prisoners actually enjoying the benefits of being out of the war. Political arguments, to the effect that the highest duty of the soldier is to his country, or emperor, and that if he dies for the sake of some general in a foolish war, he will be denying his country a fine post-war citizen like himself, needed for reconstruction and progress. A list of foods available to surrenderees. See figure 13 from World War I. A statement of the conditions of military imprisonment, reaffirming the rules of the Geneva Convention. The promise that the potential prisoner will be allowed mail communication with home. Anger motif, showing scum and profiteers at home, and attempting to induce surrender by telling the soldier that he is being made a sucker. Obscene pictures, showing naked women, designed to make the involuntary celibate so desirous of women that he surrenders out of bad nerves. 
Japanese idea, and did not work. The troops naturally kept the pornography, but merely despised the Japanese as queer little people for having sent it. This type cannot be illustrated. The Library of Congress has copies in a locked file. Figure 65. Direct Commands to Enemy Forces As the situation developed against the enemy, it becomes possible to use leaflets to force the surrender of enemy troops by direct command. This kind of appeal is lost when enemy morale remains irrationally high because of a beloved commander or some other unpredictable factor. But in normal situations, it either forces the enemy commander's hand or leaves him with a deteriorating force. Figure 66. Basic Types. Contingency Commands. Leaflets can be made up in advance to govern typical situations which may arise. This command to the scattered German troops orders all isolated German remnants to surrender to the nearest Allied force. Figure 67. Tactical Surrender Leaflets Enemy troops often fail to understand why they should surrender. Under such circumstances, it is useful to send them a map, showing them plainly what their situation is. If misrepresentation is done at this point, it will be at the cost of loss of credence later on. These leaflets were prepared to prevent Japanese units in the Philippines from staging last-ditch fights after the surrender of Japan. Similar maps had been used for tactical purposes earlier. End of figures 65 to 67. The effective surrender leaflet frequently turns language difficulties into an asset. Whole series of leaflets will teach the enemy soldier how to say, I surrender in the language of the propagandist. The words a surrender were made familiar to every German soldier. It is simply the phonetic spelling of English for Germans to pronounce. Surrender is not merely a case of transferring loyalties. It is a highly dangerous operation for most infantrymen. It takes nerve if done deliberately. The voluntary surrendery risks being shot by some exasperated officer or comrade on his own side. He risks court-martial for treason if his surrender is willful and his side wins the war. He may run into a trigger-happy enemy who will shoot him. He may fail to make himself understood to the enemy. Therefore, surrender leaflets try to catch some simple procedure to indoctrinate the enemy soldier with routine things which he can do when the opportunity arises. Of all leaflets, those most effective, most closely tied in with unconscious preparation for eventual conscious choice, are the ones dealing specifically with concrete treatment of prisoners of war. The surrender leaflet itself can be used as an authorization to surrender. The enemy soldier who carries a leaflet around with him just in case he may need it, is already partially subverted from enemy service. Figure 68. Basic Types. Surrender Leaflet. The surrender leaflet shown was not welcomed by the Japanese because it indicated that the Japanese soldier using it wished to surrender. This was very vulgar and depressing indeed and few Japanese soldiers would accept such a humiliation. Except for its wording, the leaflet is good. As large as a big magazine cover, it is white with red and blue trim and can be identified readily. End of Figure 68 Other Action Leaflets In World War II, there were ample opportunities to surrender on most fronts, in subsequent conflicts, however, it is quite possible that surrendering will be physically unfeasible because the surrenderee will have no one at hand to whom to surrender. See below, pages 248 to 250. 
Recourse may then be had to a type of leaflet only occasionally used in World War II. The leaflet which calls on enemy troops to perform some action other than surrender. The commonest of these is desertion, when it is known that enemy forces are being held in a dangerous spot by their own command, and when there is a fair probability that heavy artillery or air attack can be concentrated on the area which has been strewn with leaflets. A bluff normally fails, and moreover discredits later operations of the same kind, whereas a successful and fulfilled threat builds up cumulative credibility among the enemy audience. When long-range weapons are used, it may be possible to address troops by leaflet before they attack, suggesting that they remove themselves, as individuals, to places of safety. Such an operation would assist enemy disorganization. The author knows of no case where the Germans did this with their V-1 or V-2 bombs, but Figure 3 applied to both civilians and troops in the cities marked for destruction by incendiary B-29 raids. Black action appeals may teach the enemy troops how to malinger, may present political or ethnic arguments to troops known to be members of minorities or satellite nationalities, for example, Poles in Nazi service, with the intent that these mutiny, or may, at the very end of a war, call upon enemy troops as units to cease resistance and to await a later opportunity for organized surrender. Loudspeaker Units the use of the amplified human voice developed slowly in World War II. Improvised units were set up in North Africa, in the Italian landings, at Anzio, and in the Normandy operations. At times, these talked over valuable groups of enemy prisoners, but their range did not go beyond 200 yards, which sharply limited their utility. The Navy was simultaneously experimenting with polyplanes in the Pacific, which flew at considerable altitudes over islands and talked to the Japanese troops on the ground. Figure 69. Improved Surrender Leaflet The new leaflet, which did bring the Japanese in, was better phrased. It did not mention the nasty word, surrender, but said, I cease resistance. It also showed the Japanese how to carry the leaflet so as to persuade the triggery Americans that he was not holding a hand grenade behind it. The back of the leaflet, instead of being left blank, showed happy Japanese prisoners enjoying American captivity, their faces left identifiable as Japanese but blanked out enough to head off individual identification. Compare this with figure 4, the Basir shine we used on the Germans. End of figure 69. Ultimate success came with the development of loudspeakers on tank mounds. These developed a range of 2 miles, with the result that they had real value in combat operations. In April 1945, a loudspeaker tank with the 19 Corps made an average of 20 broadcasts a day during action. Short talks were given to the enemy troops just before attack. Attacks were then withheld long enough to permit prisoners to come in. The attacks were then launched, lifted after a pause to permit more prisoners to come in, and finally pushed through. This tactic worked particularly well at roadblocks where enemy troops were flanked. In the Tudorberger Wald, a whole platoon was persuaded to surrender. At Hildesheim, 250 prisoners came over together. Elsewhere in the drive into Germany, the Germans came over in even greater numbers, but the situation was then so obviously at its best for us that they probably would have responded similarly to command banners, black words on white background, 
such as the ancient Chinese imperial forces used to carry around for tactical communication with bandits and rebels. On Okinawa, tank-mounted loudspeakers were ingeniously hooked up. The American tank officers and crews obviously could not speak good colloquial Japanese. The Japanese troops were dug in like rodents, and in a condition of desperation that made them fight cruelly and suicidally. Even if the Americans shelled the openings of their large cave mouths or ran armored bulldozers over the holes, burying the Japanese alive, there was the chance that the Japanese would run through long underground passages and pop up later, possibly at night, to cause more damage before they were killed. With Americans and Japanese unable to talk to one another, this condition might have led to a severe loss of American life and mopping up hundreds upon hundreds of such minute Japanese strongholds. The American tanks had loudspeakers mounted on many of them. They had radio telephone communication that could be used between the different tanks on a tank team, or it was an alternative and could not be used simultaneously, could be employed for the commanding tank to communicate back to headquarters. At headquarters, American Japanese, whose American accents had been trained out of their voices in special public speaking classes, sat ready and waiting. The tank team would come into the valley, and the American commander would look the situation over. He would cut his radio telephone into communication with headquarters, and would then say, Hillside ahead of me. No characterizing features. Five or six holes, but I can't tell which ones have Japanese in them. I can get up the hill. There are two trees at the crest of the hill, and a bunch of these native graves over on the left. The American Japanese and headquarters would say, Regular announcement, sir? Do you want them to assemble by the graves or at the trees? Tell them to stand in front of the graves. That way they'll be coming downhill. Want to cut in? Yes, sir, says the headquarters man. The tank commander would then cut his radio phone into a relay, and the tanks, which had loudspeakers, would automatically connect the loudspeaker units direct with the radio telephone. A voice, loud as the voice of a god, would fill the entire valley, coming from everywhere at once and speaking good, clear Japanese. Attention, Japanese troops, attention. This is the American tank commander calling. I am going to destroy all resistance in this valley. Attention, I have flamethrowers. These will be used on all dugouts and caves. Attention, flamethrowers will be employed. Gunfire will close the cave mouth. No Japanese personnel can expect to escape. Japanese personnel commanded to cease resistance. Japanese personnel commanded to cease resistance. Japanese personnel must assemble in front of native burial place to American left flank, Japanese right flank. The tank commander would watch while the loudspeakers blared. First, one Japanese. Then more would come in, small knots, to the assembly place as directed. The commander would then cut the American Japanese back in and say, I think they're holding out on the hill crest. Try that. Just a minute or two. If they don't start coming, I'll go after them and cut you in just when I reach the top. Yes, sir. Which part of the hill crest, sir? I can't tell. Anywhere. The speakers would be cut back in. Attention! Japanese forces remaining on hill crest. Japanese forces just behind us under command of Colonel Musashi surrendered last night and are now well taken care of. You are being given the same chance. Attention! I will soon come up the hill. A few more Japanese figures, small as ants on a sand dune would come into sight on the hill and begin clambering down to the point of surrender. Figure 70. End of War This leaflet helped the war to end, just as did the great leaflet 
which submitted the Japanese surrender terms back to the Japanese people. On one side, the leaflet carries news from the Wehrmacht last defeats. On the other, it takes up the future of Germany as determined by the Crimea Conference. End of section 23. Section 24 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Section 24. Part 4. Psychological Warfare After World War II. Chapter 14a. The Cold War and Seven Small Wars. Part 1. The period after 1945 has turned out to be considerably more turbulent than most Americans expected. Though the victory over fascism and Japanese militarism has proved to be psychologically and historically complete, the struggles between the victors have developed such mistrust and bitterness as to create a present-day equivalent of the Thirty Years' War, rather than a period of peace as it was understood by educated men of the 19th century. Although with many other military and political phenomena, Psychological warfare has been thrust into a period of no war and no peace, which has proved to be extraordinarily difficult for Western men to deal with, either emotionally or intellectually. Such phrases as Churchill's term, the Iron Curtain, and Walter Lippmann's coinage, the Cold War, have become a part of civilized speech throughout the world. They have obscured almost as much as they have explained. It is entirely conceivable that an adequate description of the present historical period will only be written after the forces now operating have ceased to be significant. At a future time, it may be possible for serious and reflective men to determine what happened in the middle of the 20th century. Recognition and delay. One of the preeminent factors in the psychological and opinion aspect of the turmoil of the mid-20th century has been the very sharp contrast between the time on which a given event occurred and the delay between the occurrence of the event and the final understanding of that event in their own terms by the strategic policymakers affected, and the successful recognition of the event in policy papers looking toward a further future. The political and strategic character of much recent military history has therefore been a grotesque comedy of errors, ridiculous if it were not so deadly serious, involving the lives of the major urban populations of the world. An event such as the liberation of Indochina from Japanese military occupation in 1945, met competently and reasonably by the standards of an anticipated world of 1946, which unfortunately never materialized, led to the frustrations, bloodshed, deceit, and warfare of the late 1940s, and by 1954 became partially intelligible as a facet of the free world's struggle against communism. New Interpretations of Policy and Propaganda Polemic writing has been done concerning the role of propaganda, psychological warfare, psychological strategy, and comparable operations. In many instances, the polemics have involved the presentations of two sides, each of which was right, one side maintaining that the old-fashioned world of free, sovereign nations, meeting in a parliament of man as constituted in the United Nations, could and should use the realities of traditional power politics as a guide to the present and to the future, and should avoid the hopelessness, terrorism, and fanaticism of chronic ideological war. The other side, with equal merits, has often argued that the ideological war is here, that its deniers are the witting or unwitting sympathizers or appeasers of communism, that their realities are outmoded, and that the United States must face up to a crusade which will end in annihilation or death for either the communist system or the constitutional democratic group of states. What such polemics overlook is the terrifying probability that events may happen so rapidly that no one on either the communist or anti-communist side is capable of assimilating the new datum, such as the development of the hydrogen bomb, the death of Stalin, or the appearance of Israel among the nations until well after the event has occurred. The occurrence of public events in all past civilizations has involved a considerable number of public agreements on the major hypotheses concerned. As pointed out earlier in this book, the antagonists in older wars usually, though not always, knew what the war was about. 
Today, the spiritual, psychological, logical, and scientific inconsistencies and paradoxes within each system are so deep as to make the definition of long-range goals almost impossible. Any one goal, such as the establishment of peace, the appreciation of an international system of alliances against aggression, the maintenance of national sovereignty, the protection of a free enterprise economy, the assurance of self-determination to a non-self-governing peoples, or the like, may, if emphasized, contradict the concomitant goals which support it. Communist and Anti-Communist Psychological Events Each of the two major systems has strengths of its own. The communist strengths are sometimes too apparent to Americans, so much so that Americans exaggerate communist power and overlook serious deficiencies in the economies and the political character of the communist group of nations. The communists can suppress dissidents with a fanatical party line. The price they pay is the abrupt shifting of that line as international situations change. The communists can appeal to youth by their dogmatic faith that they are the masters of the probable future of the world. They risk much if this faith does not pay off, and if the world's youth sometimes turns against them because they promise too much and deliver too little. The communists, operating from an allegedly material basis, offer psychological and spiritual values of a perverted kind, but they have very considerable propaganda value. They give people a chance to sacrifice themselves, to work for causes greater than their individual personalities, something to die for, and an apparent understanding of history. Yet the communists also risk psychological exhaustion and cynicism among their elite cadres, as well as among their mass followings. In the next chapter, concerning strategic information operations of the United States government in the foreign field, there will be further discussion of the psychological strengths of the free world. We will say at this point that in light of the strategic and military contexts of the post-war period, the free world has had the advantage of modesty, relaxation, and elasticity. Among Americans, even among intelligent Americans, it is frequent to find the assumption being made that the chief strength of the free world consists in its legal rights and its democratic political processes, rather than in its actual, not merely formal, toleration of many points of view and its actual relaxation of the populations under its control. Since the free world is not committed to victory as much as the communist world, it can afford more defeats without a corresponding loss of morale. Since the free world has not promised a utopian future, it can go from the reality of the 1950s to whatever realities the 1960s or the 1970s may bring without a sharp letdown in morale or widespread heartbreak among its most gifted advocates. In Cold War terms, the free world is committed to fighting, but not to victory, while the communists are committed to the actual, though remote, promise of triumph for their system throughout the world. The citizens of the United States can therefore contemplate the survival of the USSR or its annihilation and replacement by a democratic Russia with equanimity. Their Soviet opposite numbers, group for group and class for class, cannot be as detached from the struggle. Over all of us there hangs the entirely uncertain future raised by probable use of atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, and other novel weapons, a future about which former Governor Adlai Stevenson felt so gloomy that he said another war would end civilization. The rejoinder can, of course, be made that if another war would end civilization anyhow, win, lose, or draw, the United States might as well disband its defense forces now and enjoy life for the few short years that remain. The Cold War. In some respects, the Cold War is not novel. It resembles the intercivilizational wars of the past in which competing civilizations with the definite moral and political foundations fought one another for final survival. This kind of warfare is very different indeed from struggles waged between nations which have a common civilization and which have a common interest in the preservation of that civilization. The Americans of the 1950s are waging a struggle much more like that between the Protestants and Catholics in the years 1618 to 48 than they are to the Civil War of 1861 through 65 or the Revolutionary War of 1775 through 81. In some respects, we Americans are back all the way to the fight between the Aztecs and Cortez, or the struggle between Chinese and Chams in ancient Annam. What Mr. Lippmann calls merely a Cold War is something deeper, bigger, and worse than any war Americans have ever known before. The only parallel to it was the struggle between settlers and Indians on our own frontier. Our battles with the Indians at least had the advantage of never leaving us with a hideous dread that the American Indians might sweep a white and Christian civilization from this continent. Nature of the Cold War 
The Cold War is therefore a struggle, the beginnings of which can be found at any one of several dates. 1848, 1917, and 1943 are some of those given, which is now being waged between non-communist states and a communist group of nations. No one now living can speak with assurance of the outcome. Only the most foolhardy of optimists could visualize a world in which the better aspects of each system would be developed, and the factors common to each would be underscored and strengthened as supports for a peace-seeking international system under the UN. The struggle is larger than a war because it comprises pre-belligerent, belligerent, and post-belligerent activities, both in global wars and in a possible general war. On the communist side, the techniques include sabotage, revolution, conspiracy, and fanatical organization. On the anti-communist side, a family of paramilitary weapons is gradually being developed and may or may not be thrown into the struggle. No war was ever as bitter or uncertain as this one, because war, whatever its demerits, at least commits the nations to combat and to victory. War has the supreme merit of decision. The Cold War does not. People have to fight it without knowing what it is or what they would get out of it if they could obtain the advantage. Origins of the Cold War in retrospect, it is easy to argue that the communist system has been fighting all non-communist systems ever since 1848, that the Soviet system has been in a moral condition of war with all other governments since 1917, that the democratic Soviet alliance against fascism powers during 1941 through 45 was a sham and a fraud covering a three-cornered war, and that therefore attempts at a good alliance between non-communists and communists were shams, mistakes, or frauds. This is easy to say in the 1950s. It was not so apparent in the 1940s. It can even be argued that Yalta, and everything for which Yalta stands, was a tragic mistake, and yet a blessed one. If the Western powers had not attempted to deal amicably with the Soviet Union at Yalta, the Western peoples, already hypersensitized in matters of conscience, might have attributed to themselves and to their posterity an unbearable burden of guilt. We and our children might have gone down fighting while wondering in our innermost hearts why didn't we make a real try to avoid war with Soviet Russia. Though the Tehran and Yalta agreements have been violated by the USSR almost from the moment they were concluded, it can be argued that the Western world was wise in experimenting with appeasement because it liberated our consciences for future struggle. No one can possibly argue that we did not try to get along with the communist system, that we failed to offer communists a reasonable share in the world of power politics, or that we threatened the communists with aggression during the course of our anti-fascist struggle. For better or for worse, we did try to get along with them. We have failed. Why have we failed? The failure seems to be much more on the side of the communists than on the side of the free nations. Though it is possible for left liberals or hypercritical intellectuals to find fault with the U.S. and British position in this respect, or that, short of extreme nitpicking, it must be argued that the communists jumped the gun on Western powers in almost every case. Tito, while still in agreement with Moscow, proved implacable toward the constitutional Yugoslav government and the church as they existed before 1941, while Roosevelt was still living the Lublin Poles prepared a savage double-cross of the London Poles. Whether communist action arose from a lamentable fear of our own aggressiveness or a Machiavellian plan to conquer the world does not, at any time, matter very much. What matters is the almost indisputable fact that in many parts of the world the communists undertook the initiative against the anti-communists. The first edition of this book, Psychological Warfare, was written in 1946, and published in 1948. The second edition is being completed eight years later, in 1954. Any reader who contrasts the two editions will see at a glance that the author, although suspicious of communism, had no real anticipation of the fury or seriousness of the communist attack upon the non-communist world, nor of the strategic arguments and responsibilities which the free world would therewith be forced to accept. The Cold War and the Actual Fighting as late as 1948, when the talented and bold-minded Lieutenant General Albert C. Weidmeyer was Deputy Chief of Staff, the U.S. Army's psychological warfare facilities at the general staff level consisted of a few paper assignments to colonels in operations and in training, together with your author as a part-time consultant and one girl stenographer to keep the files. By 1954, these numbers were multiplied by the hundreds. 
Each of the military services has accepted its responsibility, so that by 1953 there was not merely one Army Psywar system, but there were at least five separate organizations in the U.S. government in different places and at five levels directly concerned with these problems. A curious division of responsibilities not anticipated by the Creel Committee of World War I or the OWI of World War II arose in the Washington of the Cold War period. While the military establishments were given jurisdiction over propaganda activities connected with actual combat, other propaganda activities were kept largely in civilian hands, though simultaneously the direction of civilian policy at its very highest level became paramilitary through the influence of the National Security Council. In other words, most of the national foreign policy decisions at the highest level have been dictated in recent years by strategic considerations. They have been National Security Council decisions, not cabinet-type decisions of the kind which might have been made in the years of William McKinley or Warren G. Harding. Yet, even though these decisions have been strategic in type, the propaganda implementation of these decisions has fallen for the greater part on the State Department and on the economic aid program facilities, not on the military. The military have been pretty strictly confined to those aspects of propaganda which directly pertain to combat areas. By 1953, U.S. leaders had begun to understand the situation with which they had been dealing since 1947, and in light of that necessarily belated but correct appreciation of their own position, the William Jackson Committee began to recommend that propaganda policy be written not as something self-contained, but be considered as an integral part of every other U.S. government decision possessing world situation or news impact. The Cold War and the Home Front among editors, professors, officers, officials, and other experts concerned with foreign affairs, there has been frequent lamentation that the American people did not take the great struggle of our time more seriously. The contrary could be argued, at least by way of contrast. If it is true that the United States is engaged in a major struggle, if it is further true that this struggle has no visible end, if this struggle threatens all of us, and our children as well, with lifetimes of tension and violent deaths under ultra-destructive weapons, one may quite reasonably ask the question, which is the better reaction for the bulk of the American population? Normality, emotional health, mild irresponsibility, and the stockpiling of nervous and physical strength for a time of trial which may lie far ahead? Or alternatively, tension now, worry now, responsibility now? Fatigue now, all the way through from the uncertain present across the bitter and perilous future to the months of near Armageddon, which may lie 15, 20, or 30 years ahead? Sadly, and seriously, with no attempt at cleverness or mockery, a staff officer could argue today that the American people should leave their worries to their leaders so as to be strong when the time of trouble comes. In the field of civil defense, for instance, it is grotesque to spend billions on offense and little on the saving of American lives. On second glance, this may not be so grotesque after all. The technological advance of fissionable and thermonuclear weapons is so rapid, the development of guided missiles and other carrying instruments so swift and so unpredictable, that a 1955 model civil defense system might become a fool's paradise by 1960, if this be true, it is better to live as well as we can, to maintain the profession of arms at an adequate level, to hope, quite irrationally, for the best, and to let the dead of the future bury their dead as best they may. Alternatives to Victory and Defeat In a Cold War, as opposed to a war, the role of the armed services is to deter the enemy, not fight the enemy. And the purpose of the government is to achieve an accommodation, in the sense of an arrangement satisfactory to both sides, not a victory. If this is correct, serious reappraisal must be made of the U.S. Psi War position as well as of our strategic thinking. The alternatives to victory and defeat are forms of survival of the competitors. The entire health of each competing civilization matters. It is obvious enough to Americans that we must remain prosperous, free, constitutional, democratic. It goes without saying that we must, as far as our individual fortunes permit us, retain our belief in God and derive from religious beliefs those spiritual strengths not available to the communists. What is not often raised is the equally important factor of the conquest of probability. Wars are much more often won by people who are sure they are going to win than by people who know that they would like to win, but who think at the same time that they will probably be defeated. The overconfidence of a Cortez or of a Mao Zedong may seem insane to many of us, 
With the passion for security so prevalent in individual and national lives, both the Western powers and the individuals comprising them grotesquely exaggerate the margin of safety which they need in which to survive. Part of this springs from the fact that much of our civilization is not forward-looking, that neither young Americans nor old Americans have a clear-cut or hopeful picture of what the world should be, will be, and must be by A.D. 2055. On the communist side, it is frequent, but not universal, to discover that the best communist cadres are made up of men who are dead sure that communism will win, who are equally sure that communism does not have to be right in order to win, and who are sure that, objectively and scientifically, whatever that may mean, the communist system is almost certainly destined to succeed. If communism cannot get out of succeeding, the responsibility of the individual communist becomes bearable. He is still seriously and tragically responsible for the expediting or the delaying of the inevitable, but he does not take the mantle of God, or Karl Marx, and state that this is the world as he wishes it to be, and that the world of his desires will come into existence if, and only if, he fulfills his personal responsibilities to the utmost. In Asia, perhaps more than Europe, there are many persons who are turning toward communism, not because they think it is good or just, or even because it is powerful, but simply because it is likely. Every individual in his own life has known that he cannot undo the passage of time, the aging of his body, the death of his loved ones, the loss of opportunities which might have been seized, or even his own death. In their individual lives, men of all nations perform the feat, characteristic of the human being, and apparently shared by no other species of life, of living from day to day in a constant reconciliation of the past and present with their own estimate of the probable future. At times in history, that which should happen seems to be unleashed like spiritual lightning, and men rally in frenzy around causes which for the year or the decade seem inspiring, terrifyingly beautiful, and within human reach. Through most of history, that which is apt to occur provides a more sober guide to the future, and men prepare to live in accordance with its standards. In the battle of probabilities, the psi war of the Western powers has been weak, high-pitched, and uncertain, while the insistence of the communist themes has been as monotonous and hypnotic as a jungle drum. For better or for worse, the communists have broken a path through to what they think to be the future. We, of other nations, have not. The chief element of anti-communist victory, practical, sober expectation of a certain and final downfall of the Soviet system, has thus far been lacking on the anti-communist side. The communists, on the contrary, have unreasonably, provocatively, and untruthfully raved, screamed, shrieked, and lied to bring about that better world which, curiously enough, their most effective cadres consider to be an inevitable world. Thus, the UN prisoners held by the communists during the Korean War were subjected to a constant bombardment of communist propaganda concerning their personal responsibilities before history and the opportunities which they would have to serve peace and mankind, as these noble concepts are set forth on the red side. End of section 24. Section 25 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Section 25, Chapter 14b, The Cold War and Seven Small Wars, Part 2. The End of the Cold War. If the hypothesis set forth above namely, that the Cold War may turn out to be unendable war, except in terms which no living man can visualize, it may be true that appreciation of the role of psychological warfare, whatever it may later be called, in this struggle may have to wait a few more years. One factor often overlooked on the American side has been the limitation of the originators. Propaganda to be effective among foreign peoples or foreign armies cannot and should not outrun the strategic capabilities or the political intentions of the issuing power. It does no good for an American propaganda radio to pledge battle to the death while the U.S. press services amiably discuss an accommodation with the communists. Comparably, an official propaganda plan to make the people of France feel that the Americans love and admire them is not very realistic if, in terms of column inches of French press material, 
unofficial American utterances are related to France to the effect that the French are washed up, their cause in Indochina hopeless, their economy unviable, and their political goals foolish. The years 1950 through 54, during which the Korea struggle took place, and in which NATO and the European Defense Community, EDC, came to prominence, often showed a proclivity on the part of U.S. official propagandists to go far beyond that which their home public would support. Need it be said that the effects on foreign public opinion were possibly deflationary? An imaginable end to the Cold War may lie in neither victory nor defeat, in neither accommodation nor reconciliation, but in the development of more, newer, and different quarrels. Hostility of Protestant and Catholic faded out in Europe when the hostility of French, Germans, Spaniards, and other nationalities came to be more important. It is a problem for the psychiatrist and sociologist to answer if they can. Is it possible that semantics of war-causing quarrels can be superseded by anything other than different quarrels? A tension-free civilization is imaginable. Given the characteristics of most present-day cultures, it is scarcely more than merely imaginable. If, within the limits of practical possibility, one were to list the hypothetical requirements for an end of the Cold War, the following might stand forth. 1. General war, leading to the destruction of either the communist or non-communist systems, or 2. Prolongation of the present Cold War atmosphere until new and more interesting quarrels arise which make the present ones obsolete, or 3. Reconciliation of the communist and anti-communist systems by some process not now imaginable, along the general lines of Franklin D. Roosevelt's grand design, or 4. Collapse of all major civilizations under impact of fissionable and thermonuclear weapons, or 5. Gradual erosion of the anti-communist world and an eventual communist victory by sustained communist successes short of war, or the alternative of gradual erosion of the communist world and the creation of a constitutionalist and libertarian probability of victory, also without the outbreak of general war. It would be a brave and foolish man who would say which of these the world should expect, but it would be a stupid staff officer who did not anticipate at least one of them, and who did not, as a military officer or government official, do his best to bring about victory in a form which his side could define, recognize, welcome, and achieve. The Seven Small Wars The foregoing extensive discussion of the Cold War has been included because it explains a great deal of the apparent contradictoriness, irresoluteness, and uncertainty of the small wars which have occurred since the end of World War II. The seven small wars fall into a threefold pattern. If China is excluded, China is taken up in the next section. This is the first pattern. Five of the seven wars were Asian struggles against the Western powers. Korea, Indochina, the Philippines, in which communist Filipinos regard the United States as their ultimate enemy, Malaysia, and Indonesia. In Korea and Indochina, the struggle came to be communist-controlled. In Indonesia, the struggle ended in a nationalist victory. In the Philippines, the struggle degenerated into petty skirmishes between a native constitutional government and communist extremists. One war was an expression of European nationalism on the soil of Asia with the creation of the new state of Israel. The third category is, of course, the special case presented by the Indian-Pakistani fighting, which is a struggle between Asian nationalisms without much intervention from either European colonialism or communism. The most important of these wars were the five in Korea, Indochina, the Philippines, Malaya, and Indonesia. The Israeli struggle appears pretty well settled as a fighting war, and the India-Pakistan issue appears not to be one which will lead to a general war between those two countries. The predominant group of wars shows variations of the same components in different quantities. Each was a reaction to the fall of Japan's short-lived East Asian military empire. Each involved partial or complete resistance to economic affiliation with the capitalist world. Each had an ingredient, though these differed in stress and direction, of local Asian nationalism. Except for Indonesia, each eventually became a part of the worldwide front between communism and anti-communism. These wars deserve consideration one at a time for their Psi War content. The Special Case of China None of the wars mentioned above, 
was as bloody or as tragic as the Chinese Civil War between Communists and Nationalists, which ended with a red victory in 1949. The China situation is too complicated to be summed up in a single paragraph. The political, economic, and propaganda components on each side of that war are as yet not completely assessed. For instance, one of the major factors in the defeat of the Nationalists consisted of the withdrawal of the Japanese managers and technicians from China, as well as of those Japanese troops who had been maintaining a degree of law and order in Manchuria and North China. This withdrawal was not only sought by such progressives in the State Department as John Stewart Service and Alger Hiss, it was also enthusiastically endorsed by conservatives such as General Weidemeyer, who shipped the Japanese out, and General MacArthur, who received them. No American, right-wing or left-wing, seriously proposed replacing the Japanese with United States or United Nations personnel until the nationalists had enough trainees to manage a modern, capitalist China. By withdrawing the Japanese, the nationalists and the Allies destroyed the political and economic system under which the nationalists proposed to operate, and were then astonished when the nationalists met defeat. In the China policy situation, the contribution of communist covert propaganda within the United States in preventing aid to Chiang in the crucial years of 1947, 1948, and 1949 should not be overlooked. Neither should it be overestimated nor considered the sole determinant of events which took place within China. Tsai War in the Indonesian Dutch War a rapid and talented command of propaganda was shown by the Indonesians in their retention of power in the face of a Dutch landing in the islands in 1945 and 46. The Indonesians were readily alert to the necessity for obtaining U.S., British, Australian, and other foreign sympathizers. They opened propaganda offices abroad and did an excellent job of presenting their own case. While Indonesian combat propaganda against the Netherlands troops is not recorded as having had much effect on Dutch morale, their use of global strategic propaganda to support a local war was excellent. Netherlands ships were refused docking and loading services by Australian stevedores. American press and public sympathy ran very largely in the Indonesian favor. Indonesian acceptance of the political concept United States of Indonesia, which was dropped as soon as independence was won, may have played a significant role in winning American sympathy. Dutch military and strategic propaganda in their war with Indonesians suffered from uncertainty on the Dutch side as to the goals of the war. The suspicion that a Netherlands victory would be nothing more than a triumph of colonial capitalism and the insistent interference of United Nations and United States observers. The Dutch were never able to put across the point that Indonesia deserved its nationhood from imperial Japanese sponsorship, and the Netherlands' withdrawal was dictated as much by the practical necessity of reconciling world opinion and balancing the home budget as by the militarily untenable nature of the Dutch enterprise. The Philippine War Against the Hooks By contrast, the Republic of the Philippines faced a very serious military situation in the challenge of the Hook armies. Tough communist troops concentrated in central Luzon, who waged a cruel and bitter war, rather like the struggle of the Irish Republicans against the Black and Tans. By 1950, the Philippine government was in a serious position. There was at least the remote possibility that if the government continued to falter, the city of Manila might have fallen to a communist coup. In this situation, Ramon Magsese, as Secretary of Defense, developed some of the most provocative and audacious anti-guerrilla operations of the post-war period. To meet the communist claim that the struggle was one of the landless against the rich, he offered all surrendered hooks resettlement in a new land project. He visited the project himself frequently enough to make sure it remained a valuable demonstration area. To allow the common people to help the government, without their suffering from communist reprisals against themselves or their families, he disseminated secret methods whereby the people could communicate with the government forces. He established a psychological warfare office under Major José Crisol. This office was doing as good a job of tactical psi war with leaflets, mimeographs, loudspeakers, light planes, and other field and headquarters equipment as any army installation which the author has seen. Most of the doctrine and procedures for the operation of the office were American, but the content of the materials was Filipino. Catholicism, Filipino patriotism, Malayan nativism, and peasant common sense were some of the factors used to underscore the Philippine Army's appeals. 
In the following three years, the hooks shrank seriously, although the danger could not be said to have been eliminated altogether. Indochina and political warfare. With devotion, often with heroism, frequently with brilliance, the French military forces in Indochina fought a communist-captured nationalist movement known as the Viet Minh. They fought despite the accompaniments of a wretched and vacillating home policy, incredibly poor psychological relationships with the native elite, and security situations which pass all American belief. One Vietnamese recently told the author that the pro-communist Viet Minh soldiers fought as long as they could against the French and then came back to French territory to eat good food, visit their families, rest and relax, before returning to the field to murder more French sentries, blow up more French patrols, or attack more French outposts. It ill becomes an American to criticize the French for their policy in Indochina since it was by virtue of a U.S. strategic decision and a U.S. logistical action that Indochina was turned first from Japanese hands into the hands of the British in the South and the Chinese nationalists in the North. The British did not care much about the local situation. The particular Chinese nationalists in northern Indochina were mildly sympathetic with local nationalism, but chiefly preoccupied with stealing everything that could be put on a truck. After this ill-fated liberation, the Americans then assisted the French in transporting forces back to Indochina. This was after much of the U.S. press and many U.S. leaders had indicated their disapproval of French colonialism and had given indirect but powerful encouragement to Viet Minh's rebellion against the French. Having helped foul up the situation for the French hopelessly, the United States then observed their return, a return which was definitely, though indirectly, made possible only by U.S. aid to France, with uncertainty and disquiet. It took the Americans four years to decide that they were on the French side, and even then they were not very much on the French side. Neither were the French. The French side was an indefinable amalgam of old-fashioned French colonialism, the membership of three small Asian states in a French Union, and anti-communism. The French made the mistake, which the Americans repeated when they invited the Chinese Communist General Wang Shuchan to New York to defame the United States through the courtesy of the United States government, or when they tried dealing with the Chinese Communists, fighting them, dealing with them, and fighting with them again. When the French finally decided to seek an all-out military victory against the Communists, they set up local governments which they themselves promptly dishonored, giving them neither prestige nor authority enough to combat the communist menace in local Asian terms. That the French should have held the Asian anti-communist front under these strange political circumstances is a credit to France. The Indochinese war has been dirty, discouraging. It is often verged upon the hopeless. The French have been criticized by Americans in the early period of the reoccupation of Indochina for not turning the country over to communist nationalists lock, stock, and barrel. Later, the Americans criticized the French because the French did not annihilate the same communist nationalists whom the Americans had previously lauded. In the end, Dien Bien Phu and Geneva were the inevitable concomitants of Pan Mun Jom. Once we made peace, the French had to make an equally bad peace, too. The United States was adroit enough to obtain the immense psychological leverage of getting the Korean War recognized as a UN war. The Indo-Chinese War was not made a UN war, even though it was the same enemy who was being fought. Asian communists, underwritten by Peking and guaranteed by Moscow, in each case. Amazing though it may seem, practical psychological warfare was almost completely neglected by the French until the Americans supplied the French with printing facilities for French Annamite leaflets in 1950. By 1952, the French had assigned staff officers to carry out psychological warfare responsibilities and were making a serious effort to link up with the other anti-communist forces in East Asia for the purpose of obtaining psychological warfare know-how. A considerable improvement in tactical psychological warfare was made between 1950 and 1952. The strategic psychological warfare position of the French in the area must be referred back to the Battle of the Probabilities mentioned earlier in this chapter. So long as French, Americans, and Annamites all feel that a French defeat is quite probable, and say so, both publicly and privately, it will be difficult for the French to make the Indo-Chinese believe that Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos are here to stay as French-protected and anti-communist nations. Malaya and the MRLA The MRLA, or Malaysian Races Liberation Army, 
is the Chinese Communist guerrilla army operating in the jungles of Malaya. Malaya, minus the island of Singapore, which is a separate crown colony to itself, has been constituted in the post-war period as a federation of Malay sultanates. The British have talked a great deal about the self-government of Malaya, the eventual end of their own rule, and the progress of the people. Everything, or almost everything, which the British say is true, except for the fundamental fact that the Chinese in Malaya can, under British rule, enjoy everything except life, purpose, and honor. What are life, purpose, and honor in basic human terms? They are the rights to belong to something, to be a part of history, to make one's own world move, to be a human being superior to other human beings, to be vain, to be proud, to be self-sacrificing. After years of war against the Chinese communist guerrillas, who have small components of Malayans and Indians with them, the British have not yet found a single British brigadier or major general of the Chinese race. The world at large on the anti-communist side has yet to hear of a Chinese Malayan hero who served mankind by falling martyr to the communist terror or by emerging as victor in valiant heroic combat. The Chinese in Malaya, as the author has observed at first hand, are probably more prosperous than any other Chinese have ever been anywhere in the world. Under capitalism today, the Chinese communities in Malaya have achieved a degree of wealth, health, and education which communist China will be remarkable to have achieved if it survives and succeeds for the next hundred years. Does this not give the lie to the great communist myth concerning Asia, the myth accepted by many Western politicians, intellectuals, and newspaper men? That the struggle between communism and anti-communism is a struggle for living standards? That the issue is an issue of who will provide the best livelihood? On the pro-communist side in Malaya, Chinese who are not religious and who are not known for their practicality and secularism, struggle for the chance to go forth and suffer, to serve in an army with bad medical service and no pensions, to face an almost certain death in the jungle, to lose life and property, which they could keep on the British side, in order to gain that other kind of life, life with honor and purpose, on the communist side. The British, meanwhile, progress, no doubt. In many respects, the British administration in Singapore and Malaya are more enlightened than some of the local governments in the United States. But whatever the reason, they do not seem to belong to the Chinese who live there, or even to the Malays. They are governments for the people, and not, so far as the local people seem to judge, governments of the people. Is it reasonable to ask, in the mid-1950s, that decent British officers and civil servants convert themselves into apocalyptic fanatics of a weird composite Asian nationalism? Can the British make revolution in Malaya when they are rather fatigued with their own labor revolution at home? Can we Americans, who have made nothing, absolutely nothing, out of the heroism and romance and tradition that might have been reconstituted as the ancient kingdom of Ryokyu, Okinawa, be in a position to chide the British for not doing that which we ourselves do not undertake? The communist is strong, bad magic. In North Korea, it created officers in an unreasonably short time, developed fanatics while we were trying to develop gentlemen, and came close to defeating us in the perilous week of the Pusan perimeter. In China, soldiers of whom many Americans despaired when they fought on the nationalist side became desperate assault infantry under communist training. The timid and quarrelsome Annamites, who had given the French so little trouble before communism organized them, fought like leopards once they read Marx, Lenin, Mao Zedong, and Ho Chi Minh. Was this why the communists were able to continue in Malaya? No one has ever accused the British army of lacking ingenuity. The forces who developed desert raiders, coastal commandos, air-dropped banditti, and a plethora of amusing, shocking, and audacious innovations cannot be accused of a lack of imagination. The British did use psychological warfare in Malaya strategically, tactically, in the field, in the cities, by radio, and by print. When Carlton Green was directing the British Psy War effort from the headquarters of that redoubtable gentleman, Malcolm MacDonald, British Commander General for Southeast Asia, he even resorted to the device of writing individual letters to known communists and leaving these letters scattered through the jungle. The British used white propaganda, black propaganda, gray propaganda. If there had been a purple propaganda, they certainly would have tried it. Alex Josie came close to it 
when he shocked the planters in Malaya by delivering socialist speeches over the Malay radio in an attempt to pull the left wing off the communist bird. Sir Henry Gurney, the High Commissioner of the Federation, who was murdered in 1952, was a veteran of irregular warfare. He had faced the Zionist terrorists in Jerusalem and was a man without fear. His approach to the problem of confronting communism was hopelessly sane. The communists were offering young Chinese the intoxication of craziness, of a mad and heroic righteousness to justify the misspending of their lives. Sir Henry's answer was decency, goodness, security, prosperity, authority, liberty under law. He offered everything except glamour, terror, inspiration, and romance. Everything except the chance to join the British side. What kind of British side? A British side which, like the communist side, would welcome the makers of the future, the builders of the next civilization, the arbiters of history. The communists have presented a high bid against the U.S. and Britain, as well as the other Western powers. We have not yet overbid them. The high bid is the opportunity to join, to belong, really to be equal, not just legally equal, and, above everything, to share, to struggle, and to work under conditions of heroism for a common goal. The right to join. The West has lost a lot of the Cold War in Asia because the communist side could be joined and the Western side could not be joined. There is no American party in India, but there is a communist party. There is no anti-communist army to which cadres of men from either Soviet-occupied or Soviet-free territories can be made welcome. There is no command point for the anti-communist struggle. There is the promise of immense U.S. help, even the promise of British, Colombian, Ethiopian, and other help for Korea or other Koreas. Is there much willingness to be helped? Is there any way that we can let ordinary Asians in on our side? The top levels of this problem are, of course, political. They must be solved in the light of a U.S. home public which eschews crusades and dreads adventures. At a lower level, the problem becomes one for the military staffs of the future. How can the United States, the United Nations, or other anti-communist forces recruit native leaders and native followers under circumstances of dignity and honor? How can we either learn to love the allies we have or find allies whom we can love? Until then, much of the spiritual and organizational advantage in Asia will fall to the communists. We may have the better ideals, but if people who are determined to illuminate their own lives with the splendor of risky, heroic, or self-sacrificing action, and who insist on doing something desperate, somewhere, somehow, so as to relieve the ignominy, poverty, and monotony of their existences, cannot learn how to join us, they will perforce join the other side. A slight or even a substantial increase in economic welfare in the Asian states seems to the author to favor a sharp increase in communist strength. When people are desperately poor or sick, they cannot worry about causes. When they become moderately well-off, well enough off to know that they are despised, poor by our standards, ignorant by our standards, then the point of psychological frenzy comes in. Propaganda Techniques in the Seven Wars Neither in the Chinese Civil War, nor in the seven other wars listed, has there been much refinement of propaganda techniques over World War II. As a matter of fact, it took the Korean War two years to come up to the standards of Normandy. It is amazing how many propaganda techniques had become lost arts between 1945 and 1950. The author himself flew under the Chinese Communist forces along the Han River in March 1951, when the voice plane in which he rode as an observer had to hug the valley bottoms in order to get its message to the Chinese ground forces past the sound of its own propellers. Instead of ingenious, up-to-the-minute gadgets to dispense leaflets, the author joined the young officers in the plane in throwing the leaflets out of the plane door by hand. He thought ruefully about the leaflet bombs and leaflet dispensers which had been used in Europe and in Burma. And when he returned unharmed to Tegu, he submitted one more red-hot memorandum recommending the obvious. The strategic Psi War self-limitations imposed by the United States on the United States in the Korean War were also crippling. The United States did not desire anything which a professional soldier would recognize as victory. U.S. opinion was divided as to whether all of Korea should be liberated by U.N. forces. At the policymaking level, 
certainly among our allies, there was pretty general agreement to remain at peace with the supply dumps and high command of the Chinese government forces in Manchuria and China while seeking the forward echelons of those forces in Korea. The United States would not accept defeat, nor would it seek a decisive victory, because victory might have involved the risk of war. Under these conditions, it must be pointed out that General MacArthur had the first and only Psy War establishment ready to operate the moment the Korean War began. Colonel J. Woodall Green ably managed the Tokyo headquarters for most of the period of the Korean War. The Department of the Army showed great good judgment in bringing back Brigadier General Robert McClure, who had been Eisenhower's Psy War chief in Europe, to the new Department of the Army's Psy War establishment, which was created on 15 January 1951 in the Pentagon as part of Special Staff, United States Army, with the title of Office of the Chief of Psychological Warfare, OCPW. When General McClure departed for Tehran, he was succeeded at OCPW by Brigadier General William Bullock. The last period of the Korean War found Korean local Psy War at the headquarters of 8th U.S. Army in Korea, EUSAK, under the command of Colonel Donald Hall, who had probably seen more continuous Psy War service than any other officer in the U.S. Army. End of chapter 14. End of section 25. Section 26 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger Read by Crystal J. Silas Chapter 15a Strategic International Information Operations Part 1 From 1776 to 1945, the U.S. system of government managed to survive in a world comprising of many types of government without setting up its own propaganda and agitational forces. Propaganda, through most of the 20th century, was pretty clearly limited by the U.S. conception of propaganda as a weapon auxiliary to war. Psychological warfare became proper, in conventional American terms, only when there was a war to be won. With the coming of peace in 1945, there was considerable uncertainty as to whether the United States should have a propaganda establishment at all. The story of U.S. peacetime propaganda since the end of World War II is a very complicated one. Quantity, direction, purpose, and quality have shifted with the various turns of the international situation. The subject has become much more difficult to write about since the time the first edition of this book was written in 1946. In the first place, Governmental secrecy has been very sharply restored. Even very routine State Department operations for putting across the U.S. point of view have been shrouded in masses of classified documents. For reasons not always evident to the outside observer, the assumption has become prevalent that the normal operations of the United States government should be kept confidential, secret, or even top secret. Often, it would seem that the attempt to maintain secrecy in non-sensitive functions is not worth the security effort at all, or, contrarywise, may even reassure the antagonists of the United States by not letting them realize how serious and how unfriendly our plans or policies with respect to them may be. This is not the time or place to discuss the problem of secrecy as a protection against domestic criticism, which secrecy, of course, has often become to the detriment of both the government and the citizens of the United States. In the second place, not only have information activities become more hush-hush, they have also become more complicated. It is difficult to do justice to an intricate moving panorama of activities, some of which may not be mentioned or described under existing law. Demobilization and Remobilization The ending of the OWI and the installation of the International Information Service, mentioned above on page 184, in turn changed into the information activities of the Department of State. These were headed from 1945 to 1953 by an Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. In 1953, a Director of the United States Information Agency not under the Department of State, but mysteriously attached to the National Security Council, was inaugurated. The overseas operating component of the USIA remained the United States Information Service, USIS, 
transferred from the State Department control. In other words, there were eight years in which the Department of State had primary responsibility for the conduct of peacetime propaganda of the United States. This was the first and only time that the United States government had, in a period of relative peace, undertaken a sustained propaganda effort. The effort had ups and downs because neither the citizenry nor the officials knew whether the country was in a condition of peace or at war, and, if at war, at war with whom. To some, the enemy was communism the ideology. To others, communism the movement. To still others, the USSR. To others, the Korean communist, but not the Chinese communists. To others, the Chinese communists in Korea, but not the Chinese communists in China and so on ad infinitum. The general history of these eight years was, by and large, a first phase in which the United States demobilized or destroyed propaganda facilities, which had been built up with great skill and at great cost during World War II, and a second phase in which those facilities were partially rebuilt and the skills rediscovered. The low point in this development was probably the winter of 1947-48. to 48. For a while, the rumor went around Washington that the Secretary of Defense, Lewis Johnson, would not tolerate the utterance of the words propaganda or psychological warfare, and that the Secretary of the Army, Kenneth C. Royal, refused to have the topic mentioned to him. That may be the exaggeration characteristic of newspapermen, but it epitomized the spirit of that time. While psychological warfare almost disappeared from the Department of Defense and the three services during this low point, the State Department never quite demobilized. For one thing, the State Department had inherited the OWI facilities and the Army facilities in the occupied countries, Austria, Germany, Korea, and Japan. As the heir to substantial information facilities, the State Department kept a certain minimum activity going. Facilities such as American Broadcasting Station in Europe, ABSIE, Radio in American Sector of Berlin, RIAS, the Information Control Commands in the American Sector of Germany, Information and Education, INE, Section of the General Headquarters of the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, SCAP, in Japan, these, though sometimes renamed, represented going propaganda concerns which required a Washington command post. Meanwhile, it became standing operating procedure in the U.S. diplomatic establishment to attach some kind of an informational facility to every diplomatic establishment and to most of the major consulates. Since there were always advocates of complete propaganda dismantlement, as well as enthusiasts for the maintenance of information programs, the issue of remaining in the propaganda business or getting out was always more or less in doubt. The economy and the demobilization phases of 1947 and 1948 were stimulated by evidence of Soviet bad faith in Europe during 1949 and brought into sharp focus by the outbreak of the Korean Semi-War in 1950. It is not possible to do justice to all these different systems in a single phrase. Even as late as the present, it is sometimes difficult to determine why the U.S. need have an information program operating in such entirely friendly countries as Cuba, Haiti, Ireland, or Australia. There is some point to the argument set forth by the ultra-conservatives that what was good enough for Theodore Roosevelt ought to be good enough today. That, in other words, the United States should be known for what it is and not by what a few hired promoters can say about it. As in so many other fields of activities, however, the past is irrecoverable. The United States can no more return to the pre-atomic age in propaganda matters than it can in defense matters. The world we have built is with us, and the only alternative to survival seems death. With respect to the specific field of propaganda, this leads to occasional curious political alliances. Sometimes the conservatives in U.S. politics are so conservative they want no propaganda at all. At other times, these same conservatives are so anti-communist that they want more propaganda. On occasions, the left within the USA has viewed US propaganda with alarm, and at other times has demanded that there be more of it, and that more of the content be left. Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs The Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs has been the principal officer of government responsible for the conduct of the US propaganda during 1945 to 1953. His successor, the Director of the United States Information Agency, 
faces very closely related problems. Fortunately, one of these assistant secretaries of state has written an excellent book relating his experiences and the problems of his office in detail. Edward W. Barrett, in his Truth is Our Weapon, New York, 1953, describes his own experiences with two years in that position. The assistant secretary had the help of an interdepartmental committee which, under various labels and various degrees of secrecy, attempted to coordinate the foreign informational activities of the various departments of the United States government to common goals. Later, as will be described, the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs was supplemented by a psychological strategy board outside of the Department of State, and, still later, by a White House assistant in charge of informational policies at the highest level. What can be said of this first U.S. peacetime performance in the propaganda field? The assistant secretaries themselves have been men of varied capacities and interests. Mr. Barrett was an OWI veteran and a journalist of high standing. George Allen was a tough-minded career diplomat. Helen Sargent was a distinguished government official. William Benton was the founder of the most successful canned music system for restaurants and the most vigorous promoter which the Encyclopedia Britannica ever had. Later, he became a senator. Men such as these can scarcely be called tight-lipped fanatics emerging from the hidden recesses of U.S. Politburo. They and their colleagues did a surprisingly good job. American travelers overseas were often amazed to find that the U.S. propaganda effort was far more polished and purposeful than an observer within the United States could expect it to be. The activities of the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs consisted of supervising the domestic origination of broadcasts directed to the Soviet Union, the satellite countries, neutrals, and France. The radio system was generally known as the Voice of America. To this degree, he had charge of a propaganda system operated within the United States by Americans, but speaking to foreigners, sometimes by transmitters located within the USA, and more often with relay transmitters which picked up programs originating in the continental United States and rebroadcast overseas. One echelon removed, there were installations attached to the diplomatic and consular establishments of the United States, which were usually known as USIS, although in some particular cases, quasi-private facilities were sponsored instead. In each foreign country, there was at the embassy or legation level a public affairs officer, PAO, who was the information specialist for the diplomatic mission and, in theory at least, in charge of all U.S. propaganda or informational activities, whichever one preferred to call them, in the country to which he was accredited. A complex hierarchy of officials routed, relayed, screened, and coordinated programs from headquarters to the PAOs in the field, and proposals or requests from the PAOs back to headquarters. Other U.S. Facilities A complicated element in the State Department's conduct of propaganda was the fact that at no time did the State Department enjoy even a monopoly of the governmental mass communications of the United States abroad. It goes without saying that at no time did the State Department achieve or seek control of private U.S. mass communications such as the international editions of Time and Newsweek, the circulation of American books and magazines on a commercial basis, commercial American-owned publications abroad, or the like. At the very least level of competition, the State Department had the Armed Forces Radio Service, AFRS, broadcasting to most of the countries in which the State Department was active often broadcasting in quite a different tone of voice and with very different content. In many instances, foreigners who understood English preferred to listen to the lively radio programs transmitted for the edification of U.S. service personnel stationed abroad, rather than to listen to the canned programs made up for the benefit of themselves as a foreign target. The author has seen Chinese shopkeepers in Singapore listen very seriously to a sergeant giving the news of the day at diction speed from an armed services transmitter somewhere in the Pacific Ocean area. In 1948, there was virtually no coordination between the armed services and the Department of State. As time went on, the two sets of U.S. broadcasts took a certain amount of note of each other. Coordination was not as easy as it might seem on paper. After all, what is one to do? Is it valid to propagandize our innocently cherubic service personnel abroad, whom so many domestic purity leagues and local pressure groups are anxious to defend? After all, these service people possess fearful weapons. Each is a congressman to whom he might write. 
But if service personnel in a foreign country are to be given non-propaganda materials, how can the same area be given propaganda materials for the benefit of the indigenous personnel? The propaganda from the United States government must not be too much at variance with the non-propaganda of the United States government. If the two extremes of communication were too far apart, the United States government might look like an ass. That would be most unhappy. Over and above the contradictions and difficulties involved in the operation of at least two governmental systems and many private systems of U.S. news communication and dissemination systems in foreign areas, there is the further problem of the additional U.S. facilities. Sources such as the Washington Post, Joseph Alsop, James Reston, and other well-informed Washington journalists often hinted gloomily and darkly that U.S. cloak-and-dagger operations are still going on. Dorothy Thompson was often troubled by what she regarded as the feckless successors of the wartime OSS. Many times, Americans resident in local areas concerned seemed never to have heard of the hush-hush operations in their own overseas homes, operations which were denounced with purple prose in Washington. We can say that covert operations, when they have really been uncovered, as in the case of the Times story about overzealous U.S. support of a German nationalist resistance group, turn out to be much more pale than the lurid columnist or inside stories from Washington would lead one to believe. More serious have been the duplication and triplication and occasional quadruplication of official informational activities. The Overseas Economic and Military Aid Program, known successively as Economic Cooperation Administration, ECA, Mutual Security Administration, MSA, and Foreign Operations Administration, FOA, has not only supplemented the existing leaflet, broadcast, and other informational activities of the State Department and the Arms Forces with a third set of information programs, it has itself had a fourth rival in the Point 4 Administration, the Technical Cooperation Administration, TCA, which was both a part of state and not a part of state, depending upon the particular situation overseas. Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia over and above the government's operations in this field, there have been the quasi-private undertakings of the Committee for a Free Europe and the Committee for a Free Asia. These have been privately sponsored and privately financed by altruistic organizations dedicated to broadcasting those things which the State Department finds it impolitic to put on the air. The degree of governmental contribution or participation is not known, although it is often touched upon in the U.S. press. That the organizations are to a definite extent private is evident in their ability to broadcast local and controversial news to particular Iron Curtain countries and by the fund drives which they have waged with little contribution boxes inside the USA. The advantage of the RFE and RFA type of operations is that, by giving voice to independent, non-governmental resistance to communism, it has often been possible to go far beyond the limits which intergovernmental protocol would impose on U.S. official broadcasts. That is, the United States can scarcely describe a deputy minister in the Romanian government as a scoundrel, thief, pervert, or renegade. Romanian exiles allowed access to Radio Free Europe stations need to have no such limitations. On the other hand, there is a difficulty that Radio Free Europe because of its U.S.-based finance and management, might lend an unnecessary U.S. sponsorship to genuinely independent anti-communist undertakings. Here again, as in the case of the reconciliation of the State Department and defense broadcasts, it is impossible to draw a doctrinal rule which would prescribe on one hand that all propaganda broadcasts should be unofficial or that they should all be official. One cannot even say that they should all be coordinated. The Psychological Strategy Board Coordination was nevertheless attempted, at least for the governmental side. In 1951, President Truman created the Psychological Strategy Board, bringing the versatile and judicious Gordon Gray back to Washington for the purpose. The prescribed role of the board was to coordinate, plan, and phase all United States information policies so as to achieve maximum effect from the governmental effort. Not once did the board dare reach out for a penny's worth of jurisdiction over private U.S. facilities. The Psychological Strategy Board was only originally under the chairmanship of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, then General Walter Beadle Smith, with the members of the board consisting of the Under Secretary of State, the Under Secretary of Defense, and the Deputy Director of what was at the time known as ECA, later MSA. 
The board had a series of able staff directors and small staffs detailed from other government departments on a permanent basis to serve as a working secretariat. The precise operations of the board were cloaked in extraordinary secrecy. It cannot be said that U.S. propaganda worsened in the two years following the establishment of the board, neither can it be said that U.S. Psy war operations scored any coups so striking as to deserve a position in the annals of international affairs. End of Section 26, Chapter 15a Read by Crystal J. Silas Fort Myers, May 26, 2021「Section 27 of Psychological Warfare」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piano Roll 262 Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger Chapter 15b Strategic International Information Operations Part 2 William Jackson Report After the Republicans came into office in 1953, President Dwight D. Eisenhower moved to overhaul the information establishment. He appointed a committee under the chairmanship of William Jackson, a former OSS official and investment banker, and under the secretaryship of Abbott Washburn, who had headed the superlatively successful advertising department of General Mills, Inc., which had successfully given away millions of prizes for millions of box tops from cereals consumed by American youth or flowers relished by the American housewife. Some of the liberal press commentators eyed the committee gloomily as it went to work. Nevertheless, that portion of its report which was made public turned out to be a document of remarkable finesse and sophistication. The report, released in July 1953, pointed out the Psychological Strategy Board had erred in trying to plan informational activities in its own light instead of considering the informational aspects of every single U.S. government activity possessing international significance. The report recommended the replacement of the Psychological Strategy Board by a more realistic policy coordinating organization, which would coordinate not merely propaganda policies, but all policies, and, having coordinated all policies, would then resolve upon maximum psychological exploitation of the policies which had been decided. In a sense, this is rather like saying that the United States should have a president since the powerful chief executive of this government has, since 1789, been the final arbiter of executive matters, both foreign and domestic. In another sense, it can be interpreted to mean that the responsibilities of the presidency are so great that no one man could perform in his head all the staff work necessary to see through the opinion reactions which might develop abroad to U.S. executive decisions made here at home. If the latter supposition is true, it means that the United States is saddled with one more intricate governmental process made necessary by the closeness, dangerousness, and importance of international affairs in the lives of Americans and their government. Operations Coordinating Board On 3 September 1953, President Eisenhower, then at Denver, Colorado, issued an executive order abolishing the Psychological Strategy Board and creating the Operations Coordinating Board. According to informed press comment at the time, it was the intention of the White House to carry out the recommendation to this effect made by the President's Committee on International Information Activities. The new board was located immediately under the National Security Council. C. D. Jackson was a significant member of the board, but not as chairman. The chairman was Walter Bedell Smith. Besides General Smith, 
then Under Secretary of State. The board included Harold E. Stassen, Director of the Foreign Operations Administration, Alan W. Dulles, Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and Roger M. Kyes, Deputy Secretary of Defense. The President also directed that Theodore C. Strybert, Director of the U.S. Information Service, make himself available. Insofar as this development represented an attempt to coordinate the framing of U.S. government policy in such a manner as to achieve maximum impact on the rest of the world, it represented a major step forward. The de-emphasis of psychological warfare or psychological strategy as operations, which could somehow or other be efficacious without a context of material support through the real-life behavior of the government issuing the propaganda, was a healthy sign indeed. Psychological warfare is at best a cumbersome and pretentious label for an important modern political and military weapon, the use of mass communication. The definition of empirical psychological warfare given in Chapter 3 and reproduced as it was originally written in 1946, makes it perfectly plain that the term acquires specificity which is made plain by the particular individualities involved undertaking the operation at any given time. Psychological warfare is not an ancient term which is so well defined by the usage of centuries that modern men would be ill-advised to redefine it or to sweep it aside. Indeed, the basic weakness of the term psychological warfare is its pretentiousness within American civilization of the 1900s. No one now knows whether the United States of the 1960s will turn out to be dynamic, forward-looking, insistent upon its own view of the world. It is difficult in the 1950s to see how the next decade or so could bring forth anything as explosive or violent in the social and political field as the atomic bomb has been in the field of fission. The United States certainly does not seem to be on the threshold of a new Islam. For better or for worse, the U.S. strengths are the strengths of sobriety, calmness, health. They are the strengths of living as opposed to the strengths of revolution. Revolution may be strong, it may even be pleasurable to some persons involved, but as Dennis W. Brogan has pointed out in his The Price of Revolution, Boston, 1952, revolution has a cost factor which must be weighed against the results expected from it. In the context of mid-20th century affairs, it is almost pitiable and endearing to see us Americans of this time, who are so little given to the drama of fanaticism or the salvation of the world through cruelty, attempting to dramatize our own modest and reasonable operations by giving them melodramatic and pretentious labels. If the communists torment us long enough, they may make us into alert brutes. This seems doubtful now. It seems probable that we will continue to be brave without being fiendish in combat, strong without becoming ferocious in peace. Varying definitions of Cywar are adopted by official agencies from time to time. The current, 1953, Joint Chiefs of Staff Definition runs as follows. Psychological warfare comprises the planned use of propaganda and related informational measures designed to influence the opinions, emotions, attitudes, and behavior of enemy or other foreign groups in such a way as to support the accomplishment of national policies and aims or a military mission. This definition differs from the one given in Chapter 3 in the following important respects. It stresses the planned character of Cywar. It restricts the pertinent measures to those of an informational character. 
and it makes clear the operational goals. It is not clear why it is necessary to stress the element of planning of Psy War, as distinguished from other sorts of war, unless it is a homily to the Psy War operator to keep his functions in line with those of other national activities. The question of restriction to informational character is more serious. It excludes the interpretation that, in essence, psychological warfare depends upon warfare psychologically waged. Thus, substantive operations of a non-informational character, adopted and executed primarily for their psychological effect, could properly be called psi war. Finally, the specification of goals is chiefly important for the control of the function, and can largely be taken for granted. Therefore, to preserve an inclusive view of the function which will comprise the range of variation in official definitions, including those of one's enemies, the author stands by the definition stated in 1946. Limitations of the American Originators there are illusions about psychological warfare, illusions spread in many cases by the over-enthusiastic friends of this kind of operation. Excessive claims have been made for the efficacy of propaganda. Sometimes psychological warfare has even been offered as a substitute for war or for diplomacy. On other occasions, Americans have asked that their government do as well as this or that foreign government in the propaganda field, forgetting that the United States is a republic and a democracy and, therefore, subject to the sharp limitations which republican democratic governments possess. A republic cannot impose a purpose upon mankind. A democracy cannot announce a policy and then stick to it for years and decades. Americans are not messiahs. The limitations of American civilization, over and above our specific political institutions, are such as to make it impossible for Americans to lead a fanatical counter-crusade against communism, or to guarantee to the human race at large that Americans of 1955 promise that Americans of 1975 will perform this or that specific action. American propaganda is always limited, precisely because it is American. Even in an age of atomic weapons, to be American means, to some degree at least, to be free. The people of this country, or at the very least an awful lot of them, do have something to do with operating the government. A new election and a hostile House of Representatives can cut off the funds for any project, no matter what its merits may be in the eyes of the top-secret planners. The outside world knows this, even if Washington politicians and bureaucrats sometimes forget. One can even contradict the title of Archibald MacLeish's famous poem, America was promises, and state categorically that in the propaganda field, America certainly is not promises. The promise of a czar or a dictator is usually good for his lifetime, whereas the promise of the United States is good only within the letter of the law. A specific treaty, a definite commercial agreement, a very sharp and very narrow commitment. There is an American strength in international affairs. This strength does not lie in a propaganda capacity to promise, to threaten, or to commit the United States government to future courses of action. It lies rather in the immense probabilities of American life, in the virtual certainty that the American people will react in such and such a fashion to a new aggression that the American people will, if attacked, in all probability destroy their attackers, whoever those attackers may be, and that the American people, 
Despite their occasional shortcomings in matters of racial tolerance, political freedom, and economic injustice, will in the long run be solidly ranged behind whatever policies seem to promise equality, prosperity, and freedom for all mankind. The limitations of the United States as a source of propaganda are sharp. There is no U.S. party line. It is virtually impossible to imagine that within our civilization as we now know it, there could be one. There might be an official U.S. line, unanimous and binding upon all federal departments, but the federal government itself is, after all, only one among the 49 separate governments operating within the continental USA. The state governments, the cities within them, and the people at large are free to contradict what the federal government may say at any given point. American strength cannot be sought in unanimity. U.S. propaganda is incapable of pulling the Sudeten rabbit out of a Munich hat. Short of an intimate and extreme danger of war itself, the U.S. government cannot threaten a foreign government very successfully. Too many U.S. citizens would immediately shout at one another, at their own government, and to the foreigners concerned, those Washington officials don't really mean it. We don't want war. We're not going to go through with it. If the USA moved against Spain, there are friends of Franco in Washington who would tell him to sit tight. If the USA moved too rapidly against the communist world, there are plenty of Americans, both in and out of government, who would say privately, through the press or by letters, that the Indian government or some other should assure Moscow and Peiping that the U.S. would not dare carry through. Exploitation of U.S. propaganda strength must therefore always be developed from the probable or apparent center of American opinion at that moment. It is impossible to find a U.S. policy which can be made compulsory and unanimous upon all Americans, both public and private. It is not impossible through an adroit combination of the skills of leadership, foresight, and a keen awareness of intra-U.S. politics, to devise foreign policy programs which will command the decisive assent of the American people. War and Unanimity The less peaceful the world is, the more effective a peacetime information program can be. The attack of the communist aggressors in Korea, which involved the U.S. armed forces, pushed the U.S. public into line behind the U.S. government in a way which no degree of propaganda manipulation from Washington could have contrived. In times of danger, the American people stick together. In times of relaxation, they scatter about. One should not plan a crusade for the American people to carry out unless one is sure that someone on the outside will goad the American people with repeated stings of danger or trouble. Once war breaks out, the American people have in the past shown a very good capacity to unite in winning and finishing the war. There is no reason to suppose that the situation will be different in the future. What is perplexing and for the present insoluble is this. How can the American people, short of getting involved in war, become so purposeful, so decisive, so nearly unanimous as to take actions which will prevent a war? The situation in the early 1950s is, on the communist side, a major crusade against what the Reds regarded or pretended to regard as aggressive U.S. capitalist power. In other words, the communists of the world had a crusade against the USA. The USA had a crusade against no one. A prominent Washington official long displayed the sign in his office, I ain't mad at nobody. 
In a very real sense, this epitomized one of the very real moods of the American people. How do we defend ourselves against a crusade, especially if we have no desire to have part in a counter-crusade? U.S. propagandists sometimes forget that they are not speaking for a mere nation, but are the representatives of something which is far bigger than any single nationality. They are the spokesmen, whether they like it or not, for a way of life which is new in the world for a kind of freedom which, though coarse, is real. Characteristic American strengths have been, are, and will be the strengths of patience, endurance, versatility, and curiosity. It is foolish to ask Americans to be strong in bitterness, strong in hatred, strong in a cruel or proud self-righteousness. We are not Japanese, or Prussians, or Russians. We are not Irish, or English, or French. We are mostly European, and yet un-European. Our propaganda will be effective only if it springs from the simplest and strongest aspects of our life at home. Our material prosperity is beyond doubt. What is not so evident to the outside world is the frugality the kindliness, and the humble foresight which drove so much of that prosperity into being. The Propaganda of Friendship U.S. limitations are nowhere more evident in peacetime propaganda than in the oft-repeated phrase of winning friends for America. The desire for having a friend is a deep necessity amid the crowded loneliness of U.S. urban society. The necessity to be liked leads to grotesquely exaggerated inferences as to what being liked may involve. Americans in and out of government often argue that America should make friends, on the naive assumption that friends are useful to nations in time of trouble. This is, of course, not true. The Swedes were very good friends of the Norwegians. Nevertheless, the Swedes saved their Swedish skins by sitting back when the Nazis overran Norway. Did Lithuania have an enemy? Did Latvia have an enemy? Did Estonia have an enemy? These countries were the good friends of all the Western powers. These countries have disappeared. The United States was a friend of China, a friendship boastfully and sentimentally proclaimed for more than a hundred years, from the days of Daniel Webster to the finale of George C. Marshall. What use was it to the Chinese to have the United States as a friend? When they fell upon trouble, a U.S. Secretary of State denounced their government as corrupt and told the Chinese how good the United States was. Friendship does not usually lead to war or peace. War and peace depend upon survival. Any veteran will remember men whom he disliked intensely in his own wartime outfits. He never daydreamed of turning them over to the enemy just because he was personally antagonistic to them. A common danger from something, more complicatedly, a common interest in something, is a far more potent assurance of future strength and strategic action than is friendship. Friendship operates between individuals, not between the overgrown corporate fictions which are called nations. If you were a West German, and if you were absolutely positive that all Americans were lovely people, you would be wise to join the Soviet side. That way, if the Russians win, you will have appeased the enigmatic and implacable Muscovites. On the other hand, if the Americans win, and you are sure they are lovely people as well as good friends of yours, they will not really mind your having joined the other side as a matter of temporary factual necessity. If a man is your best friend, he may jump into the river to rescue you, should you fall in, 
Unfortunately, he might prefer to telephone a rescue squad. But if he is handcuffed to you, you are reasonably sure that if you fall in, he will be with you. Call it propaganda. Call it information. Call it international communication. Under any name, the major point remains. Americans can find trustworthy future allies through commitment to common interest or common danger. Friendship is pleasant, but not of the essence. In some cases, it might be desirable for leaders or key groups in important foreign areas to realize that the United States could be a worse enemy than the Soviet Union, rather than to realize that the U.S. is a friend. If the French were sure of this, that is, that a Soviet-occupied France would get 65 hydrogen bombs dropped on it, while a U.S.-occupied France would get only three, they might prefer the Americans whether they liked them or not. Is this kind of communication consistent with American ideals? Perhaps not. Yet honesty has always been one of the American ideals, and perhaps honesty may take us in the future to a stronger and a wiser position than friendliness has taken us in the past. End of section 27 Section 28 of Psychological Warfare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger Section 28 Chapter 16a Research, Development, and the Future, Part 1 Psychological warfare is part of civilization. Civilization, no matter how one defines it, is not a static thing. It is an immense, fermenting, active, often turbulent composite of the whys and hows of the way men and women think and behave. The short-run factors in a civilization are often as important as the long-run ones. Though the United States from 1860 to 1960 has been a steady part of the West European, predominantly Christian civilization, the United States has undergone immense changes of fashion, belief, appetite, preference, and behavior. With any changing, developing civilization, war may seem like a very static term, so that the Civil War and the War of the Western Powers against Germany of 1939 to 1945 may to some degree seem comparable phenomena. They are comparable, but only within sharp limits. The Meaning of War Nowhere is the transitoriness and changeability of modern civilization more evident than in the significance which intelligent men and women attach to the term war. War was noble in 1861 through 65, but in 1941 through 45, it was noble only for the most perfunctory and most hollow oratory. Push the contrast farther. Psychological warfare was an unknown element in 1861 through 65. By 1941 through 45, it had become fashionable. One can seriously doubt that President Lincoln ever worried about northern citizens becoming un-American under that rubric, though he had plenty of traitors to worry him. The years 1945 through 53 were momentous. A whole string of new ideas, new terms, and new behavior patterns appeared within the USA in a mere eight years. What the next 20 years will bring is deeply uncertain. War is coming to mean the effectuation or prevention of revolution, not the half-savage, half-courteous, armed conflict of sovereign nations. War is getting to be chronic again. War between entirely comparable states, such as the United States and Canada, Mexico and Cuba, Indonesia and India, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, or any similar combination, is getting to be more and more unthinkable. War between ideologically dissimilar states, such as North Korea and South Korea, Communist China and Nationalist China, Viet Minh and Vietnam, USSR and USA, is getting to be virtual normality. Research into Tension It is true of all people that they solve particular problems, in many cases, some time after the occasion for solving the problem has passed. What is called decision, in government, politics, and in personal affairs, is very often not the selection of one very real course of action, as against another equally real course of action, 
but the confirmation of a commitment already made. If this is true of everyday life, it is even more true of scholars and experts. One of the disabilities of our time, in the field of the social and psychological sciences and the humanities, lies in the fact that although government officials recognize problems some months or years after they have arisen and finally attempt to deal with them, scholars frequently get around to problems decades after any practical occasion for decision has passed. Nowhere is this more evident than in the discussion of tensions as a cause of war. Tensions certainly contributed very much to the outbreak of war in 1914. It is possible that the tensions and hostilities of Europe in the 1930s, which allowed fascism and communism to become threatening and powerful, also contributed in the end to the outbreak of war in 1939. It is difficult, however, to suppose that the coming of war in September 1939 was itself the result of tension, except as a very remote and indirect cause. This author believes that tension leads to a perpetuation of a kind of civilization in which wars are possible, but cannot persuade himself that an additional factor of tension within civilization as we know it can be an immediate cause of war. Research into tensions has been carried fairly far. It may be that the wartime role of tension can be ascertained by scientific methods so that the psychological warfare of power A can cause so much more tension than power B, either among the elite or among the general population, that power B cannot further continue the war. Alternatively, it is imaginable that power A may be able to relax tension so sharply among the elite or broad population of power B that power B's potentiality for war or decision to wage war can be postponed. For purposes of research, it seems worthwhile to suggest that tension appears to be highly prevalent in the two most powerful military civilizations on Earth today, the USSR and its satellites, on the one hand, and the cluster of Western powers, on the other. Tension appears to be caused by the complexity of everyday life, the demands made upon the psychophysiological organization of each individual human being, by the technological facilities available, and through the relief offered within each civilization, by the opportunity to discharge hatred against members of the other civilization, instead of recognizing self-hatred for the very real problem which it is. In other terms, it is tough to be modern. The difficulty of being modern makes it easy for individuals to be restless and anxious. Restlessness and anxiety lead to fear. Fear converts freely into hate. Hate very easily takes on political form. Political hate assists in the creation of real threats such as the atomic bomb and guided missiles, which are not imaginary threats at all. The reality of the threats seems to confirm the reality of the hate which led to it, thus perpetuating a cycle of insecurity, fear, hate, armament, insecurity, fear, and on around the circle again and again. Revolutionary Possibilities in Psychology it is possible, but by no means probable, that the rapid development of psychological and related sciences in the Western world may provide whole new answers to the threats which surround modern Americans, including the supreme answer of peace as an alternative to war, or the secondary answer of victory in the event of war. Nothing in the existing academic literature on the subject of psychology of war, the psychiatry of modern mass behavior, the psychology or psychiatry of present-day power politics, justifies the inference that an applicable solution to our problems is at all near. The problems are almost all aspects of our entire lives, and one cannot solve life like a Delphic riddle or a single scientific experiment. It would be unwise of the U.S. military and political leaders to overlook developing strengths within American everyday talk and thinking, whether academic or popular. Too specific a concentration on the problem of winning a war may cause a leader or his expert consultants to concentrate on solutions derived from past experience, therewith leading him to miss new and different solutions which might be offered by his own time. Changes need not always be thought of as weaknesses, which they are if past criteria are retained as absolute standards. Men born in the period 1910 through 20 may have endowments which are not commonly found among men born in the period 1930 to 40. Yet it is entirely possible that the generation born during 1930 to 40 may have capacities and resistances which the older generation does not altogether appreciate. Apply this concept to communism. Communism loses strength every day that it exists. Each day deprives it of novelty. Each day makes it a littler, more familiar. Each day makes its leaders one day older. 
If Americans can learn how to be flexible and imaginative and understand themselves as they really are, they might find that the real American appeal to the youth of the world would be much greater than the communist appeal. It was unfortunately characteristic of the United States in the early 1950s of the Cold War that U.S. propaganda was based on ideals and standards older than the ideals and standards competitively presented by the communists, and that therefore, in many parts of the world, the struggle between Americans and communists appeared to be a struggle on our side of the old against the young. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The United States Army in Korea in 1950 through 53 was one of the most revolutionary armies in history, an army dedicated to non-victory, pledging an allegiance to a shadowy world government of the United Nations behind the practical reality of the government of the United States. Perhaps never before in many centuries have men fought so matter-of-factly, so calmly, so reasonably. They fought well and did not need to be jazzed up with the hashish of making the world safe for democracy or establishing the four freedoms. The temper of the U.S. forces in Korea in 1951 was demonstrated by a reserve sergeant who scarcely knew he was in the reserves until he was on a boat bound for Pusan. He was a practical man, anxious to get home, but willing to do his share in this war as long as he had to. He was given the assignment of testing the voice plane of U.S. headquarters at Taegu. The loudspeaker was not working quite right, and he was instructed to test the plane at 500, 1,000, and 1,500 feet. The plane flew low over U.S. headquarters. The roar of the engines almost deafened everyone within the building. Yet even above the roar of the engines, there could be heard the bone-chilling hum of the silent loudspeaker, an immense magnification of the noise one hears from a radio set which is turned on without being tuned to a station. Everyone expected the sergeant to say, This is the EUSAK voice plane testing. Uh, one, uh, two, three. Instead, the immense voice came through clearly, through brick, plaster, and wood, through air and trees. It must have reached four miles. The gigantic voice of the sergeant seemed to roar over half of South Korea as he said, why don't you imperialist sons of bitches go back to Wall Street, where you belong? It was said that 50 colonels grabbed for their phones simultaneously. But the purely American gimmick to the whole story lay in the fact that the sergeant was not punished. No damage was done. The Americans thought their enemies were funny or silly. We had shown that we were not afraid of communist ideas. Several South Koreans told the author that they regarded the Americans as inscrutable people indeed. The development of modern civilization is certain to have developments in war, both as to the purpose of war and as to the modes of war. It seems likely that in the face of the supreme danger of atomic and thermonuclear weapons, nations will resort more and more to small wars and semi-war operations, which will offer the opportunity of strategic advantage without the cataclysmic danger of a worldwide showdown. In a very hush-hush way, the U.S. Army is looking into the possibilities of small and irregular kinds of war. Security regulations prohibit the author from discussing some of the interesting new developments in this field. National Research and Development Programs The United States government, considered as a whole, has developed a very adequate scientific research program. Most of this is quite properly keyed to the physical and mechanical sciences, in which the most tangible results are obtained. Substantial strides are being made in the medical and allied fields. Some research is, however, being carried out in the fields pertaining to psychological warfare. These are worth describing, but it must be remembered that research on Psywar may not affect Psywar itself as much as research in other fields which, by changing the character of war, will change Psywar, too. Within the general research field, two basic approaches have been recognized by the U.S. Army as being distinct from one another, developmental research and operations research. Developmental research consists of that research which creates new weapons, new methods of war, new devices or procedures. Doing so by digging through modern science, investigating its applicability to military problems, and then advancing the frontier of science, when necessary, in the military interest. The goals of operations research are more modest and, in some respects, more provocative. Operations research takes operations as they exist and re-examines them from beginning to end to discover how much of each operation is scientifically pertinent to its stated goal, what economies, modifications, or changes might be introduced, and how the operation might be improved. 
Developmental Research in Psi War At the time of the close of the 1950-53 through 53 phase of Korean hostilities, the Psi War being conducted by the United States Army in Korea showed little sign of having been influenced by developmental research into this field of activity. The leaflets were not better than the leaflets of World War II, nor even very different. Because of the peculiar political limitations of the war, radio program was not as good as the performance of ABSIE under Eisenhower. The tactical use of loudspeakers had shown a very marked improvement over World War II standards, but to a non-engineer, such as the present writer, neither the communist loudspeakers nor our own seemed strikingly better or different. Developmental research had a great deal to offer, but the gap between initial scientific advance and practical military application appeared to be too broad to warrant the assumption that the research had transformed the U.S. Psi War program. Operations Research in Korea Operations research, sometimes slangly called opsearch, was applied to the Korean War with highly uneven results. Among other things, Army officers in the Psi War field showed, early in the Korean War, that land forces possessed tactical opportunities which combat propaganda could exploit very effectually. Various experiments were tried, none of them so decisive as to affect the outcome of the war, but some of them of real tactical value, and others of great importance in obtaining Chinese prisoners. One of the points examined was surrender as a process. Surrendering does not depend upon the disposition of the individual enemy soldier to say yes or no to the war as a whole. He could say no a thousand times and still be on the other side shooting at us. The actual physical process of surrender is an elaborate one, consisting of the psychological processes of getting ready to give up on the other side, the physical capacity to surrender when the opportunity for getting captured presents itself, and the alternative, more difficult process of deliberately leaving the other side and getting to our side alive. In 1951 and 1952, there were considerable developments along this line. Americans learned much about how to teach enemy soldiers to surrender. Late in 1952 and early in 1953, the front had become so static that it took extraordinary heroism for soldiers, outside of a tiny minority engaged in reconnaissance patrols, to get away from their own side and surrender to the enemy without being killed by their friends as deserters or by the enemy as sneak attackers. The U.S. public did not realize that throughout the Korean War, the communists, Russian, North Korean, and Chinese, enjoyed a distinct radio advantage over the U.N. side, both as to funds available for programs and as to number of station hours on the air. The language gap between the Americans and Chinese was so extreme that it was hard for Americans to realize that the Chinese broadcasts covered wider audiences and covered them better than did our own. American restraint in this field may have been dictated in part by the fact that the war was a limited war, consisting of combat only with those armed Chinese communists on the North Korean territory, but not with armed Chinese communists elsewhere in the Far East. Philosophy and Propaganda Development in terms of specific literature of Psi War, it is difficult to find many contributions of professional philosophers to Psi War since the end of World War II. This is curious in view of the communist propagation of philosophy, no matter how perverted its form, as a major weapon. The American philosopher, Dr. George Morgan, who became a career diplomat, was simultaneously a Soviet-area expert and a key figure in the Psychological Strategy Board. There were not many others like him. Philosophy offers an opportunity for the re-examination of cultural values. The indoctrination of those professors who will teach the teachers of the generation after next will influence the capacity of future Americans to have a worldview which will give them the utmost opportunities for action in the military field while retaining as far as possible the blessings of U.S. civilian civilization. That U.S. civilization is still civilian and not military is, of course, beyond cavil. The William Jackson Committee was a voice crying in the wilderness when it asked for new terms and new ideas against which to set U.S. propaganda operations in the world of modern strategy. Philosophers may have had the capacity for finding some of the answers, but philosophers, of all people, do not like to be jostled or hurried. The author has never heard of a philosopher employed on a confidential basis by the United States government to think through the historical and cultural rationale of a U.S. military victory for the future. Writers such as F.S.C. Northrop and Eric Fromm, to name only two sharply contrasting personalities, have written books which possess high significance for the international propaganda field. 
The connection appears, however, to be tangential. Literary Contributions Almost all the best propagandists of almost all modern powers have been, to a greater or less degree, literary personalities. The artistic and cultural aspect of writing is readily converted to propaganda usage. Elmer Davis is a novelist as well as a commentator. Robert Sherwood is one of America's most distinguished playwrights. Benito Mussolini wrote a bad novel. Mao Zedong is a poet and philosopher, as well as a Communist Party boss. Down among the workers in the field, such American novelists as James Gould Cousins, Pat Frank, Jerome Weidman, and Murray Dyer have worked on U.S. psychological warfare. Though literary men have converted their writing to propaganda purposes, few of them have gone on to define the characteristics of a specific conversionary literature or to compile canons of literary style applicable to the propaganda field. The contributions may lie in the future. The Social Sciences The American Association of Public Opinion Research, AAOPR, is the professional league of U.S. propagandists and analysts of public opinion. Its quarterly, Public Opinion, is the key journal in the field. The members of this association are drawn both from the social sciences and from the psychological sciences, ranging from such practical operatives as Dr. George Gallup and Elmo Roper to austere theorists like professors Nathan Leitz and Hadley Cantrell. A good argument can be presented to the effect that the skills brought from the social science into the propaganda field are more valuable once they are employed full-time in that field than an attempt to apply political science or sociology or economics, each as an individual compartment, to the field of propaganda. There is still no book available with the title The Politics of Knowledge, even though the reception, control, prohibition, and dissemination of knowledge is a major factor in all modern governmental processes, both in and out of the propaganda field. Psychology and Related Sciences there has been an immense amount of work done by psychologists, much of it classified, on the field of propaganda. Some of this work is refreshing in the extreme and should provide nasty surprises for the communists in a major war. Other parts are restatements which, if translated into operations, might or might not prove feasible with the kind of army we Americans have or are likely to have. One of the most conspicuous developments since World War II has been the application by psychologists, sociologists, and persons in related field of quantifying techniques. The introduction of rigorous scientific requirements of number into the attempted reportage of propaganda behavior or propaganda results is having a significant effect. Quantification may not obtain everything which its devotees claim for it. There is a wide area of human behavior which is significant to the ordinary person or even to the expert in descriptive terms and which loses much of its significance if the descriptive and elusive terms are replaced by measurements, tables, and graphs. There is, however, no danger that quantification will replace description as a sole tool of research in the propaganda field. What quantification does do is develop a common area of discussion between propagandists and non-propagandists. In many instances, quantification can demonstrate results where allegations of failure or of success would have nothing more than personal authority to support them. Within our own particular kind of civilization, quantification has a special appeal because of the American trust in engineering and in numbers. The conclusions of the Kinsey reports on men and on women seem much more authoritative to the ordinary man because they are presented with an ample garniture of numbers, even though Havelock Ellis's pioneer works in the psychology and behavior patterns of Western sex life may have been much more tangible and much more revolutionary in their time. End of section 28. Recording by Olivia. Section 29 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Linebarger. Chapter 16b, Research, Development, and the Future, Part 2. Projection and Research All propaganda involves a certain degree of projection. The propagandist attempts to identify himself with a situation which he does not face in real life, 
and to issue meaningful communications to persons about situations which they themselves do not face yet. Much of the psychological research on tactical psi war remains yet to be done, although from the quantitative point of view, there have been significant U.S. achievements within the past four years. Another aspect of projection is left unexplored because of its immense difficulty and its dangerously unscientific character. Consider the problem this way. The United States, one day before the outbreak of war with a hypothetical enemy, such as the Soviet Union, will possess a certain group of characteristics. Representative individual lives within this country can be determined to possess certain habits concerning mass communication, trust in mass communication, and response to symbols which may come through press, radio, or other mass devices. One day after the outbreak of war, the United States will change because the war has broken out. One month after the outbreak of war, the United States will no longer be the USA, which existed on war day. It may well have become USA because of the rapidity and variety of change. Three Soviet hydrogen bombs and 12 Soviet atomic bombs might change many of our national, economic, political, and psychological characteristics, and no one, not even an American, could predict this change in advance. The best he could do would be to get ready to study the change as it occurred, to understand the rate and direction of the change, and to assess the meaning of the change in light of the conduct of war. The same would be true of the USSR. That country, like any other major country, would change under the impact of war. Who could have predicted the renaissance of Russian patriotism and traditionalism resulting from the Nazi invasion in 1941? Even if we know where the Russians are as of the outbreak of the war, we won't know where they will head or how fast they will head there once war has broken out. The scientific problem presented by attempted serious study of a U.S.-Soviet war is therefore very difficult indeed. It is really a problem involving three clusters of moving bodies. The first cluster will be the American people, their behavior, and their institutions. The second cluster, the Russians and allied peoples, their behavior, and their institutions. The third cluster, the changing methods of communication existing between them. It can be said even now, simply by referring to the character of the American people and their past history, that if the communist leaders of the USSR start a general war, the end of that war is sure, under sets of words and ideas which have yet to be developed in the future, to involve the reconciliation of the inhabitants of the USA with the Russian people. In other words, USA and USSR can and must have certain relationships with each other, preeminent among which are attempts at undoing war damage, at political and cultural reconciliation, and the undertaking of the rebuilding of a world which both these great peoples can support with enthusiasm and hope. USA and USSR are imaginable. USA and USSR for the day preceding the outbreak of war or Alternatively, the day on which the war occurs will be known elements. American science in many fields can help U.S. mass communications and therewith help our armed forces if we learn how to ascertain how the Soviet leadership changes, how Soviet elite groups change, and how the Soviet population changes during the course of the war. We must not only be able to guess what is happening to them physically, but must try to appreciate and to understand what is happening to them psychologically and semantically. This is an immense task. It is by no means certain that our research and development facilities can give us an adequate research program to handle the problem. This much can be said. If the Americans understand the Russians before the war and during the war, it will be the first time that a nation has kept its enemy in wide awake sight. The usual process in the past has been the acceptance of a few exaggerated stereotypes of the national characteristics of the potential enemy, the ascription of every possible kind of infamy and inhuman characteristic to the enemy during the war, and the redefinition of the enemy as a friend after the war. It would be strange and wonderful if the U.S. government and the U.S. propagandists 
or conceivably as much as a large minority of the U.S. population, could learn how to fight the USSR in order to help the Russians escape from a tyranny which has already hurt them much more than it has hurt us. The Germans suffered a tragic, overwhelming, and perhaps decisive psychological defeat in the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic and in the Ukraine, when they carried with their field forces such naive and tragic Nazi misconceptions of Russian and Ukrainian character as to defeat every opportunity they may have had for a serious anti-communist alliance of Germany with the Russian and Ukrainian peoples. They destroyed themselves not through ignorance, but through what they thought they knew. If they had been more calm, less assured, more willing to learn from immediate experience, and less indoctrinated with their own preposterous misconceptions of Russian and Ukrainian character, they might have found Russian and Ukrainian allies who would have joined them in the final extermination of the Soviet system. The world communist movement has already suffered very serious setbacks because of its failure to project U.S. behavior successfully from the summer of 1950 onward. If the Russian and Chinese communists had understood Americans well and had made a correct evaluation of the American response to the invasion of South Korea, they would not have driven the United States from lethargy to alertness, from weakness to military strength, from vulnerability toward communist and crypto-communist propaganda to sharp and angry recognition of communist manipulation of symbols such as progressives, people's governments, and liberation. Communist Developments If the U.S. government agencies know about the scientific development of Soviet propaganda techniques in the last few years, they have certainly not told this author. What is here presented is therefore derived from first-hand interrogation of communists from escapers in both Europe and Asia, and unclassified materials. Sociologically, it would seem that the Russian communists attempted definite improvements of the techniques of communist revolution, and that these improvements have in large part failed in the European satellites. The governments of Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany have turned out to be poor governments, despite the fact that from the Soviet point of view, it was a sharp innovation to leave them in pseudo-parliamentary form instead of creating outright Soviet facsimiles. At the Chinese end of the Moscow-Peking axis, the sociology of revolutionary propaganda and organization appears to have worked out much more successfully than at the Russian end. The Chinese communists, perhaps because they were Chinese, perhaps because they were tougher and more experienced communists than the Russians, got their country under rigid control and then undertook social and political experiments on a very audacious scale. They have managed not to be un-Chinese while creating in China the kind of pervasive dictatorship which communist control appears to require. In the manipulation of satellites and in particularization of propaganda, the North Korean Communist Army, the Viet Minh Army of Indochina, and the Malayan Races Liberation Army on the Malay Peninsula appear to have near-optimum localism and particularism without suffering serious deviation from the main communist worldwide pattern. In North Korea, of course, Chinese intervention and Soviet support have sharply modified the position of the North Korean People's Army, but the Annamite and Malay communist forces appear to be fighting with high morale and considerable success, despite the duality of control from Peking and Moscow and despite the difficulties of reconciling Asian nationalism with Marxian world doctrine. Another communist technique is now known through Edward Hunter's provocative pioneer book by its correct name of brainwashing. This involves the transformation of a human personality. The author has himself interrogated victims of brainwashing and can attest to the terrifying depth to which this process is carried. The victim of brainwashing is subject to very slight persuasion at the rational level. He is not even given much propaganda as U.S. propagandists of recent years might recognize the product. Instead, the process of brainwashing consists of a frontal attack on all levels of the personality, from the most conscious to the most hidden. The communists seek through fatigue and sustained interrogation to create a condition similar to what is called nervous breakdown in popular parlance. Then they rebuild the personality, healing their victim into communist normality. 
One victim to whom the author talked had been so subject to communist brain changing that he thought himself a real communist even though he had been reared a Catholic. He was completely convinced of the communist cause and of his own life and place in that cause after the brainwashing had been completed. Unfortunately for communism, the man got into serious sexual difficulties, difficulties of a kind which any American psychiatrist would recognize as potentially devastating. As a result of his sexual frustrations, he suffered a mild equivalent of the medically recognized phenomenon of the schizophrenic break, that terrible moment of false enlightenment in which the psychotic personality cuts loose with the truth of his own and shuts off most or all communication with normal people. With the consequence that he was walking along Nanking Road in Shanghai, a normal communist in one instant of time and, as he put it to the author, in a millionth of a second he suddenly realized he was a Catholic and anti-communist, the enemy of every man, woman, and child in sight, and at war with his entire environment. As this writer understood it, the poor man, though adjusted to the communist environment after brainwashing, happened to go crazy. Crazy enough to come back to our side. Who can say which is sane, which insane? When two social and cultural systems are completely at odds with one another, it may be impossible to be normal in both of them. Scientifically, the Chinese process of personality transformation lacked some of the pharmaceutical features apparent in the Western communist conversions for purposes of confession. It appears to be a combination of audacious practical experimentation with well-known procedures from textbooks of Pavlovian psychology. It is, of course, an interesting scientific question to ask oneself. Could communist psychological researchers do enough psychological research to understand their own difficulties and to decommunize themselves in the very act of seeking better psychological weapons for communism? If the people in charge of communist psychological techniques were scientists, as American psychologists generally are, there might be a real point of discussion. Unfortunately, most of them appear to be artists, believers, and fanatics. The history of the fanatical religions which have inflamed and ripped so much of mankind across the centuries is not such as to suggest that communism will decommunize itself by becoming more communistic or more scientific. Logically considered, the United States remains the largest extant revolutionary experiment in the world, the first immense human community which survives without profound dogma or profound hatred and which attempts to make short-range, practical, and warm-hearted, though ideologically superficial, concurrence the foundation for a political and industrial civilization. If the United States wins a few more wars, it may be that the rest of mankind will be persuaded that our kind of practicality is not only humanly preferable, but scientifically more defensible than the philosophies of competing civilizations. It seems unlikely that communist research can outstrip us in the propaganda field so far as the race is run in purely scientific terms, artistically and gadget-wise, the communists are just as inventive as we are, and often more enthusiastic. Private Psy War and Covert Techniques Another aspect in the development of Psy War was the inevitable possibility that skills learned in wartime would not be forgotten in time of peace. Many of the background studies made for OWI during World War II have been developed on the constructive side, into serious scientific contributions to ethnology, anthropology, or psychology. The post-war studies of Rand Corporation have in part been released in unclassified form and add to our knowledge not only of propaganda, but of mankind. The Radar Project of Stanford University, the Russian Research Program at MIT and Harvard, and other governmentally inspired or encouraged undertakings have borne similar fruit for private scholarship and discussion. On the other side of the coin, it is very hopeful to note that the many and dangerous techniques developed by OSS for covert propaganda, some of which were applied with considerable success in Europe, have not been introduced into domestic U.S. politics, commercial competition, or other forms of private life. After each war, there is often a danger that the coarsenings of a culture by the war will lead to the application of wartime skills to peacetime situations. This was emphatically not the case in the presidential campaigns of 1948 and 1952. Even though persons of rich Psywar experience in World War II 
were on the staffs of both Stevenson and Eisenhower. It is often forgotten that some of the deadliest and most effective revolutionary enterprises in the 19th century were undertaken without the consent or assistance of the existing governments. Karl Marx was certainly not an invention of Lord Palmerston. Bakunin did not operate out of the French Foreign Office. In the post-war discussion of USA communist rivalry, recommendations were often made on the US side that we should counter Soviet covert operations with our own covert operations against the USSR. What has been forgotten in this context is the fact that such operations have been made illegal and dangerous under United States law. Under federal law as it exists today, no underground railway could be developed to assist Soviet escapers in the way that Negro slaves were relayed across the free states to Canada in the years before emancipation. One of the chief blocks to U.S. covert operations is the immense growth in all directions of the power, authority, and responsibility of the federal government. This growth makes it almost impossible to wage revolutionary or conspiratorial operations from U.S. territory without the prior approval of U.S. authorities, which the authorities, under traditional international law, cannot give and cannot afford to give. It would seem desirable, if the Cold War situation persists over a long period of time, for Americans to re-examine the restraints which they have placed upon their own citizens, and to attempt a revision of the laws which would permit pro-American secret activities to be launched without permitting anti-American activities of the same kind to be carried on. One immediately comes to the conundrum. How can the government say yes to the one and no to the other without being cognizant of what happens? The answer would appear to lie in the older body of our law in that a withdrawal of governmental authority from some fields would leave the individual responsible and subject to indictment and trial if his enterprises should prove deleterious to the United States government but not subject to punishment if his enterprises hurt the known antagonists of the USA. Phrased in another way, this means that the USA might, in a long-range Cold War situation, be required to make some domestic recognition of the fact that the communist states are the antagonists but not the military enemies of the US system of government, and that as antagonists of this system of government, such states, the representatives, their property, and their organizations should not be afforded any more protection under our laws than is given to the National City Bank of New York in the laws applicable to the City of Moscow or the American Telephone and Telegraph Company in the laws which apply in Budapest. For a long time, the communist states have treated even the most innocent business enterprise and social club on our side as though they were attainted with an inherent factor of criminal and subversive intent. The withdrawal of U.S. legal protection from all things communist might allow the American people, or those among them who so choose, to develop proclivities for adventure and troublemaking against the communists. These proclivities are now sternly repressed by federal statute. The Future of Psychological Warfare Psy war has become an existing art. Where it had no practitioners at all in the United States between 1919 and 1940, it has had a long and distinguished roster of active and reserve officers, civilian consultants, and demobilized veterans interested in the field ever since 1945. A wide variety of military establishments have had Psy war responsibilities assigned them. Substantial cadres of officers and skilled enlisted personnel have been recruited and trained. Radio and leaflet facilities are ready to accompany our land, sea, and air forces wherever they may have to go. A U.S. strategic center for global propaganda, instantly convertible to wartime use, exists in the Operations Coordinating Board under the National Security Council. This is not the end of the story. One of the paradoxical but deeply true factors in the study and conduct of propaganda is this. The more people know about propaganda, the better they can resist it. Propaganda was a tremendous bogey in the 1920s. It probably seems very ugly and frightening to most people born before 1920. It does not seem too frightening, so far as the author can judge, to Americans born after 1930. 
those born in the period 1920 to 30 appear to be divided in their emotional reactions to mass persuasion situations. Psywar is not magic. It is a valuable auxiliary to modern warfare and a useful concomitant to modern strategy. If a particular strategic policy is sanely and effectively devised as a feasible deterrent to war, the Psywar procedures supporting that strategy will contribute to the prevention of war. Psychological warfare represents a recognition and acceptance in the military and strategic field of skills which grow about us every day. Insofar as ultra-destructive weapons may have increased the tenseness and bad temper of people who must live under the perpetual but remote threat of atomic bombing, one can say that physicists have upset the nerves of mankind and that it is now up to the propagandists to reassure and to reconcile the peoples. Whatever Cywar does, it certainly does not and should not increase the bitterness of war. Fighting itself is the supreme bitterness. Radio broadcasts and leaflets, even in wartime, only rarely should promote hatred. The situation which the world faces is dangerous because of technological development, not because of psychological knowledge. Cywar ranks as a weapon, but it is almost certainly the most humane of all weapons. Apart from Cywar, what military weapon destroys the enemy soldier's capacity to fight by saving his life? Cywar tries to bring him over alive and tries to send him home as our friend. No rival weapon can do this. Cywar, no matter what it may be called in the future, cannot be omitted from the arsenal of modern war. Neither can it outlast war. Its improvement is a cheap, valuable, and humane way of increasing the military potential of any country whether we think that country to be politically right or politically wrong. Since 1945, we Americans have written more, studied more, and talked more about Cywar than have any of the other free peoples. This is a hopeful sign. It can be read as an indication that the American love of the gadget, the American quest for a novelty, can be turned to the arena of the soul. The communists are better liars, better schemers, better murderers than we shall ever be. They start off by being better fanatics. Is it not in the American spirit that we should out-trick them, out-talk them, and outmaneuver them? We have a very creative and resourceful civilization at our backs. We have no fearer to guide us, and no party line to comfort us. We don't even want such things. Hard though it may be, we can live with our own consciences and not seek for keepers. The communists have started a fight with us. That fight may go on a long time. If they want to stop fighting, we shall certainly try to find peace with them. But if they push the fight to its bitter end, we shall not fail. End of section 29、Section、number Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinberger Appendix Military Psy War Operations 1950-1953 On 25 June 1950, when the invasion of the Republic of Korea began, no real military Psy War organization was tangibly evident. A planning staff headed by Colonel J. Woodall Green had been recreated in the Far East Command's GHQ in 1947, but it was hardly prepared to direct full-scale propaganda operations on such short notice, especially with a total lack of field operating units. Yet the staff with hasty augmentation did go into action, in effect became its own operating unit two days following the invasion, using both leaflets and radio in a strategic campaign that was continued without interruption for over three years. At the same time that General MacArthur made a provision for the Psy War planning staff in the Far East Command, the Department of the Army's G2 in 1947 directed the inauguration of a long-range program of extension courses to be administered primarily to the specialists of the Military Intelligence Reserve. One such specialty in the Military Intelligence Career Program was psychological warfare. The development of this activity was handed to the Chief of Army Field Forces, in whose G2 section Colonel Donald Hall was the Cywar officer. The first of these courses, with its supporting textbook, was not ready for release by the Army General School until 
just one year before the Korean conflict began. In 1949, likewise appeared the first officially approved Army Field Manual on the subjects of psychological warfare support of military operations. Parallel with the development of training literature based on World War II experience, the Army experimented with the use of Psywar in the field maneuvers. A special unit called the Tactical Information Detachment Teams from this detachment, armed with leaflets and loudspeakers, were sent to and participated in major maneuvers in continental United States, in the Caribbean area, and in Hawaii. The teams were attached to the enemy forces and exposed the maneuver troops to military propaganda in action. The Tactical Information Detachment suddenly suspended its planning of simulated propaganda operations for Exercise Pluto in 1950. As the only Cywar operational unit in the Army, the detachment was hustled off to Korea. Was formed at Fort Riley, Kansas. Organization of Field Operational Units Less than a month after the 1950 invasion, the Department of the Army announced the approval of a new organizational concept for Cywar Field Operational Units. The new concept, profiting by the organizational happenchance in all theaters of operations during World War II, established two functional units, one for strategic propaganda support, the other for tactical propaganda support. Radio Broadcasting and Leaflet Group Although the concept for new unit organization and function was not conceived overnight, FEC's Psychological Warfare Section, PWS, with its dual planning and operating responsibilities, pointed up the urgent lead for a unit properly manned and equipped to support full-scale strategic operations in any area. So the Radio Broadcasting and Leaflet, RBNL, group was born. Not only was it designed to conduct strategic propaganda in direct support of military operations, but it likewise was created to support the national worldwide propaganda effort when so directed. It was built on a basic framework of three companies, headquarters and headquarters company, containing the command, administrative, supervisory, and creative personnel necessary for propaganda operations, reproduction company, containing intricate equipment and skilled personnel capable of producing leaflets and newspapers of varying sizes in multiple color. Mobile Radio Broadcasting Company, designed to replace or augment other means of broadcasting radio propaganda. In 1953, a fourth type company was activated at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the Consolidation Company. This unit was very flexible and had the job of creating and conducting Psy War in support of consolidation operations in areas under military government control. Loudspeaker and Leaflet Company. The group's junior partner in the conduct of Cywar support operations was the Loudspeaker and Leaflet L&L Company. This unit specifically supported an army in the field with adequate tactical propaganda support. Like the group, it supported the national propaganda objectives, but it interpreted the directives that came from the theater commander in terms of more immediate objectives. Its targets were smaller, lived under unusual circumstances, and presented highly vulnerable, rapidly changing propaganda opportunities, a real challenge for the L&L company. Organizationally, it was a trans-down version of the group. Its company headquarters and propaganda platoon were the offspring of headquarters and headquarters company. The publications platoon was a smaller, more adaptable version of reproduction company and the loudspeaker platoon was the tactical counterpart of the strategic mobile radio broadcasting company. The tactical information detachment, moving from Fort Riley to Korea in the fall of 1950, was reorganized as the first loudspeaker and leaflet company, and attached to EUSAK, served as 8th Army's tactical propaganda unit throughout the campaign. It adjusted its location, equipment, and propaganda tone to keep pace with the ups and downs of the Korean War. Psychological Warfare Center Paralleling the creation of the Office of the Chief of Psychological Warfare in the Department of the Army Psy War Training was started in the spring of 1951. A faculty was collected at the Army General School to start the world's first formal school of military propaganda. At the same time, reserve officers whose civilian specialties were in or related to mass communications were recalled to Cywar assignments. Several RB&L groups and L&L companies were activated and trained at Fort Riley. 
One of these, the first radio broadcasting and leaflet group, was deployed to Japan to become the Strategic Propaganda Support Unit in FEC, thereby relieving the hard-pressed psychological warfare section of its operational functions. The group left Fort Riley in July 1951 at the height of the Missouri Valley floods, forcing the unit to take emergency detours by bus and train in order to meet its scheduled port of embarkation call. The first was the only group to have been used in active operations. Other groups were employed in training missions. In addition, reserve groups and companies trained periodically at key locations where sufficient specialized personnel were available to keep the units on a ready, standby basis. In April 1952, the Cywar training activities at Fort Riley were moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where the new Psychological Warfare Center was located. This center not only provided unit training, supervision, and facilities, but it fathered a new activity, the Psychological Warfare Board, designed to evaluate and test new Cywar equipment and techniques. And the Psychological Warfare School, an outgrowth of the classes conducted by the Army General School, was formally recognized and established as one of the Army's specialist schools. More than 400 officers have received diplomas as Cywar officers at the time of this writing, 1953. Most of the graduates have been Army officers, although successfully completing the course have been students from the Navy Marine Corps, Air Force, U.S. Information Agency, and from nine Allied nations. Psychological Warfare Staff, FEC For nearly two years, the Psychological Warfare Section operated under the General Staff Supervision of Intelligence, G2. Since World War I days, G2 had been given the responsibility for monitoring Cywar activity, a practice that was evident throughout World War II. In 1947, the Department of the Army transferred the monitorship and supervision of Cywar to plans and operations, G3. The shift was effected in FEC in 1952. Early in 1953, PWS was transferred to the Staff of the Commander, Army Forces Far East, AFFE, a paper transaction to put the staff in a closer position to coordinate the plans and operations of the supporting Army Cywar units. Throughout the Korean conflict, PWS, like its area commander, wore two hats. PWS was also the Cywar Operations Coordinating Agency for the United Nations Command. Broad objectives made possible throughout the war years the development of literally thousands of appropriate themes. One theme so prominent in World War II propaganda, that of unconditional surrender, was never used. UN policy denied its use, and PWS enforced the prohibition. Psychological Warfare Staff, EUSAK Recognizing the need for Cywar officers on Army and Corps staffs, the Department of the Army hastened to make an allocation for these officers to be integrated into the headquarters structures. The Cywar officers finally came to rest in the G3 staff section. 8th Army's Cywar Division of G3 had the first loudspeaker and leaflet company under its operational control. EUSAK's Cywar officer kept a tight control over the propaganda output of the L&L company by physically moving the propaganda platoon into his EUSAK staff office. Each of the corps' Cywar officers had under his operational control one loudspeaker section with a varying number of teams from the L&L company. Radio Operations Radio in the Korean conflict was used jointly as a strategic and a consolidation medium. From the beginning of the war, radio was the voice of our military policy. An ambitious network supervised in 1950 to 1951 directly by PWS and thereafter by the first RB&L group became known and recognized as the voice of the United Nations Command. The Korean Broadcasting System, KBS, and the Japanese Broadcasting System, JBS, transmitted on a cooperative basis with the U.S. government buying airtime. The first RB&L Group's radio unit furnished programming assistance through key stations in Seoul, KBS, Daegu, KBS, Busan, KBS, and Tokyo, JBS. In addition, the group furnished technical assistance to KBS in order to keep as many as 12 network stations on the air. Leaflet Operations as in World War II, leaflets were delivered primarily by two means, aircraft and artillery. V-2 
B-29s of the Far East Air Force ferried leaflet bombs on night missions deep into strategic areas. Light bombers and liaison craft in support of EUSAK dropped both leaflet bombs and bundles on tactical targets. The leaflet bundle was a Korean War development. It was wrapped, tied, and fused in such a manner that it would open and release its leaflets in midair. The 105mm howitzer remained the principal artillery piece for placing propaganda-loaded shells on pinpoint targets. Tremendous quantities of leaflets were printed. The first RBNL group, on many occasions, averaged better than 20 million pieces of printed propaganda every week. To this, the first L&L company in Korea added an average of 3.5 million leaflets per week. Loudspeaker Operations the airborne loudspeaker was the object of experimentation, but the bulk of loudspeaker broadcasts were made from vehicle mounts such as tanks and from emplacements. During the static battle situation of 1951 to 1953, most of the broadcasts were of the latter kind. Range of the voice casts was short, something like 2,000 yards under ideal conditions. Personnel and equipment were supplied by the 1st l and Company, and scripts were prepared by Cywar Division G3 EUSAK. Results of Military Cywar Operations When the question was asked, just how effective was Cywar, the answer was vague. Clear-cut immediate evaluation of the effects of each propaganda campaign was often impossible to ascertain because of the many intangible conditions that were prevalent in the target area, conditions that were constantly changing. Some critics of the Cywar operations in the Far East Command charged that there were exaggerated claims of prisoners of war who surrendered as a result of propaganda. They pointed out that a headcount of prisoners is an inaccurate measure of direct effects of Cywar used in support of military operations because rarely is the taking of prisoners the sole goal of any major Cywar campaign. Other critics expressed the belief that emphasis had been placed on quantity rather than quality of propaganda. By quantity, they meant propaganda measured by bookkeeping statistics. By quality, they meant propaganda that, planned with potent intelligence, was capable of exploiting propaganda opportunities with maximum psychological impact. Did Cywar achieve its goal? The effects of planned persuasion in a thousand days of radio broadcasts in tens of thousands of loudspeaker appeals and billions of leaflets may be measured only in retrospect. The question may be answered when reaction in the target area has reached, or fails to reach, favorable proportion, provided that the tangible results of the military operations can be clearly separated from those of concurrent and subsequent strategic international information operations. Figure 75. UN Propaganda in some leaflets used in Korea, the United Nations emerged as a major point. Here, UN lavishness to South Korea is contrasted with communist rapacity in the North. The scene does not remind the reader of slums on our side. Figure 76, Korean leaflet bomb early model. An M16A1 cluster adapter being loaded at the FEC printing plant in Yokohama 1 November 1950. The bomb type adapter will contain 22,500 5 inch by 8 inch psychological warfare leaflets. Figure 77 UN themes. This Korean language leaflet states No soldier would attempt to fight 54 men, yet Communist China is attempting to fight 54 nations. Don't fight for communist enslavement. Join your comrades who have surrendered into safety. Figure 78 Home Front Morale. When South Korean communications were interrupted, leaflets such as this provided an early boost to Korean civilization morale. Figure 79 The famous airplane surrender leaflet This is the controversial Far East Command leaflet that in April 1953 offered the sum of 50,000 US dollars to any pilot who delivers a modern, operational, combat-type jet aircraft in flyable condition to South Korea. The first pilot who delivers such a jet aircraft to the free world will receive an additional 50,000 US dollars bonus for his bravery. The leaflet was printed in three languages, Russian, Chinese, and Korean. In this example of the Russian language leaflet, there are added notations in both Korean and Chinese that this is a message from the Americans to any jet pilot who can read Russian. If you know such a person, please give it to him. It tells him how to escape to the UN forces. End of figures 75 through 79. End of section 30.
End of Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Weinberger